So, hey guys, welcome back to the channel. This is story about what if Naruto gets rare summoning contract. Part 1. If you guys enjoy this, what if? And want next part? Let me know before starting the video, comment down below. Please support for more awesome what if content. And leave a like and don't forget to subscribe to my channel. And also share this video with your friends. And check out the description. And check out my playlist. So without wasting time. Let's start the video. Prologue. Death is only the beginning. It began, as many stories do, with a single person and a single defining moment. A moment in which the person in question is set on the path upon which they will travel to greatness. On this path, choices are made, heroes and villains are born, and destinies are fulfilled. In this case, that single person is Naruto Uzumaki, and that defining moment is death. Our story begins 11 years after the great monstrous fox, known as the Kaiubi no Yoko, suddenly appeared in the tranquil yet powerful village of Kanahagakur, the village hidden in the leaves. When it appeared, the beast tore through the village defenses and slaughtered hundreds, civilians and shinobi alike. None could stand against the sheer power it wielded. Even Minato Namikaze, the Yandame Hokage, a man who once destroyed an entire army with a single attack, was no match for the giant fox. It seemed that Kanoha was well and truly doomed to be nothing more than a crater in the ground, filled with the memories of its fallen people. And then, when all hope seemed lost, the Yandame summoned a being whose power makes the Kaiubi seem like dust beneath one's fingernails. A Shinigami, death himself. Minato Namikaze made a deal with the omnipotent being. His soul in exchange for sealing the Kaiubi away. With this, a pact was made and the death god subdued the creature, allowing the mortal Hokage to seal it away into the body of a newborn child, a boy named Naruto Uzumaki. Minato knew that nearly everyone in Kanoha had lost a friend, family member, or loved one at the paws of the rampaging fox, and was well aware that the villagers would see the newborn as the Kaiubi reincarnated. A foolish notion yes, but humans are naive and superstitious creatures that tend to fear and despise what they do not understand. The Yande knew that the possibility of the villagers developing a deep, irrational hatred of the infant was very real indeed. And so, with his dying breath, he begged his people to honor the child as a hero, as the one whose very life kept the Kaiubi imprisoned and kept them all safe. Thus, with these final words, he died. The Shinigami took his soul and retreated from the world of the living. The pact was complete. Despite being practically worshipped by his people, Yandame's dying wish was ignored by the majority of the people of Konoha. Most called for the infant's death the moment his link to the fox was revealed. On that day honor and reverence were replaced with spite and hatred. For just as humanity is capable of great compassion, so too are they capable of unspeakable cruelty. In the eleven years since, the people of Kanoha would do anything in their power to inflict excruciating pain, physical or otherwise, upon the young boy. Most days they would form mobs with both civilians and shinobi alike and chase him down and beat him within an inch of his life. Other days they would stab, burn, drown, and, once, even attempted to bury him alive, telling him it was the closest thing to a proper funeral he would ever receive. Aside from the physical torment, the villagers found other ways to torment young Naruto. Most of these involved denying him the basic needs of survival. Food, water, and shelter. The food and drink he did receive mostly as anonymous gifts were often spoiled or poisoned. Despite the numerous attempts on his life, Naruto survived because of the Kaiubi sealed within him. It didn't want to die any more than its prison did, so it healed as wounds and purged any poison within its body. The Sandame Hokage, Minato's predecessor who had retaken the position of Hokage after the latter's death, did everything within his power to give the boy the normal life he deserved, but one man, even one known as the god of shinobi, could only do so much. But, despite this, Naruto was able to make a few friends outside of the Sandame. Iruka Yamino, the man who served as Naruto's elder brother figure and mentor, had lost his parents to the Kaiubi when it attacked. Despite this, he was wise enough to realize that Naruto and the fox were not one in the same. Haruka served as a protector when he could and a friend always. Duchi and Aim Ichiraku. The father and daughter pair owned a small ramen stand called Ichiraku Ramen and was the only place that Naruto could eat at because the two would not spoil or poison his food. Tuchi saw in the boy the son he never knew he wanted and Aim a little brother to dote upon. Sadly, any attempt to incorporate Naruto into their family was thwarted by the civilian and advisor sides of the village's council. A corrupted cabal filled with liars and greed, they were among Naruto's most outspoken critics. Naruto did not have many friends his own age, thanks to the parents of those who were of his age group. The Sande knew those who were alive during the Kaiubi attack would be unlikely to ever overcome their hatred. Because of this, he created a law stating that anyone who told the younger generation of Naruto's connection to the Kaiubi would be immediately executed without a trial. The elder Hokage believed that this would allow Naruto to make friends with those of his generation free of the corrupting influence of their parents. Yet, despite this law, children are gullible and easy to manipulate. 
When their parents told them to hate Naruto, they did so without question. And why would they question their parents? Those who gave them life and provided for them were surely infallible in their judgment, right? If only that were true. It was mostly the civilian children who were encouraged to hate Naruto. Those who were born in clans however, merely avoided all contact with him. They knew they would be alienated for their friendship with Naruto by the other children and so evaded the blonde boy who everyone hated but wouldn't explain why. Despite this, Naruto did have one friend his age, one child who did not care if she was ostracized for her friendship with the young Uzumaki. Inada Hayuga. She was the daughter of the head of one of the oldest and most revered clans in Konoha, those who carried the all-seeing eyes. The Hayuga clan. Most of the clan disliked Hanada for her gentle and kind nature, something that was an anathema to the strong and stoic clan, but she didn't care what they thought, she followed her heart and became Naruto's closest friend. Her 11 years life was harsh for Naruto with only a few people to provide him a shining light in the darkness of his existence. But that changed on this day. On the day of his birth, the day of the celebration of the Kaiubi's defeat, Naruto once again found himself being chased by a mob of angry villagers, this time accompanied by a squad of Anbu. On some days he would escape. On others, he would be caught and beaten to within an inch of his life. Today, however, although he would be caught, his attackers would go too far. Today, the defining moment of Naruto Uzumaki's young life would occur. Today, Naruto Uzumaki will die. With Naruto, he had been running for hours now. Normally the mobs would give up after the first hour or so, even on his birthday, but today the mob was being led by a squad of Anbu. This seemed to give the crowd the incentive they needed to keep going. After the third hour of running and dodging various thrown weapons, the leader of the Anbu squad finally got lucky and managed to hit Naruto in the leg with a kunai. Naruto had cried out in pain as he stumbled and fell forward. The crowd had finally caught up to him and began their usual beating kicking stabbing session. After a good 20 minutes of this the crowd parted, encircling Naruto's body, while the Anbu leader approached him staring down at him murderously through his bear mask with a katana in his hand. By this point Naruto was barely capable of breathing, much less moving. He could only gaze up at the man who led the attack against him. The man kneeled down and looked the boy in his eyes. Hello Kaiubi he sneered, do you remember me? Naruto didn't answer. Couldn't answer. He was too tired to speak. Too tired to care. The Anbu continued after he received no answer. I'm not surprised. Mere mortals like me are beneath you after all. Oh wait, you're beneath me now aren't you? Naruto just stared tiredly. Let me remind you then. When you attacked the village all those years ago, I launched a fire jutsu that hit you right in your ugly face he continued, with the boy on the ground not knowing what in the nine hells he was talking about, you barely flinched, glared at me, and roared. Send me flying straight through a damn building. I hit the ground, unable to move, both my legs broken, I look around and see corpses everywhere. I keep trying to move when I look at the body right next to me. Guess who it was? Naruto didn't answer. The Anbu growled at him, mistaking the tired look for one of apathy. He raised his katana and impaled Naruto with it, making sure not to hit anything vital. Naruto cried out in pain as the masked man continued. It was my wife. He yelled, the woman I pledged myself to. The woman I promised to protect with my dying breath. And she was dead. He shouted before calming himself. I must have passed out because I woke up in a hospital bed, hoping to God that what I saw was a terrible nightmare. But it wasn't. One of the doctors told me she was dead he then twisted the blade slowly, causing the blonde boy even more pain. Because of you. You murdered her and that stupid old man let you get away with it. He then grinned evilly behind his mask, but not anymore. He pulled out a kunai and held it to the boy's throat, leaving the katana still impaled in him. The old man isn't here now and I put poison in my fellow Anbu's food so they would sleep and be unable to protect you. No one is going to save you this time. He continued to grin while the crowd cheered him on. This is for my wife, may she finally rest in peace. And with that, he slit the boy's throat. Naruto's eyes widened as he began choking on his own blood, trying desperately to draw breath. No. Suddenly another Anbu appeared, this one wearing a dog mask. He kicked the bear mask Anbu in the side of the head, launching him into a building and rendering him unconscious. The Anbu didn't even pay attention to the rest of the crowd as he kneeled next to Naruto and began cradling him in his arms. Naruto. Naruto, look at me. You're going to be alright. Just stay with me. The crowd was confused by this and then worried. If this Anbu was able to save the Kaiubi, all their efforts would be for nothing. Step away from the Kaiubi, dog one of the other Anbu in the crowd ordered, calling the man by his code name. Fuck you dog growled, glaring at him while not letting go of the dying child in his arms. The Anbu snarled behind his mask, I said step away. The man took a menacing step forwards. Only to stop when three figures appeared before him. Two of them were Anbu, who were intimidating enough by themselves, but the old man they were with was what really scared him and the rest of the crowd. 
Garrison Saratobi, the Sandame Hokage and the legendary god of Shinobi, who was currently glaring bloody murder at the Anbu in front of him. Said Anbu took several fearful steps back. H.H. Hokage-sama he stuttered in sheer terror. The old cage continued to glare at him. You fools. He said in a menacing tone before shouting, do you realize what you've just done? The crowd was terrified now. The amount of killing intent being released by the Sandame was enough to bring them to their knees. W we just killed the KK Kaiubi, the fearful mask shinobi stuttered out. The killing intent increased. No, you just killed Naruto Uzumaki. You just killed the sons of Minato Namikas and Kashina Uzumaki. You just killed the Yandame's son. Everyone present, except for Dog and the two Anbu that accompanied the Hokage, were shocked out of their skins. It couldn't be. It wasn't possible. He only looked like the Yandame to mock their hero's sacrifice. No, the Anbu said, trembling and unbelieving, no, it can't be, that's not possible. The rest of the crowd was in the same position, trying to find a way to not believe what they were hearing. The old Hokage continued to glare. But it is. You just killed Minato's legacy and now. He said as he discarded his Hokage robes and hat, revealing the battle armor underneath. I'm going to kill you. He cried as he attacked. The crowd was slaughtered, butchered, incinerated, and crushed by the old cage's assault. They were so frozen in fear that they couldn't do anything but scream. Some begged for mercy, clinging to their lies and claiming that the Kaiubi deserved to die. They were ignored. When it was over, the street was covered in blood and gore not seen since the Ichiha clan massacre years prior. The Sandane was panting and trembling in rage, while still exuding a killing intent powerful enough to be felt by the whole village. One of the Anbu that accompanied the Hokage, this one wearing a cat mask, took a few careful steps towards her leader and placed a careful hand on his shoulder. Hokage Zama stop. You did it, they're dead. The old man flinched at her touch, still in battle mode before finally calming down. Then he remembered, Naruto. He said as he quickly moved to where Dog and Naruto were. We need to get him to a hospital, quickly, with the Kaiubi inside of him there might still be time to. No, Dog said quietly, interrupting. Sandane looked at his subordinate, what? Dog looked up at his leader, tears welling up in his eyes behind his mask. He's dead. Sandane froze as he felt his heart stop at hearing these words. He looked down at the cradled boy and saw that his face was frozen in shock. His eyes were still open, but there was no life in them. Naruto Uzumaki was truly dead. The group simply stared in disbelief as Dog closed the deceased boy's eyes with one of his hands before slowly lowering him to the ground and then standing up, Naruto's blood covering his torso. He then noticed something out of the corner of his eye, he looked over and saw the bear mask Anbu, still unconscious. Still alive. Growling, Dog pulled out a kunai from a pouch on his belt and began marching towards the downed Anbu. Akashi, Sandame said as he saw the man move towards his former comrade. Akashi kneeled next to Bear and grabbed him by the collar and pulled him up while placing the knife at his throat. Akashi stop. Sandame ordered the dog mask Anbu. Akashi froze, why? He asked, this. Animal murdered Naruto. He deserves nothing less. He deserves much more the old man said, he must stand trial for what he did. He will spend the rest of his life in the deepest darkest cell we have he promised, but death is too good for him. Akashi said nothing for a few moments before punching the unconscious man and dropping him before standing up. You're right, he said quietly, still glaring at the downed Anbu, death isn't enough. Sandame nodded before looking at the two Anbu that arrived with him. Hat, Hawk. Take Bear to Ibiki, tell him to come up with the worst torture he can possibly think of, and then tell him to find something even worse to use on him. The two Anbu bowed before picking up the unconscious bear and heading towards the interrogation and torture department. Sandane then looked at Kakashi. Pick up Naruto, Kakashi. We're going to prepare a proper funeral for him. Kakashi was confused, proper funeral? He asked, not understanding what he meant. The old Hokage nodded, I'm going to make an announcement to the entire village. They will know that they have hated and tortured the son of their greatest heroes. They will spend the rest of their lives knowing what they have done. Kakashi nodded and moved towards Naruto's body. He gently began lifting Naruto up. That was when something strange happened. As Kakashi was lifting him up, Naruto's body crumbled into dust. Both of their eyes widened. W what? Kakashi stuttered, shocked, what? Just happened. Sandane was just as shocked as he was. I, I don't know, he answered truthfully. The two could only stare at the dust in Kakashi's hands and on the ground. Elsewhere, after Naruto's death, Naruto Uzumaki's day had taken a turn from worse to just plain bizarre. He remembered being chased down by a group of angry villagers, being caught, hearing the bear mask Anbu call him Kaiubi while droning on and on and on about his dead wife, then being stabbed, and, finally, having his throat slashed open, gagging on his own blood, and blacking out. And now, a few minutes later, he awakens to find himself able to breath on the same street he was caught. Naruto groaned as he stood up and looked around. Something was different. The first thing he noticed was that all of the villagers surrounding him were gone, including the Anbu. 
another difference was that everything was shrouded in a strange light. A mixture of orange and gold, like what one would find as the sun was setting. Something was very wrong. As he took a step forward he felt a sharp pain in his gut. He looked down and gasped. The katana he was stabbed with was still in him. And yet, despite this, he wasn't bleeding, nor did he feel himself dying. It was official now, something was definitely wrong. And it was about to get worse. As he was about to attempt to remove the katana, an ink-like shadowy substance appeared on the ground in front of him, and a figure slowly rose from it. It was tall, at least three times his height, and wearing a cloak with an attached hood. The cloak was mostly open, exposing a great deal of its ribsage with a veil of rotting flesh around it. Two threads lined with beads that looked like golden skulls, encircled its waist. Its hands were a sickly grey with a golden bracelet wrapped around both of its wrists. The hood seemed to be too tall and too wide for the wearer, leaving it to sag across its head. Its face was still visible, though, and what a face it was. It appeared to be the rotting face of a corpse, sunken and grey like the rest of its body, with no nose and black eyes that shone with malice. Two slightly curved horns were protruding horizontally from holes in its hood. It had no visible legs and appeared to be hovering above the ground, propelled by some unseen force. In its left hand it carried a wicked-looking scythe even taller than its wielder. The hilt of the weapon appeared to be made of a giant human spine, with a small glaive at the very bottom tip. This glaive was dwarfed by the curved main blade at the top. The piece that connected the blade to the hilt was covered on both sides by a demonic skull design, with horns coming out of its head and face, and a mouth full of razor-sharp fangs. Across both sides of the blade were several grooves that seemed to sink into it, giving the weapon an even more intimidating look. All in all, this thing and its weapon were the most terrifying things Naruto had ever seen in his young life. The hooded corpse seemed to be glaring at the blonde boy. And then it spoke. Naruto Uzumaki. Naruto jumped slightly at the creature's voice. It was rasping with a dark undertone. The corpse continued to speak, your fate is decided. Everlasting damnation for your sins. This shocked Naruto. He suddenly realized what this thing was. A Shinigami. That meant. He was dead. Naruto also understood what it was saying, he might not have been the smartest of his age group, but he knew what the death god had planned for him. Be but I didn't do anything wrong. He said with fear in his voice. He only barely noticed the ground breaking apart in large chunks and floating away, revealing a dark, swirling sky. They seemed to be in a tunnel, floating towards a white light at the end. The Shinigami seemed to scoff at him, your very existence is a stain on the natural order. The fact that you live is enough to deserve damnation. Naruto's eyes widened. Then it was true, the villagers had called him a monster and demon for years, and now he knew why. Because he truly was one. The Reaper then held out its hand. Hum, face eternity. Soon you will be joined by those whose lives you have ruined. Whose souls you have damned. The innocent you have corrupted, seduced into becoming your friends. Naruto's eyes widened, Aruka sensei Tuchi, Aim Nichin, Oji-san, Hinata-chan. The death god intended to damn them as well. Naruto had lived a cursed life, a life of pain and torture. His loved ones were his only source of happiness, his light in the darkness. They had saved his life and his sanity. He could care less about what happens to himself, but he would not let anything happen to his precious people. Naruto glared at the reaper, I don't care what happens to me, but you won't touch those dear to me. He then looked down at the katana embedded within him. He gripped the hilt with his hands and pulled as hard as he could. The blade was removed with a sickening sucking sound, and Naruto grit his teeth from the immense pain he was in. He then held the weapon in a stance he had seen an Anbu use while training. I'll kill you first. He declared. He knew he had absolutely no chance against this thing he was literally facing down death himself, but he had to try. The Shinigami scoffed, pretending to possess compassion will not save your creature, your black soul is mine. He then held his scythe in his hands and took a stance. The two glared at one another for a few moments. And then charged. Naruto swung at the reaper's midsection. Only for him to disappear and reappear behind his attacker. Death swung the bottom glaive end of the scythe and left a nasty slash across Naruto's back. The boy cried out in pain and stumbled forward. The Shinigami only laughed. You have no skill and even if you did I cannot be defeated here. He mocked Bragg. Naruto glared and snarled, we'll see he said and lunged again. Death easily blocked a clumsy attack aimed at his stomach and then another, before backhanding the boy across the platform. Accept your fate. Let me take you. Never. Death then surprised his foe by throwing his scythe at him. Naruto quickly rolled to the side barely dodging the spinning weapon. Then the blade then reversed and flew back to its owner. Naruto was unable to dodge in time as the hilt smacked him in the chest, knocking him down and knocking the wind out of him. Death caught his own weapon and jumped into the air, aiming to bring the scythe down on his downed prey. Naruto caught his breath just in time to roll out of the way, ending up behind the reaper. Without hesitating, Naruto slashed at the creature's unprotected back. Death let out a cry of pain and turned, backhanding Naruto again and sending him flying. 
As he landed, Death teleported in front of him and swung his blade down diagonally. Naruto instinctively held his blade and, miraculously, blocked it. What? Death gasped. How was this possible? His weapon should have sliced right through the human-made weapon in this realm. Naruto took advantage of his foe's shock and slashed at Death's stomach before jumping out of the way. Death shrieked in pain and swung his scythe horizontally at the blonde boy. If he hadn't jumped back, Naruto would have been beheaded. Death then unleashed a flurry of attacks, with Naruto barely able to block each one. Finally, though, Death landed a blow that knocked the katana right out of Naruto's hand. Before he could do anything, Death wrapped an unarmed rotten hand around Naruto's throat and pulled him up to eye level. You have failed, demon. Now you will be judged, and your defiance will only inflict even more pain on those you have tainted. Their suffering will be legendary, as will yours. Death proclaimed. Naruto was feeling a mix between fear and rage before. Now, however, he was feeling nothing but rage. A pure endless all-consuming fury that had engulfed his very being. Death raised his blade, now, face your sins. Before Death could finish off Naruto, something amazing happened. Naruto instinctively reached for his fallen blade on the other side of the platform, practically willing it to come to him. And it did. The blade shuddered for a second before flying straight towards Naruto, hitting first. Naruto caught the blade just as the Reaper was beginning to bring his scythe down on Naruto's neck. Without hesitation, he plunged the katana into Death's shoulder, a torrent of shadowy smoke pouring from the wound. The Shinigami let out a world-shaking scream of pain before letting go of both his victim and his weapon, reaching for the embedded sword in his shoulder. As Naruto hit the ground he immediately reached for the scythe, picked it up, and charged at the wounded god. Death saw Naruto charging him with his own weapon, just as he removed the blade from his shoulder and held out his hand, trying to summon his weapon back to him. To his extreme surprise and utter misfortune, the scythe ignored his call. What? That was all he could say before his foe was upon him. Naruto slashed down diagonally, leaving a deep wound across the reaper's chest. Death barely had time to cry out before Naruto swung the blade horizontally, carving an equally deep wound across his stomach. The blonde then pulled his arm back and stabbed his new weapon forward. To his slight surprise, the curved blade swung forward, transforming the scythe into a spear. The blade plunged into the Shinigami's chest and impaled him out through his back. Naruto then pulled the blade out and impaled him again and again. He continued this seven times before pulling back and stabbing as hard as he possibly could. With incredible strength the reaper was launched off of the blade and sent flying across the platform. Death rolled for a bit as he landed and shakily got to his feet, surprise apparent across his undead face. Impossible. He cried out as he tried again to summon his weapon, but it didn't leave the boy's hands. His own side had rejected him. Naruto looked down at his new weapon before swinging lightly. The blade then rotated forward, transforming the spear into his side once more. He then twirled the weapon and held it like an expert. Despite it being over twice his size and having never used a scythe or any other weapon before, he was wielding it like an expert. Death stared in shock at his young foe. Naruto was covered in a dark red aura, his eyes were red and slighted, and the canines he had been born with had grown sharper and more pronounced. He looked like a demon out of someone's worst nightmares. And he no longer looked afraid. No, now it was Death's turn to be afraid. How is this possible? How are you using Harvest? How are you able to fight me here? This is my realm. I am invincible here. He demanded and declared. Naruto growled and charged forwards with murder in his eyes. Death backed away, no. Back away. Stay away from me. He shouted fearfully. Naruto didn't listen, unleashing slash after slash against the reaper, with the creature unable to fight back, only shrieking in pain. Finally, Naruto swung the blade upward, slashing Death's face and producing another scream from the reaper of souls. Naruto then spun around and stabbed the blade horizontally into his foe's chest. He then lifted his foe into the air and, with incredible strength, slammed him into the ground, knocking the non-existent breath out of him. He then painfully yanked the blade out and kicked the down death god across the platform. Death weakly got to his feet, barely able to move from the intense pain he was in. He rose to his feet and rose up just in time to see Naruto leap into the air. With a mighty war cry, the blonde brought the blade down on death's right shoulder, severing it and spraying shadowy blood everywhere. The Shinigami let out a scream of agony so loud that it nearly made Naruto's ears bleed. But he fought through the pain and held the blade to Death God's throat. Death had fallen to his knees, clutching where his arm had been separated from him. He saw said appendage lying on the ground nearby. Before he could even move in its direction, the arm dissolved into shadow, and Death found his own side being held at his throat. He looked at his young foe, eyes filled with sheer terror. What? What are you? He rasped weakly. Naruto glared at him, my name is Naruto Uzumaki but for you. I'm death. He declared. The reaper was trembling now. Master. He called out in a begging tone, looking around rapidly, help me. Naruto paused. Master. Who would death call master? 
That answer was given in the form of a single word. Why? A new voice asked, a voice that was raspy like death's, but was also softer yet carried more authority and power. Naruto spun around and froze at what he saw. Floating a few meters above the ground before him was another creature, this one even more terrifying than the first. It towered over death with a demonic face and glowing golden eyes. Its skin was a darkish blue-gray color. It had long shaggy white hair and two red horns protruding from its head. It was clothed in flowing white robes. Its arms were unnaturally thin, and its fingers were long and ended in claws like nails. Naruto was shocked enough to allow the Kyuubi's power to recede. He recognized this being from stories and pictures he had heard and seen. The Shinigami. And he was glaring at. The Shinigami. Wait, what? The hooded reaper gazed up at the horned one. Shinigami-sama he said lowering his head before continuing, thank the creator you're here. Quickly, destroy the monster before it escapes. Now Naruto was even more confused. If this horned being was the Shinigami. What the hell had he been fighting? The Shinigami snarled, you are in no position to demand anything of me. You came here against my wishes, Omen, and you broke your oath to the cause, to me. He shouted. The hooded reaper now known as Omen cringed. But master, he pleaded, I was only here to serve the cause. To protect mankind against the dark forces who seek to destroy and corrupt them. The Shinigami then swooped down on the wounded Omen and roared directly in his face, revealing a mouth full of razor-sharp teeth. Omen shrank into himself at the enraged display. You dare lie to me, you deceitful little worm. He demanded, you did not come here to serve the cause. You came here to settle your petty vendetta against demonkind. They are monsters. A threat to the balance. Omen said, defending his actions. Demons may be the Shinigami conceded, but you know as well as I that the Jinchuriki are not demons, nor are they a threat, unless they choose to be. Even then, it is not our business to involve ourselves in humanity's affairs. We are their silent guardians. We protect them, watch over them, and they do. Not know about us. Omen seemed to grow angry, and yet we let these he gestures to Naruto, monsters run around without oversight, we let the humans control them, the Kaiubi nearly annihilated one of the most powerful human settlements, until your intervention stopped it. How long until it escapes again and finishes the task? He demanded. Naruto was really confused now. What the hell was a Jinchuriki? And what did he and the Shinigami have to do with the Kaiubi? The Shinigami growled at his servant's defiance, Minato Namikas invoked the pact. I must appear when the pact is called. The Jinchuriki are not a threat, neither are the Biju they contain. They all agreed long ago to respect the balance and not to involve themselves. But they did. Omen argued. Because they were forced. A handful of greedy human leaders subdued them and sealed them into innocent children. Humans are weak. They cannot handle that kind of power. All it takes is a single mistake to unleash total destruction upon the world. The only way to stop the threat is to permanently silence the Biju when they are vulnerable. That is not your decision to make. The Shinigami snarled, I did not create the Reaper Corporation to control humanity or decide its future. I created it to protect them from destruction. When mankind chooses, they choose only what makes themselves stronger, not what makes things right. They cannot be trusted to make their own decisions. Have you forgotten Kagaya and Shinju? I have forgotten nothing. Do not think you can lecture me on events that happened before you were born boy. Humanity can only achieve its full potential if it is not affected by an outside source. That is what the creator said and I agree with him completely. Then you are a fool. Omen widened his eyes at what he just said. Them master, I, I didn't mean he attempted to explain. No, the Shinigami interrupted, you meant every word. And you're right, I am a fool. He then backhanded Omen, the blow somehow more painful than all the wounds he had received combined, for believing you would not let your past life affect your judgment. He then finally turned to Naruto, who had been silent throughout the entire supernatural shouting match. Naruto Uzumaki said the boy jumped at the mention of his name, I apologize for one's actions, he then glared at the fallen reaper who cowered under his gaze, clearly, I made a mistake when I recruited him. Naruto was about to speak when the Shinigami spoke again. He has disobeyed my orders and threatened the innocent. Threats he no doubt would have acted upon if given the choice he looked back at the blonde boy, kill him. Naruto and men's eyes widened. What? What? He tried to reap your soul simply because he hates what you carry within you the Shinigami explained, he was going to kill your loved one simply for being connected to you. He has abused the power I have given him and has misused it for his own purposes. He has broken his oath. For that he must die. Naruto then remembered what Omen had said he was going to do to his precious people. He glared at the wounded reaper and marched towards him with harvest in his hands. He then raised it above his head. Omen's eyes widened. No. He begged, please don't. Naruto brought the blade down, slicing the reaper vertically in half. The two halves fell to the ground and dissolved into shadow. It is done, the Shinigami stated simply. Naruto merely looked down at where his fallen foe had been kneeling. Before dropping harvest, falling to his hands and knees, and vomiting. 
the Shinigami simply watched. He should have realized that this would happen, after all the boy did just make his first kill. Naruto gasped for breath and was trembling, what? What have I done? He had just killed someone. Thing, whatever. Even if he had threatened his precious people, that didn't justify killing him. Dot did it. What needed to be done the Shinigami answered, he was a threat to humanity, to those you care for. Sparing him would only have fueled his desire for revenge. Naruto simply stared at the ground with a blank look on his face. He stayed that way for several moments before picking up Harvest and standing. Feeling better? Naruto nodded, yeah. Thank you Shinigami-sama he said bowing. The death god smiled, you are most welcome. It's the least I could do after being unable to stop your premature death. Naruto was confused, premature. He repeated. Oh, right. I forgot to tell you. You weren't supposed to die today the Shinigami explained. Naruto was confused, I wasn't supposed to die. He asked. The Shinigami nodded, indeed. Omen manipulated an naive dead counter into ending your life far earlier than it was supposed to. The what? Naruto asked. The dead counter? They are responsible for tracking all living souls and making sure they die at the correct time. Then a reaper comes and collects the deceased person's soul and brings it to me, where I determine which afterlife they are sent to he explained. Naruto was confused, but you're the Shinigami. Don't you decide when someone dies. Don't you collect their souls. The Shinigami chuckled, firstly I prefer to be called death and secondly, no mortal. The creator decides when someone is born and when they die, I merely collect on the death half of the equation. Besides, do you know how many people die every day? I can't even do all the work myself. Naruto nodded. It did sound like a difficult job. He then remembered something. Who's the creator? He asked. Death chuckled again, exactly what his title says, he is the maker of all things, the being who created the heavens, the earth, and everywhere in between he explained, to humanity, he goes by many different names. God, Kami, Allah, etc, etc. But to everyone else, he is simply called by his title. The creator. Naruto noticed a hint of compassion in his tone, you sound like you're close to him. Like you care about him. Death smiled, he is my brother. Or, at least, the closest thing I have to one he explained, we need one another. We cannot exist without each other. I reap what he sows. It is a never-ending cycle, one we are a part of, whether we like it or not. Naruto nodded. He knew what the feeling of having a loved one is like. Death then became serious, please don't tell anyone I showed compassion and reverence just now. I have an image to maintain, after all. Naruto laughed, I won't, I promise. Death nodded, good. A moment of silence passed before Naruto asked another question. What's a Jinchuriki? He asked. Death froze for a moment before answering, a living sacrifice. Someone who contains one of the nine biju within themselves and can use its power. Naruto thought before asking, am. Am I one? Death looked at the boy and nodded, yes, you carry within you the Kyubi no Yoko, the most powerful of the nine. Naruto suddenly realized why nearly everyone hated him, calling him a monster, a demon, or a freak. He understood why the bear mask Anbu had called him Kyubi and why Omen attacked him. The truth hit him like a tent on sack of bricks. Then it's true he said sadly tears forming in his eyes, I really am a monster, no. Naruto nearly jumped out of his skin at death's sudden outburst. Death continued, you are not a monster and you are not a demon. You are human. You are merely the prison which contains the fox's power. Were it not for you, the Kaiubi would have destroyed Konoha. Naruto simply stood there contemplating. Finally he looked at death and asked, how do you know I'm not a monster? Not a demon. Death smiled, I have seen monsters and demons. I know their tricks and their powers. And I know you are human. Trust me, I'm older than the universe itself. I know what I'm talking about. Naruto wiped his eyes of tears and smiled, thank you he said. Certainly, Death replied, smiling. But why does everyone think I'm Kaiubi? Can't they tell the difference? Death shook his horned head, they could. If they could look past their grief he explained. When Naruto opened his mouth to ask what he meant, Death continued, nearly everyone in the village lost someone in the Kaiubi's attack. A friend, family member, lover, everyone. I would know, my reapers and I were very busy that day. Grief can drive humans to do any number of unspeakable things and do anything to cope. They wanted to blame something, someone, for their loss, and so they chose you. You, who contain the very being that ruined their lives. Naruto nodded, it made sense. Will they ever realize I'm not Kaiubi? Doubtful. Humanity as a whole is stubborn and likes to think it is always right. Admitting when they are wrong goes against their very nature. I'm sorry, but it would take a miracle to convince the villagers, and those are few and far between, he explained sadly. Naruto seemed saddened before perking up, if there's a way I'll find it. He promised. Death chuckled, and I wish you luck in that endeavor. Several more moments passed in silence before Naruto asked a nagging question in his mind. So. He began, what happens now? Death looked down at him, now. 
Now you go back to the land of the living, and I don't see you again until your appropriate time of death, he told the mortal boy. When is that? Naruto asked, relieved he would be going back, but worried about how much time he had left. Death laughed, I can't tell you that, boy. Suffice to say it won't be for quite some time. Naruto sighed in relief before another question popped into his mind. What about the side? He asked, holding up said weapon. Harvest death corrected before shrugging, keep it. Naruto's eyes widened, really. He asked excitedly, like a kid on Christmas morning. Death chuckled, of course. It shows you after all. What do you mean? The boy asked, confused. Did you notice how Omen could call Harvest back to himself after he threw it at you? He asked. Naruto nodded, remembering the blow that knocked the wind out of him. And did you notice that Harvest wouldn't respond to him after you picked it up? Naruto nodded again. Harvest is a sentient weapon he explained, it thinks and feels, and it decided that you were a more worthy master than Omen. It has bound itself to you. I couldn't take it from you even if I wanted to. Naruto looked down at his new weapon. Hard to believe this thing is alive he thought to himself. He then felt a small surge of power coming from the side. He didn't know how, but he knew Harvest was saying I am alive. Naruto smiled before looking back at death. Won't everyone be surprised if I just return from the dead? Death chuckled, most definitely he answered, but that will just make it more interesting. Naruto laughed, yeah I guess so he then became serious, alright, I'm ready. Death nodded, very well he said, and then began channeling his power. Before suddenly stopping. Then again, this is a rather rare opportunity he mumbled to himself, perhaps if. Yes. That might just work. Naruto was worried now, was Death going to change his mind? Death then looked at Naruto and smiled, I have a proposition for you, Naruto Uzumaki. Would you like to hear it? He asked. Naruto was still worried but nodded. I need you to promise me you will listen to everything I say first and wait until after I'm done to decide. Can you do that? Naruto nodded again. Death smiled, good and then began explaining, let me first start by telling you a story. Long ago, before recorded history the creator made the first of humanity, Adam and Eve, and allowed them to live in the realm of Eden, an earthly paradise where all would be provided for them. They would be the first, the paragon for what this new species should be. But, even in its infancy, humanity was vulnerable to corruption. Adam and Eve fell for the manipulations of Lucifer, otherwise known as the devil, Satan, Iblis, Shaitan, or the fallen one among others. He convinced Eve to eat from the forbidden tree of knowledge, who then convinced Adam to do the same. Because of this act of defiance, the Creator cast Adam and Eve out of Eden and onto Earth. He then made it so that they and their descendants would have to work and have to shed their blood, sweat, and tears for their rewards. Nearly everyone knows this story. What humanity doesn't know is what happened next. The Creator realized that the human race was vulnerable to the corrupting influence of the denizens of Hell and their Lord and Master, Lucifer. To combat this threat, the Creator came to me. You see, my purpose is to gather the souls of the dead and send them from this life to the next. Who better to protect mankind from the threat of the supernatural than the one who straddles the worlds between life and afterlife? The creator asked me to create a way to fight this threat, a first and last line of defense between the human race and those who seek to exploit or destroy it. And so, I created the Reaper Corps, a group of humanity's finest and noblest soldiers, warriors, assassins, thieves, scientists, engineers, philosophers, alchemists, and the like. I would wait until their time on Earth was spent and would offer them a place in my organization upon their deaths. It was a volunteer-only group, and those who did not want to join could simply pass on to the afterlife. Anyway, the core goal was simple. Protect mankind from the supernatural forces that wish to destroy, corrupt, or enslave it. We were to preserve the balance between heaven, hell, and earth. The only catch was that mankind could not know about us or the supernatural in general. The panic that would spread would be catastrophic. Also, our members must sever all ties to their previous lives and never attempt to contact their loved ones. No one must ever know that they still walk the earth. Ever. And so, we work in secret. The core has saved creation countless times throughout history and is still alive today. When not fighting the supernatural, the reapers spend their time honing their skills or bring me the souls of the deceased for judgment. Omen was one such reaper until he put his petty vendetta ahead of the cause, the balance, and his brothers and sisters in arms. Naruto's jaw was practically on the ground. Not only was death. Well, death. But he was also the creator and leader of a secret organization of heroes who fight the supernatural. This led to a question, supernatural? You mean demons, right? Demons, fallen angels, monsters, spirits, the undead, all of these things and more. He answered. Naruto was now even further surprised. Death knew what he was thinking, yes mortal, nearly everything supernatural you were told wasn't real, is. You mean like ghosts, werewolves, vampires, and zombies? He asked excitedly. Death smiled at his enthusiasm, yes, 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 and yes. Oh my goodness yes. That's awesome. 
he exclaimed before confusion defined his features, but what does that have to do with me? Death explained, well, with Omen dead, I find myself in need of a replacement for him. And I was hoping you would fill his position. Naruto's eyes widened so much that it was a miracle they didn't fall out of his head. Am me? He asked, B, but I'm not a hero, I don't have the skills to be a part of the core. Not yet Death told him, but you have great potential. You were able to kill a veteran reaper with his own weapon. Granted, he wasn't able to instantly overpower you because he acted outside of my authority, but he was still an accomplished warrior. Naruto was sorely tempted to accept, but remembered his precious people. Doesn't that mean I would have to stay dead? He asked. Death smiled even wider, normally yes, but, as I said, I have a proposition for you. You delay your return to life and travel to my realm. Ah, ah, ah. Let me finish. He said as he noticed Naruto about to protest. Naruto closed his mouth and let death proceed. As I was saying, you delay your return to life and travel with me to my realm, the Void, where the Reaper Corps headquarters is located. You spend a few years training there in the ways of battle and learn all there is to know about the supernatural. Then, when your training is complete, you return to Earth and become my personal representative in all things living. Meaning you hunt down those who try to cheat death among other things. Naruto was really excited now, can I still be a ninja? He asked. Death smiled, but of course. Being a shinobi, you will often come across things you must also deal with as a reaper as well. Sometimes, the two careers will intersect. Naruto is really excited now. He could have the best of both worlds. He was about to accept before death held up his hand to stop him. But be warned he cautioned, the life of a reaper is not an easy one. The training will be brutal, arduous, and almost cruel in its execution. You will encounter things that will haunt both your nightmares and your waking thoughts. You will be forced to make difficult decisions for the good of humanity. You will make powerful enemies, enemies who will likely target those you care for out of revenge. Most importantly, you may very well die an early death. In addition, being a reaper is a lifelong commitment. If you join, you cannot leave until you either die or until I release you from your duty, something that will take a very long time to happen. And so, Naruto Uzumaki, knowing this, I make you this offer. Will you join the Reaper Corps? If you say yes, your new life begins. If not, I will not consider you a coward or uncommitted. I will send you back to Earth with no strings attached. You can even keep Harvest Death pause before continuing, I'll give you one hour to think about it. I will return expecting your answer. Think carefully and choose wisely. And with that said, Death vanished, leaving Naruto alone on the floating platform. Naruto sat down and began to think, weighing his options. One hour later, Death reappeared and gazed at the waiting Naruto. Have you come to a decision? He asked. I have, Naruto answered. There was a long pause before Naruto continued. I accept your offer he answered with absolute conviction. Death was unsurprised by this. Are you certain? He asked. Naruto nodded, I thought about what you said. I know being a reaper will be hard, but my whole life has been hard from the start. It seems no matter what I do, my life, and those dear to me, will always be in danger, supernatural or not. I made a promise that I would protect them. They saved me so I will save them. It doesn't matter if the threats are human or not, I will keep my promise. He vowed with as much passion as he could and then smirked, besides, he hoisted up harvest, I got this new weapon, might as well learn how to use it. Death smiled, so be it then. Let us be off. Naruto nodded and then asked a question, one last thing. Will my loved ones know I'm alive? Sort of. Death chuckled, don't worry, it's been taken care of. And with that they disappeared, bound for the void and to a new and better future. The Hokage Tower, soon after Naruto's death, here is in Saratobi had just arrived at his office, depressed and drained. He was really feeling his age with Naruto gone. That boy had been so full of life, things were never depressing while he was around. And now he was dead. What am I going to tell the others? He mentally asked, referring to Naruto's other friends and loved ones. Sighing, the old cage opened the door to his office and walked in. Only to find someone sitting at his desk, reading a certain orange. Well, let's just call it a novel that belonged to the old man. He couldn't make out its face behind the book, but he could see its shaggy white hair. Is this really what passes for human literature? The stranger asked rhetorically in a soft, rasping voice, if so, I find myself supremely disappointed. The hokage tensed at the sight of the intruder and took a fighting stance. Bamboo? He called out, knowing they were hidden nearby, ready to answer his call. But this time, no one came. They cannot hear you here as in Saratobi, time has stopped. A small alteration so that we may speak privately the stranger explained, still reading. Sandame looked outside his office door and saw the people in the hall were frozen, like statues. The old hokage glanced back at the intruder, whose face was still hidden by the book. Who are you? How did you get in here? He demanded. The stranger chuckled, you'll find I can do anything if I have a mind to do so he answered, as for my name, well, you already know it. Everyone, living or dead, knows me. 
Sandane was confused. I am the shadows, the being that haunts all things. I am a whisper in your ear, the feeling you get when you feel you are being watched, the shiver down your spine. I am the end of all things. But most importantly. He then lowered the book, revealing his demonic face, a face the Sandane knew all too well. I am death he answered simply. There is in gasped, the Shinigami. He whispered. Beth shrugged, some call me that. Also, the Grim Reaper, the devourer of souls, the destroyer of worlds. But I prefer to be called by what I am. Death. The Sand Dame stared at one of the most powerful beings in this or any other universe. Why are you here? He asked, are you here to take me, because I assure you it will not be easy. He declared, dropping into a stance. Beth scoffed, actually, it would be easy. If that were the reason why I am here. But it is not. Your time has not yet come, Sandame Hokage. He then smirked, at least, not yet. The Hokage suppressed a shudder at that comment. Then what do you want? The Sandame demanded angrily, haven't you already taken enough today? Beth remained calm, you refer to one Naruto Uzumaki, yes? He asked, that is precisely the reason I came to speak with you. You see, there was a bit of a misunderstanding on my end. Misunderstanding? The old man asked. Beth nodded, you see, Naruto Uzumaki was not supposed to die today. Sandame's eyes widened, not supposed to but he did. He exclaimed. Because of the meddling of one of my servants. He held a deep grudge against demons and believed the Biju were a threat to humanity. He planned to collect the boy's soul and sentence him to eternal damnation. The Hokage was now frightened for Naruto's safety, but death soon calmed him down. Calm yourself mortal. The boy is safe, he overpowered the meddler and killed him he explained. Pirazin was shocked, wait, he what? Death proceeded to explain the battle between Naruto and Omen. The Sandane was amazed, Naruto was normally such a kind and gentle boy, it must have taken quite a bit to force him to use the Kyubi's power, and even more so to kill someone. The thought occurred to the old cage, wait, does this mean? You will resurrect him? He asked cautiously. Of course, Death answered, but not just yet. The Hokage felt hope rise and then fall at these words. What do you mean? He asked. You see, I made a proposition to young Naruto and he accepted. Before the mortal cage could respond, Death elaborated, Naruto is going to spend a few years in my realm, the void. There, he will be trained by the best the afterlife has to offer. And when his training is complete, he will return and become one of your shinobi. The Sandane was suspicious, and what, exactly, do you get out of this deal? He asked. Death smiled, when he returns, he'll tell you. He will enjoy the look on your face when he tells you what he has become a part of. Naturally, this made the old man even more confused, but he knew better than to force the issue. He was speaking to death himself, after all. He decided to ask a different question, when will he return? When will the next batch of genin graduate? Death asked. In four years the mortal answered. Death smiled, sometime before that then. Before you say anything about letting him graduate despite not attending the academy, I suggest you let him graduate anyway. Pirazin was about to protest when death interrupted, I assure you, the training he will receive will more than make up for it a thousandfold. I promise you this. He will eclipse the other genin in terms of skill, intelligence, and power. He will make you and your village proud, and he will be a bane to your enemies. Sandame saw the serious look in the Grim Reaper's eyes and knew he was telling the truth. Okay then he conceded before sighing, the council will throw a fit about this. The civilian and advisor sides at any rate. Death scoffed, what does it matter what they think? You are Hokage, you are above them physically, mentally, and morally. I suggest you remind them of that he advised the old man. Here is a nodded in agreement. Death stood up, placing the novel down, well then, I guess I'll be off he then prepared to leave. Wait. Death stopped at the old cage's word. Yes. He asked. Could you please tell Naruto. That I'm glad he's alive and look forward to seeing him again. He asked to the point of pleading. Death nodded, I think he already knows he answered, but I'll tell him anyway. And, with that, he vanished and time resumed. Pirazin just stood there for a moment, contemplating the events that had just transpired and what he had just learned. Okajama. One of the Anbu outside had noticed his superior had just stopped in the middle of his office and just stood there, are you alright? He asked, concerned. Sandame shook out his thoughts and looked at his subordinate. Yes, I'm quite fine, he answered before looking at the clock on a nearby wall. It was almost midnight. He then turned to the Anbu, first thing tomorrow morning, I want you to find Naruto Uzumaki's closest friends and bring them to my office he ordered. The Anbu bowed, yes, Hokage-sama. With that, the old cage closed the door behind him and went to finish his work for the day before going home. He smiled to himself. Tomorrow is going to be a busy day, he thought to himself. Chapter 1. From Dust I Am Reborn, the bandit camp in Earth Country, years later, what's the hall this week? One nameless bandit asked his friend. The two thugs were guarding the entrance to their camp, a large cave entrance. Two caravans he answered, not as much as the last time, mostly junk, but we got a consolation prize. What was it? 
The second bandit smirked, we got the daughter of an earth nobleman he told his partner. Is she hot? The first asked. He nodded, yep, but the boss says we can't touch her. Says we're gonna ransom her back to her old man he explained. The other bandit frowned but then shrugged, oh well, at least we can make some decent cash. His friend smiled wickedly, oh, but it gets better, he said, the boss wants to wait until the nobleman arrives with the money. Then we kill his guards and take the ransom. Then take him hostage and hold him for ransom for the earth daimyo. After that, the girls are all ours. The first bandit smiled, two paydays for the price of one. Let's just hope we get a turn before some of the other guys. They always use them up quickly and I ain't into dead chicks. I hear you, the second said, agreeing. Unfortunately for them, they would never be able to indulge in their desires because of what happened next. In a swirl of shadows, a lone figure appeared. Judging from his build, he was male. He was a little over six feet tall and was obviously muscular but not overly so. He was wearing a black trench coat with an attached hood which concealed his face, a black shirt, black pants, black combat boots, and black fingerless gloves. Under his left wrist was a strange eye-shaped tattoo. Though they couldn't see it since he was facing them, on the back of his coat was the kanji for death, and the words, no escape were printed in the color of flames. At the center of his back was an image of two sides in a crossbones position with a demonic skull at the center. A circle of flames were surrounding it. All were bright, blood red. What worried the two men most, however, was the wicked-looking, curved blade mounted on his right forearm. The two thugs jumped up, held up their weapons, and tried their best to be intimidating. They failed. Who the hell are? That was all the first bandit could say before, in a burst of speed, the hooded man appeared behind them. He then turned around, swinging his blade as he did, and beheaded both men in a single swing. The two men seemed to freeze, and then blood appeared on their necks as their heads slid off, falling to the ground, the rest of them soon following. The hooded man then turned and looked at the cave entrance ahead. Alright he thought, this is the place, let's hope he's here and not out plundering he then shook his head, no, he'll be here, why would he do the work when he has a bunch of dumb thugs to do it for him. In a burst of dark energy, the arm blade disappeared and a wicked looking scythe appeared in his hands. Let's get to it then he thought as he moved further into the cave. Bandit camp, main tent. Inside the main tent, the bandit leader was sitting on his makeshift throne, with several other members nearby, guarding him. He was tall, a good 6'5", heavily muscled, and covered with scars. He was bald and had no facial hair. A large scar ran from the top of his head, over his right eye, and down to his chin. Whatever had created the scar had also blinded that same eye, with it being pale and the other being dark brown. He wore a pair of dark brown pants and wore no top, showing off his broad chest. This man was truly an intimidating sight, sitting on a throne made of bones. His men knew little about him. He had appeared with ten other men a few months ago and had challenged the previous leader of the gang to a one-on-one -on -one fight for leadership. The man won easily, slaughtering his foe and making his position as leader absolute. Some men fraud against his claim. They, along with the former leader, were used to create his throne. Since his arrival, the gang had been doing extremely well. The new boss seemed to always know who and what to rob and what to let pass. The haul they had taken in had tripled since his takeover, which satisfied the rest of the gang. Truly things for them couldn't be better. That was about to change. The bandit leader was currently contemplating the gang's next move when he heard a whimper nearby. He looked up to see the captive noble's daughter, locked in a small cage, crying. She was in her late teens and beautiful, with long brown hair, deep green eyes, and a great body. The leader growled, quiet, he ordered darkly, you're whimpering grates on my ears. Suddenly the sounds of battle reached his ears, the clang and clatter of blades, the sound of a sharp weapon piercing flesh, and screaming. The bandit standing next to his throne, one of the ten who had arrived with him, looked to the entrance of the tent. Master, he said in a worried tone. At last, one has come, the leader said. Suddenly, a single bandit, fear clear on his face, burst through the tent. Boss. Boss. He called, terrified, we're in true. The man never finished his sentence. He was impaled from behind by a curved blade. Before he could even gasp in pain, the blade was pulled violently upward, severing him in half. Then the blade's owner walked into the tent, holding a spear whose hilt seemed to be made of bone. The blade then swung down, turning the weapon into his side. The other bandits, minus the leader and the ten who had arrived with him, stared in fear of the hooded man. The leader and the other ten glared at him. You should have stayed in hell, Rizen, the man said, looking at the leader. The bandits, minus ten of them, were confused. Rizen. That wasn't the boss's name. And what did he mean by stayed in hell? The bandit leader continued to glare, and you should not have come here, servant of death he retorted, confusing the others even more. You should have expected this, the hooded man said, no one hides from us. Whoever said I was hiding? The leader asked, I knew you would find us eventually. I'm only surprised that your master wasn't wise enough to send more of you. One is sufficient. 
You overestimate your strength, Demon the man replied, further confusing most of the other bandits. The leader growled, it is you who underestimates me he snarled, I have killed your kind before. No, you haven't the man said, we would know if you had. Lying will change nothing he said. He then turned and saw the captive girl, staring at him with a mix of hope and fear on her beautiful tear-stained face. Is this what Lucifer's pets do to get their kicks now? Kidnap defenseless girls. He taunted. The leader snarled at him. The hooded man ignored this, his tone becoming serious again, Rizen, you and your followers have violated the balance by escaping hell and have committed numerous crimes since then. I'm giving you and your followers a single chance to surrender and return to hell peacefully, he told the leader before saying darkly, I assure you, this is the only outcome where you survive. The leader then stood to his feet, glaring bloody murder at the hooded man. Suddenly, the sickening sound of bones cracking and breaking engulfed the tent. The leader's skin began to bulge as something appeared to be growing inside of him, something large. Then, his skin began to tear as something seemed to burst out of him. It was tall a full nine feet, muscular, with dark skin and black fur covering its shoulders, forearms, and legs. Its feet were hooved, like those of a horse. It had a human face, with red eyes, no hair, and two long, ibex-like horns protruding out of its head. Around its neck, it wore a collar of what looked to be a mix of chainmail and bone, which spread down to the top of its chest in length. In width, it spread to the black fur on its shoulders. It also wore this chainmail around its forearms, lower legs, and its waist, which was wide and resembled a kilt. It held a large scimitar in one of its hands that seemed to be made of both metal and bone. This was a guardian demon, a species that ranked above some of the lesser demons in Hell's hierarchy, the regular demon enemies in Dante's Inferno. Nearby, the leader's ten original followers were undergoing a similar transformation, with strange beings tearing out of their skin. These creatures were taller than humans, but shorter than the guardian, reaching seven feet tall. They were muscular, hairless, and had scaly, bluish-purple skin. Their faces were bestial in appearance, with horse-like ears, black eyes, a mouth full of razor-sharp teeth, and two curved horns on the top of their heads. A pair of small, vestigial wings adorned their backs. They wore simple, metal armor leggings on their lower bodies and metal gauntlets on their forearms. Each creature had different markings across their torsos, with things like skulls, bones, flames, horns, and demonic symbols covering them. Each held intimidating axes, swords, maces, or spears made of either bone or metal in one of their hands. These were demon soldiers, which served as the backbone of all of Hell's legions, the Phantom Guard enemies from Darksiders. After removing the remaining scraps of skin from their bodies, the demons were glaring and growling at the hooded warrior. The remaining bandits and the captive girl were nauseous and terrified at the revealing of these two species of demon. The bandits were too scared to move, and the girl couldn't move because of the cage she was in. Then, Rizan spoke, it is your life you should be concerned with. He shouted in rage. He then pointed to the hooded man, tear the flesh from his bones. He commanded the soldiers. The demons roared and charged, raising their weapons. The hooded man leapt into the air. As he flew over the soldiers, he dropped a small pellet. When it hit the ground, it exploded into a wide smoke screen, causing the demons to search for their foe aimlessly. The warrior landed and attacked his blinded foes. He aimed a low slash at one foe, severing its legs, crippling it. He then used the spear mode of his weapon and impaled another soldier from behind. He rolled to the side, in between two more oblivious demons. He tapped one on the shoulder. The soldier let out a confused grunt and then turned around and swung its axe in the direction it felt the tap from, bringing the blade down on the back on another soldier's head, killing it instantly. Seeing his smoke screen was about to dissipate he leapt into the air and landed outside of its area of effect. The smoke then cleared and the humans and demons in the room saw the carnage. Two soldiers were dead, their bodies becoming a crusted lava color before dissolving into a black smoke that reeked of sulfur and brimstone, and another was legless, crawling along the ground and bleeding. The soldiers then noticed their foe and roared, charging him. To every human surprise, the warrior charged back. The impaled one soldier, using it to pull vault forward and kick another in the chest, knocking it down. He then spun around, slicing another soldier in half. The soldier that had been knocked down had gotten to its feet. It roared and charged forward, the warrior merely standing there. Just as the demon was about to run the warrior through with its spear, he disappeared in a puff of smoke, and another now very confused soldier appeared in his place. The charging soldier was unable to stop in time and ended up impaling the other through the chest, shock evident on both of their faces. Suddenly the warrior appeared behind the demon that had charged him and swung his scythe, beheading it. The three remaining demons then charged him. In a swirl of dark energy, the scythe shifted into an arm blade as the warrior pulled three serrated knives from within his coat. He blocked a downward stab of one soldier, then swiftly plunged a knife into its stomach before moving ahead. The demon was only irritated by the blade and attempted to pull it out, only to find it would not budge. 
The warrior dodged a slash from the second soldier and spun around it, stabbing another knife into its back before moving to the third soldier. As the demon slashed, the warrior dropped to the ground, sliding between its legs and plunging the last knife into one of its legs as he went. He then stood up and looked at the soldiers. Each was annoyed as well as angry, being unable to remove the knives from their person. They were about to attack again when they heard a beeping sound. The demons looked and saw that the knives had a red light on the hilt that was flashing with each beep. The beeping then grew faster. The soldiers' eyes widened as they realized what was about to happen. They then frantically tried to remove the beeping knives. Despite their strength, none could remove their blade. The beeping was extremely rapid now. And then stopped. Boom. The knives detonated, scattering bloody, demonic chunks of flesh across the room which soon dissolved. The humans in the room stared in awe at the hooded man's victory. Rizen, meanwhile, was seething. He looked to see the legless soldier, the only one left, crawling towards him with a pleading expression on its face. Before it got even halfway to its master, the hooded warrior stepped on its back, before impaling it through the skull with his weapon's glaive end. He pulled the blade out and looked up at Rizen. Care to surrender now? He asked, grinning behind his hood. Rizen roared in rage, seemingly shaking the entire cave, before leaping into the air and landing behind the man. The warrior turned and blocked an attack from the bone sword, before spinning around behind the guardian and slashing at his back. Rizen leapt forward, dodging it, before turning around and aiming another slash at his foe. The warrior ducked under it and kicked the demon in the side of the leg, knocking him off balance and bringing him to his knees. The warrior then kicked him in the chest, knocking him back to the front of his throne and disarming him. If up Rizen, this can only end one way the warrior warned. Rizen snarled in fury, I would sooner bend my knee to the creator than yield to a worthless fleshbag like you. He declared. The guardian then gathered demonic energy into his hands and launched a small, but powerful, bowl of hellfire at his foe. The hellbolt. To everyone's surprise, instead of dodging, the warrior stood still and held out one of his hands. Dark release. Inhaling Ma he murmured. To the shock of all, the hellbolt seemed to be sucked into his outstretched palm. What? How did you reason and attempted to ask before the warrior spoke again? Dark release. Judgment he murmured again. The very same hellbolt that had been absorbed before was launched out of his raised hand and flew back towards its master. Before Rizen could even flinch, the hellbolt struck him in the chest and launched him backwards. He smashed through his throne, shattering it to pieces, and out the back of the tent, where he hit the cave wall, hard. Rizan groaned in pain as he attempted to stand up. Before he had even gotten halfway there, the warrior appeared in front of him and impaled him through the chest with the spear mode of his weapon. No one escapes the reapers he told the shocked demon, before yanking out the blade. Rizen, with a pained, shocked face, reached towards his killer with one, clawed hand and then went limp, his body dissolving soon after. The hooded warrior simply stared at the place the demon's body had been before turning and heading towards the tent. Now he thought to take care of loose ends. The warrior walked into the tent to find the bandits and captives still there eyeing him with fear. He made a cross-shaped hand sign, and five identical hooded men appeared next to him. Gather their weapons he ordered, referring to the demon weapons. The five shadow clones soon began to gather the weapons and seal them into scrolls before handing him the scrolls and poofing out of existence. He then approached the bandits. Th. One bandit tried to speak but couldn't quite get it out. He tried again, th. Those? The warrior asked, finishing the word. The bandit continued, were. Were. Not human? He asked finished, no, they were not. They were demons. One guardian demon accompanied by ten soldier demons to be precise he told them, the guardian possessed the body of a small-time bandit leader, who then forced his men to surrender their souls for his soldiers to possess them. Rizen, the guardian, was your real boss the whole time. The bandits were shocked by this revelation. The warrior then continued, he's not a problem anymore. I killed him and now. He brandished his scythe, I'm going to make sure you never tell anyone about what you saw today. The bandits panicked, whoa, whoa, whoa. Wait. Wait. We won't tell anyone. Not a soul. We swear. One pleaded. Please he scoffed, you'd spill all of your secrets for a shot of sake or a free night with some whore in an instant. Besides, you're all a bunch of murderous thugs. If I let you go, you'll go back to being just that. Also he then pointed to the captive girl, you were intending to rape that poor girl, and if it's one thing I don't tolerate, it's rapists. He snarled. The bandits were now trembling, please, just let us go. We won't do anything like that ever again. The warrior nodded, that's right. You won't. He then turned to the captive girl, cover your ears, close your eyes, and count to ten he ordered. She seemed hesitant, but did so. And with that the warrior slaughtered the whimpering thugs before him. He finished just before she reached ten. She opened her eyes and saw the hooded man standing at the gate to her tiny cage, his scythe holstered behind his back. The mutilated bodies of the slain thugs lay behind him. He stood in the way of her view, ensuring she wouldn't have to lay eyes on the gruesome sight. 
She backed up as far as the cage would allow, which wasn't much, in fear. SHHHH he told her gently, a great change from his cold tone from before, it's alright, miss. I'm not going to hurt you he promised. After a moment, she relaxed, though her eyes still held a hint of fear. I'm going to let you out now. Is that alright? He asked. Not trusting her voice, she nodded. The warrior then grabbed the door to her cage and, with a small grunt, tore it off its hinges before throwing it across the room, shocking the former prisoner with his strength. But the door now open, the girl curled out and stood up, only for her legs to wobble and give way, the cause being her being locked away in a space where she could not stand for a few days. The hooded warrior caught her in midfall, and she couldn't help but blush at the feeling of his muscular chest underneath his clothes. The warrior gently set her down and kneeled next to her. What's your name? He asked. She waited a moment before answering, Kei Kaiomi, he replied in a shaky voice. You're a beauty. Well, it certainly fits he said, smiling beneath his hood. Kaiomi blushed. He thank you for rescuing me, she said. He smiled beneath his hood, you are most welcome. He then saw she was still trembling. I probably should have mentioned this earlier, but I saw a large group of samurai wandering around nearby he told her, they are likely looking for you. They'll probably be here soon. Kaiomi's eyes widened, those were her father's men. The hooded man continued, unfortunately, I can't be here when they arrive, so this is where we part ways. But first, I need to ensure you will never tell them or anyone else what happened. Kaiomi began to back away in fear. He held up his hands, calm down. I'm not going to hurt you, he promised, I'm just going to wipe your memory of what happened here. Kaiomi relaxed, you. You can do that. She asked. He nodded, of course, just look into my eyes, he said as he approached her. Wait. She said, giving him pause, will I remember you? Will I ever see you again? She asked. The man was now directly in front of her, I'll see you, he told her, but you won't see me. He looked into her eyes. His eyes seemed to glow white for a moment before returning to normal. Barely a second later, Kaiomi's eyes glowed white before returning to normal. She then proceeded to pass out, with the warrior slowly lowering her to the ground. He stood up and heard the sounds of the samurai entering the cave. Time to go, he thought before disappearing in a swirl of shadows. He reappeared outside the cave just as the last samurai entered it. He then raised a hand to his ear. Mission complete. Bring me home. And with that he vanished. The Palace of Decay, headquarters of the Reaper Corps in the Void. The hooded man reappeared within a large room of the castle, where several others were gathered, talking and preparing. A group of hooded figures were aiding the others in their preparations. Welcome back, Reaper Yuzumaki one of the attendants said in their usual, whispering tone. The hooded man then removed his hood, revealing a handsome face, with three whisker marks on either side of his cheeks and spiky, blonde hair. It's good to be back, Naruto Yuzumaki said as he left the room to report to his master. It has been four years since Naruto's death, and the years have been kind to him. He was taller now, more muscular, and had lost all of his baby fat. He was no longer an impatient, hyperactive little kid, he was now a full-fledged reaper, an intelligent, calculating slayer of the supernatural. Since joining, he hadn't regretted being a part of the core for even a moment. What death had warned him about was true, the training had been brutal, but the end result was worth it. He was stronger, faster, and tougher than ever before. In addition to this, time passed differently here, while well, he had only been gone four years in Earth time, he had been in the void for eight. Thus, Naruto had eight years of training under his belt. The training took years, but, eventually, he was awarded by being made a true member of the core. He had served as a reaper proudly for the past two void years, the equivalent of one earth year, and had already earned the respect and friendship of most of his fellows. He had yet to learn to harness the full potential of the power given to him, but he was making progress. Despite having lived in the void for eight years, his body was still aging in earth years, so he was, technically, 15 years old. As he made his way to the throne room, where death resided, he was interrupted by a regular annoyance that plagued the palace. Ah, you've returned, Naruto the boy said in a smooth voice, I trust your mission went well. Naruto sighed mentally and turned. Standing in front of him was a creature. It was unnaturally thin and taller than he was by about two feet. It had a demonic face, blue, scaly skin, emerald eyes without pupils, and a mouth full of razor-sharp teeth. It had two large horns growing out of its head and two small, stunted wings wrapped in bandages on its back. Its arms were thin and had numerous golden bands on them. The arms seemed comical when compared to the large clawed hands that were attached to them. It had no legs to speak of and merely floated above the ground. Around its waist, it wore long flowing cloth, almost dress-like in appearance, with strange patterns extending downwards. On its head, it wore a headdress that extended down to its mid-shoulders. At the top of the headdress were two black horns with a small, demonic, skull-shaped accessory. The creature's chest was bare, save for a strange eye-shaped medallion that appeared to be fused to its chest, right over where the heart would be. Dangling from this medallion were three small hooks. 
Finally, around its waist dangled a large variety of scrolls, trinkets, and baubles. This was Volgrim, one of the few demons who could walk well, float freely through the palace's halls, and not be slaughtered on sight. What do you want, Volgrim? Naruto asked in an annoyed tone. The false, hurt expression appeared on the demon's face as he clutched where his heart was. Oh, how you wound me with your words, young one. He said in a false tone of pain, can't a humble merchant have a simple chat with an old friend? He asked. Naruto's eyes narrowed, you don't have friends, Volgrim. You have customers, he told the demon. Said demon chuckled darkly, quite right, he conceded, very well, on to business. Volgrim was a merchant by trade, with connections across all realms, and the Reaper Corps was one of his best clients. Volgrim was known for being able to acquire any item, no matter its rarity, and this was one of the reasons the Corps kept him around. That and, with his connections, he was a veritable wealth of information. He was an annoyance, but a useful one. One who was wise enough not to betray them. Volgrim continued to speak, I came by to collect on the last of the payment you owe me, he told the blonde reaper, while floating around him in circles, gathering information on the whereabouts of that coven of necromancers, was neither easy nor cheap, you know. Naruto sighed, remembering he still owed the demon for a mission he completed a while back. Very well, he sighed. He unholstered his scythe and held it out in front of him. For a moment, nothing happened. And then, the eyes of both of the demonic faces on either side of the side began to glow, and a strange pale green energy began to seep out of it. It began to swirl around before floating towards Volgrim. The demon grinned as he opened his mouth wide and inhaled. The strange energy was sucked into Volgrim's mouth. After a few seconds of this, the energy was all gone, straight down the demon's gullet. Volgrim closed his mouth, mmm. He said, satisfied with his meal, a guardian was in there, aged perfectly. While most demons preferred to devour the souls of mortals, Volgrim had learned to feed off of the soul energy of most other creatures, even his own kind. Most of his customers paid in gold or precious gems, as well as rare and valuable artifacts, but the demonic merchant accepted soul energy as well, and the Reaper Corps provided this in abundance. Reaper weapons could harvest this energy from all the enemies they had slain. This energy could be used for many purposes, but most of it was used to pay for Volgrim's services. Naruto then holstered his weapon, I trust this makes us even. He asked. Um. He asked, lost in his own little world, oh. Yes. Yes, it most certainly does he replied, now, I believe our business is concluded, he said, before grinning, unless you'd like to browse my wares. He asked hopefully. No thank you. Olgrim shrugged, suit yourself. If you change your mind, you know where to find me. And with that he floated off. Greedy son of a bitch Naruto mentally grumbled before continuing on to the throne room. He then paused, remembering the weapons he had taken from the demons. Better turn these in before meeting the boss he thought. He then turned to another hallway and continued walking. The foundry, the sounds of hammers meeting metal, grinder wheels sharpening blades, and grunts of exertion echoed throughout the room as dozens of blacksmiths were at work. And what a room it was. It was huge and was covered with all the smelting and blacksmith equipment a craftsman could ever want or need. As Naruto moved through the room, he smelled smoke and sweat. He could feel the intense heat even before he walked in. It was fortunate that all members of the core had a greater resilience to heat and cold than living humans, otherwise everyone in the room would be dehydrated and overcome with heatstroke. After a few moments, he finally made his way to the forge master. He was taller than Naruto by a great deal, standing at a whopping 15 feet tall. He was heavily muscular, bare-chested, and covered in ash and soot. Despite his intimidating build, it was not his most distinctive feature. What really caused him to stand out was his hair and beard. Both were thick and dirty, but they also seemed to be made of fire. He was currently busy with his massive forge and didn't notice his visitor. Hephaestus. Naruto called out, getting the giant's attention. So focused on his work, the forge master jumped up in surprise at the sound of his name, his head hitting a large rack of hanging tools. Ow, shite. Son of a bitch. He swore in a deep Scottish accent, holding his forehead in pain. Naruto couldn't help but laugh. Hephaestus turned and saw him, glad ya find this so fucking funny ya cheeky little bastard he growled out. Naruto managed to control himself enough to speak, sorry old man, he said, but you have to admit it's funny to see a god bang his head like that. Former god Hephaestus corrected, his forehead finally stopped throbbing. He then looked at the blonde reaper and smiled, knowing it was all in good fun, so, what can I do for a blondie? He asked. Hephaestus was once one of the Olympian gods and crafted a great many items, weapons, and armor of legendary status for his fellows on Mount Olympus. Despite his skill, he was treated like an abusive parent would treat an ugly stepchild and kept him hidden away, something Naruto could relate to. When the divinity war broke out, Hephaestus chose to stay neutral and thus, when the pagan gods were defeated, he was among the few that was spared the creator's wrath. 
alone and without purpose, Death approached the smith god and offered him a place in the core, a place where he could practice his craft in peace and be appreciated for it as head of the smiths. He agreed and had been forging weapons and armor for the core since, a decision he has not regretted in the slightest. A tick mark appeared on Naruto's head at the nickname. He decided not to retort and pulled out a scroll. He channeled his chakra into it and, with a poof, eleven demonic weapons appeared on the floor between the two. Ah, more material he said before picking up an axe, I tell ya, demon weapons are made in two forms. Brilliant or fucking terrible. I mean, look a this thing. He said holding up the axe, looks like some fucking helbus ate it, threw it up, swallowed it again, and then shit it out. He pointed out, I mean, with angel weapons, ya, yeah, a least get a decent looking weapon, even if they're dainty as shite. Naruto simply stood there quietly. Hephaestus could talk for hours about the quality weapons and armor, and it was best not to interrupt a former god. The forge master then shrugged, ah well, a least they're good for material. Thanks lad. Naruto nodded, any time he told the former smith god before remembering he still needed to see death, well, I've got to go see the boss. Take care old man. Hephaestus nodded, you too lad. Naruto then turned and left, leaving the old smith to his work. The withered throne. Naruto walked into the throne room and saw death hard at work. The Lord of Bones was sitting on a large stone throne with bones carved on it. The ends of the armrests were two large stone skulls. At the top of the throne was a demonic skull. Currently, the Grim Reaper was judging the soul of a shadow in front of him. The shade was standing on a circular section of the floor, which was sunken into the floor, allowing death to look down on it. The floor section was covered in small symbols, carved into the floor. Like all shades, it had no defining features and left no way of telling who it once was. Its build, however, was obviously male. Death was currently glaring down at the quivering shade. You have spent your entire life living off of the misery of others he told the shade, to satisfy your greed, you have committed unspeakable atrocities against your fellow men and women. Murder, theft, rape he listed and then snarled, and you have the gall to ask me for mercy? To the inferno with you. See your life as you truly lived. At these words, a portal opened under the shade's feet, radiating heat and echoing with the screams of the damned. He fell through it, screaming. The portal closed as quickly as it had opened. Death pinched a bridge of his nose. What a wasted life he said tiredly. He then felt the presence and looked up. Ah, Naruto. Excellent timing, I was just finishing up with the last of the bandit clan you slaughtered he told his servant, I trust this means Rizen has been dealt with. Naruto walked to his master and then kneeled. He has, master. Rizen and his followers will trouble mankind no longer he told death. The head reaper grinned, excellent. I knew you would be up to the task. I am honored to serve, he said humbly. Death nodded, speaking of serving, I have something to discuss with you, he told the blonde reaper before standing, walk with me. Naruto stood and followed death. The two stopped at a balcony overlooking the void. The realm certainly lived up to its name. The landscape was dominated by mountains and canyons, all a dull gray. The land was covered with bones and skeletons. Some were from creatures so large, they rivaled the mountains in sheer size. What looked like snow was raining down on them. In reality, it wasn't snow, but ash. Despite its bleakness, the view was astonishing. You picked a real peach of a world to settle down on, Naruto told Death, humor present in his tone. Death shrugged, not minding the lack of formality, I like the quiet. The scenery isn't bad either. The two chuckled a bit and were then silent for a few moments. Finally, Death broke the silence, it has been four human years since you've arrived here. In that time, you have trained and prepared. You have exceeded my expectations for you and are a proud member of the Corps he paused for a bit before continuing, and now, the time has come for you to return to the life you left behind. Naruto quickly spun around and faced his master, it's finally time. He asked eagerly. Death nodded, yes. The genuine placements are coming up in Konoha and you are more than ready. Naruto was now giddy with excitement. He had been waiting for this moment for years. Finally, he would be allowed to see his loved ones again. Not only that, but he could finally walk the streets of Konoha without fear. When do I leave? Naruto asked, barely containing himself. Tomorrow death answered, the exams are the day after you arrive, and arriving a day early will help you acclimatize to the village. Naruto nodded, understanding, I'll go prepare then he then bowed and turned to leave when his master stopped him. Not so fast death said, causing Naruto to halt and turn to face him, there are a few things I'd like to address first for when you arrive. Firstly, not showing off your powers too much, I'd like you to keep a low profile for the time being. Only unleash your true power when the situation demands it. Naruto nodded, agreeing. Secondly, when you arrive, you will speak to the Sandame and tell him everything about what you have become and what you do. Naruto's eyes widened, everything. He asked skeptically. Everything. The core, our purpose, the existence of the supernatural, all of a death answered, your duties as a reaper will likely require you to take many leaves of absence from the village. 
The Hokage will need to authorize them and for that, he must know exactly what you do. Leaving the village without his consent will give the petulant fools on the council an excuse to brand you as a missing nin he explained. The blonde reaper nodded, I understand he then smirked, the old man's gonna have a heart attack when he hears about this. Beth chuckled, yes, most likely. But it will no doubt be entertaining he then became serious again, thirdly, when you meet with him, you will have him hand over your inheritance. I will not have my representative on earth living in a vermin-infested apartment complex. Naruto nodded again. He had learned about his parents after his first two years in the void. His mother was Kashina Uzumaki and his father Minato Namikaze, the Yandame Hokage. Naruto had been furious at first, but death soon calmed him down, explaining why his father had done what he did to him for the safety of the village. He told the boy that his parents had loved him very much and had looked forward to meeting him. It took quite a bit of convincing, but he finally forgave his father and vowed to make both of his parents proud. Beth continued, fourthly, you take you know who with you he ordered. Naruto smirked, why? Is she too much for you guys? He teased, knowing who he was talking about. She gets anxious enough when you leave on missions. Creator knows what she'll do if you go home without her, and I don't feel like having to deal with her rampaging through the palace, he told his subordinate. Naruto chuckled, all right, all right, I'll take her with me. It'll be good for her to stretch her legs for a bit. But won't people ask questions about her? He asked. You can tell people she's a type of summoner animal companion. The Inuzukas have their dogs, the Aburums have their insects, and you have. Her he explained. Naruto laughed, she's a bit different from most pets, though. Beth shrugged, deal with it however you wish, but you can't leave her here, everyone else is nervous enough as it is. All right, whatever you say boss he said, still smiling. Though the reaper said before continuing, finally, keep an eye on the advisor on the village council known as Danzo Shimura. He is a die-hard patriot, but I suspect he has dealings with a paranormal source. On a more personal note, he hates the Sandane for holding the position he has desired for decades. His bitterness festers in him like an infected wound, and I suspect he'll take any opportunity to seize control. Like dealing with demons, Naruto said. The Reaper nodded, precisely. Desperation and greed can make men do terrible things he warned, but be warned, he has a great amount of influence in Konoha and Fire Country as a whole. If you move against him, he will use this against you. I have seen what lies within his black heart, he holds a desire to conquer the other nations, and, if he becomes Hokage, he will likely start a war that will consume the earth. Naruto was confused, I thought it wasn't our place to interfere in the affairs of humanity. Beth nodded, it isn't. But you are going to be a shinobi of Konoha and will have to protect it from all threats, foreign and domestic. Danzo's reign will likely destroy Konoha and everyone in it, something I'm sure you wish to avoid. Do you want me to kill him? Naruto asked. Only if he has dealings with the forces of hell or others who seek to do humanity harm, may you kill him in the name of the core Naruto was about to protest when death spoke again, but, if he shows his true colors and commits treason against Konoha, you, as a ninja, will be free to deal with him as you see fit. I advise caution, if you attack without proof, he will rally the village against you. My advice is to bring him down when you have sufficient evidence. Even then, be wary, he is more powerful than he appears he warned. Naruto nodded, I understand, master, he said. Before realizing something, he didn't know what the man looked like. What does he look like? He asked, voicing his mental question. Look for the one-eyed, one-armed old man staring at you like you're a prize to be one he explained, which reminds me, Danzo controls a private army of emotionless shinobi called Root, an organization that was outlawed by the Sande many years ago. He constantly seeks to bolster his forces and will see you as a potential recruit and will likely try to kidnap and brainwash you into becoming his mindless weapon simply because you hold Karama. Who knows what he'll do when he finds out what you can really do. Naruto's eyes narrowed, he would go that far? He asked. Beth nodded, he already has. He tried to raise you in his root division as a mindless tool, but the sand aim stopped him, hoping to give you a proper childhood. Naruto began to hate this man, who he had never met before, and became even more grateful to the old Hokage for sparing him that fate. I understand master. I will exercise the utmost caution he said, bound, was there anything else? No death told him, you may leave and prepare for tomorrow, it will be a busy day for you. Meet me at the well tomorrow at noon, I will personally see you off he ordered, referring to the room where all reapers are transported to earth. Naruto bowed again, by your leave then. He then turned around and walked towards his quarters to prepare. Death sighed mentally and looked out upon the landscape. The journey ahead will be difficult for you, Naruto he thought grimly, may my brother watch over you. Naruto's quarters, a few minutes later, Naruto closed the door to his room and sighed. His room was small, only large enough to accommodate his needs like all of the other living quarters in the palace. Naruto walked over to his bed and sat down on it. Something wrong with it? A voice in his mind asked. Normally, hearing voices in one's head was a sign of insanity, but Naruto was a special case. No Kurama. 
well, yes. I mean, I'm excited about going home. But on the other hand. He trailed off. You worry your loved ones will think less of you when they hear what you've done the fox answered. Naruto nodded, don't get me wrong, I'm proud of being a reaper, but I've killed so many people. I know they deserved it but still. Git, listen to me, you are one of the bravest, wisest, and kindest souls I have ever met. Your precious people may be surprised after hearing your exploits, but I know they will never stop caring about you. You, the boy who brought so much light into their lives the old fox said in a warm and reassuring tone. Naruto smiled a bit, thanks Kurama. I'm glad we're partners now. Kurama shook his head, not partners he corrected, friends. Naruto smiled even more at that. Over the last several years, Naruto had learned to communicate with his biju. The two were not on friendly terms at the start, considering the fox was the reason Naruto's life had been so difficult. When the fox had explained to Naruto that he had been forced to attack the village and had once been imprisoned within his mother, Naruto eventually found it in his heart to forgive him. After knowing each other for years, the two were now close friends, and the fox even trusted his jailer enough to tell him his real name. Karama. Naruto had even changed his mindscape into a vast forest and turned the cage into a collar, allowing Kurama to run free in his mind. Naruto then realized something. Oh shit he suddenly said, what time is it? He asked before glancing up at the clock on the wall, shit. It's getting late, I need to go feed Beatrice. He said as he got up, exited his room, and quickly made his way to the dungeon where his pet was held. Kurama chuckled, better hurry up boy he told his container in a humorous tone, you don't want her to smash her way through the palace, searching for something to eat. Or someone. Remembering what happened the last time he was late feeding his pet, Naruto moved faster. Kurama, meanwhile, was laughing at his panic. Before suddenly becoming sad. Friends he thought to himself, remembering what he had said during their earlier conversation, yes. Just. Friends. The next morning, Naruto awoke from a rather pleasant dream. He couldn't remember much about it, but he did remember the smell of lavender. He heard Kurama laughing in his mind. What's so funny? He asked. Oh, nothing. Nothing at all the fox answered. Deciding to ignore his tenant, Naruto got dressed and headed down to the mess hall for something to eat. Just because most of the people here didn't need to eat doesn't mean they don't like to. As he made his way there, Naruto noticed a lack of people moving through the palace. Normally, the palace was a very busy place, but now it seemed almost empty. Naruto felt a surge of power coming from Harvest, the blade was worried as well. I know he told his weapon, this is weird. As Naruto opened the great doors to the mess hall, he was blasted by a loud chorus of surprise. Jumping in surprise, Naruto almost pulled out his weapon when he saw the sight before him. In the large room, nearly every member of the corps had gathered for some type of celebration, and they were all smiling at him. Nearly all members of all units were there, including Hephaestus, who towered over the rest, Eo, the old inventor who leads the Maker's unit, the man known only as the Scribe, who now leads the Scholar's unit of the Corps, and even Death himself. At last. A deep baritone voice cried out, the guest of honor has arrived. Naruto looked and saw a very large though not as large as Hephaestus muscular man wearing the standard cloak and hood of the Corps, hiding his features. Krumer sensei Naruto asked, knowing who the man was, despite not being able to see his face, what's going on? Isn't it obvious? Another cloaked man with a British accent asked, we're celebrating your return to life. Alanus is correct another man said in an accent one would find in some regions of Africa, the spirits have declared this to be a day of joyous celebration, the reaper known as Zalem amended. You didn't think we'd let you go without a party, did you? Another cloaked figure, a woman this time, said in a light voice. This reaper was known as Sayora. Your journey will be difficult. Before you embark, it is best you relax among friends and colleagues the calm thoughtful voice of the reaper Sharam spoke. Naruto was stunned and was as touched, I I don't know what to say he told them all honestly. Nothing needs to be said, another cloaked figure, another woman, said in a low voice, except thank you perhaps. Sayora rolled her eyes behind her hood, way to kill the Mudriaza. I fail to see how pointing out the obvious has killed the Mudriaza replied. Naruto looked upon the cloaked reapers who had spoken his senses for the past several years. In any case death said interrupted, your time with us has been memorable, and you have made friends among the core. Friends who would wish you well and celebrate your resurrection. Here, here. Hephaestus called out. Death then spoke again, we have a few hours before you depart, use them well. The Naruto Uzumaki. Krumer said holding up a mug of ale, the obnoxious little bastard who's made us all proud. The Naruto. Everyone chorused at once. Said blonde had never been happier as he looked out on the people who had become more than friends to him. More than comrades they were his family. And he couldn't be happier. Hours later, after the celebration, Naruto was escorted to the well by his master and friends. The well was a large portal that would take the person who entered it wherever the user wanted. No one except death knew how it worked, but no one could deny its usefulness. So Naruto said, this is it. 
Beth nodded, indeed, it is finally time he answered, but before you go, I have two more gifts to give you. Beth held out a clawed hand and, in a swirl of dark energy, a scroll appeared in it. You've done well in learning the first level techniques of dark release he told his subordinate, and, now, I believe you are ready to learn the next few. He then handed the scroll to Naruto. The dark release bloodline was not a part of Naruto's family history. No one in his family tree had ever awakened it. This was because the bloodline didn't exist in his family. Naruto had gained the bloodline from death. The bloodline was created generations ago and granted to a clan of humans by the Reaper, who believed they would use it for just purposes, which they did. However, in recent years, the clan began to die out, with the last member being murdered under mysterious circumstances. Seeking to reintroduce the power to a new clan, Death chose the last of the Uzumaki clan, Naruto Uzumaki, to bear his gift. He had only allowed Naruto to learn the two most basic techniques so far. Dark Release. Inhaling Maw, which allowed the user to absorb chakra and spells, in Naruto's case through their palms, even from Jutsu, and Dark Release. Judgment, which allowed the user to use the absorb to launch blue flames back at the attacker to either burn or knock back with concussive force, or in Naruto's case, to be able to send the same attack back at the attacker. Normally, the use of Dark Release required a special brand to be placed into one or more of the user's palms, but Naruto was a special case, having received the bloodline from the source. Now, Naruto was being given the chance to learn even more. He couldn't wait. Thank you, Master, Naruto said bowing. Your welcome death answered, but I have one last gift for you. With another swirl of energy, a large ornate box appeared in the Lord of Bones' hands. Well, actually it's from someone else, but I was asked to deliver it to you. Death then opened the box. Inside, laid gently in the center, was a cross. But this was no ordinary cross. It was silver in color, with gems encrusted into it. It was covered in strange runes. Naruto could feel the power radiating from it. This is a powerful relic, Death told the blonde, one of heaven's most cherished treasures. This is the crucifix. It contains limitless divine power. Power that comes from within it, from a thorn of Christ's crown of thorns. The blood of the creator flows through it. Everyone in the room, besides Death, gawked in awe at the cross. Holy shit Krumer whispered. Several people kneeled and began to pray, the highly religious Sharam included. Everyone else was silent. There were no words. Death continued, Naruto. You have been chosen to wield it. Everyone was even more shocked, but none more so than Naruto himself. Me? He asked after finally finding his voice, why? I do not know Death answered truthfully, nor do I know who sent it. It came with a message that told me to give it to you. The message contained the seal of the archangels he then smiled, apparently, you've made some friends upstairs. Naruto reached towards it with a trembling hand. He hesitates for a moment. And then grabs it gently and holds it up. He felt a strange sense of warmth flow through his body, a comforting feeling of peace and love. The blonde reaper gazed at the beautiful cross, in awe of it. What kind of power does it possess? He asked, looking up at his master. Holy power he answers, the light it emits burns all evil creatures and causes unimaginable pain to them. Wicked souls burn at its touch. It fires holy energy at those it is directed towards that only harms evil beings death explained, but its most powerful ability. Is the power to absolve any soul of all their sins. Even the most wicked of souls can be absolved by its holy light. Everyone was now even more astonished by this revelation. The power to absolve any sin. Only the creator possessed this power. And now, so did Naruto. Other powers may reveal themselves in time. The message stated that you are to use it however you wish, as long as your intentions are good and just. But be warned he told the blonde, you must only use the power of absolvement on those who are worthy of redemption. Naruto nodded, I understand master he said, while inwardly vowing to be worthy of using it and to validate the trust of whoever had given him the crucifix. Also death said, stirring Naruto out of his thoughts, the crucifix has bonded to you in the same way Harvest has. None but you are able to use it. Naruto continued to stare at the relic before realizing something. How do I use it? He asked. In time, the crucifix will show you his master answered. Naruto gave the relic one more glance before placing it in his coat, along with the scroll he had received. Thank you master he said to death, bowing, and please tell whoever sent this thank you and assure them I will use the crucifix wisely. Death nodded, I will he promised. A few moments of silence passed before death spoke again. Well, it's about time for you to go. Naruto's friends gathered around to say their farewells. Good luck to you boy Krumer told him, giving him a powerful pat on the back, show them what a real warrior can do. Naruto smiled and nodded, I will, Krumer he promised. Fight with honor and valor my friend, Palinus told him. Always Naruto vowed. Zalem then stepped forward, the spirits favor you Naruto. Nevertheless, I wish you good fortune on your journey. Thank you Zalem. Zayora then stepped forward and gave him a sisterly hug, be safe, brother. Naruto returned the hug, you as well, sister. 
Sharam bowed in respect, I do not know what lies ahead of you my friend he said, but I know you will make us all proud. Naruto bowed in return. Ryaza then stepped forward, I'm not very good at this but. She then pulled him into a quick hug before backing away before Naruto could return it. Good luck Naruto she told him, fight well. The others couldn't help but chuckle at her awkwardness. Hephaestus then lumbered forward, you take care of yourself, ya yeah, hear me lad. And you take even better care of that side of yours, I didn't forget it just so you could it up. Naruto smiled and nodded, I will be an old man, and don't worry about harvest, it's in good hands. Naruto then turned to his master and bowed. Thank you, master, for everything. Death smiled, it was my pleasure. Just remember that no matter what happens, you will always have a home here he assured the blonde reaper. Naruto nodded and walked towards the well and looked down at the swirling vortex of energy. He turned to his family and gave them one last wave before leaping into the well, quickly disappearing. Creator favors you, young one death thought. Kanoha, Naruto reappeared in a swirl of dark energy and looked around. He appeared to be in a deserted alley. But he thought, no witnesses to that little display. Naruto then upholstered harvest and looked at it. Well, pal, time for you to blend in, he told his sentient weapon. The scythe quivered. Don't give me that he told the protesting weapon, you're liable to scare the shit out of everyone who sees you and will likely draw attention to us and we don't want that. Yet. Harvest relented and, in yet another swirl of energy, transformed into a meter-long scepter with a silver skull at the top. Naruto twirled the staff in his hand. There he said, was that so difficult? He asked. The scythe grumbled. Smiling, Naruto then pulled up his hood, concealing his face and walked out of the alley. It was high noon in Kanoha, with people moving through the streets performing their everyday tasks. Naruto noticed that he was in the market district, close to where he had been killed. Doesn't look like anything has changed, Kurama noted. Nope, just a normal peaceful day in sunny Kanahagakur he thought before smirking, for now. Kurama chuckled at this, yes, just wait until everyone realizes that the demon brat has escaped death and has returned. Naruto laughed inwardly, imagining the villagers' reactions in response to his sudden return. He then looked towards the Hokage Tower. Well he thought, time to pay the old man a visit, here's hoping he doesn't have a heart attack. And with that Naruto began walking towards the tower, just another figure in the crowd. Hokage's office, the Hokage Tower, here is in Saratobi was, normally, a very serious person. Renowned for his knowledge and skill, the Sandame Hokage was respected by his people and feared by his enemies. Yet, unbeknownst to all except a select few, the old cage did have one weakness. A weakness so crippling that, were it ever used against him, it would mean his absolute and total defeat. And that weakness was. Itcha Itcha. Yes, the famous infamous Sandame Hokage held a great weakness for the erotic novel series that his student, Jiraiya, had created. In the old man's humble opinion, no other work of literature could rival what his literary genius of a student had forged from the fires of his own imagination. He couldn't help but scoff at remembering that death had been supremely disappointed in the work of art. The current novel he was reading was a brand new addition to the series. He was about to get to the best part when. Working hard I see. Sandane jumped out of his chair and looked around frantically for the source of the voice that had interrupted his reading. He heard chuckling and looked to the window, where a hooded figure holding a scepter of some kind was leaning up against the wall. Did I startle you? The hooded figure asked. The Sandane calmed himself and fell into a fighting stance. Who are you? How did you get in here? He demanded. The figure clutched at his heart. Oji San I'm hurt he said in a tone of mock emotional pain, surely you still remember me after all these years. The figure then removed his hood. The old cage was greeted by a familiar face, one that had spiky, blonde hair and blue eyes. At first, Hiruzen thought that this was Yandame until he saw the whisker marks on his face. Then Naruto? He asked. Naruto smiled, yep. I'm back old man. The Sandame suddenly leapt over his desk and hugged the boy who he saw as a surrogate grandson, a hug which was returned. The two separated after a moment and the old man looked over the blonde young man. I, I almost can't believe it, he said, but you're really here. Just like he said you would be. Naruto smiled, you mean death, yes? He asked. The old man looked surprised. Why the surprise Jiji? He asked, surely he told you he had made me an offer. An offer that I accepted. Why yes he did the old cage answered, and he told me you would tell me more when you returned he told the blonde. Naruto smiled even more, you might want to have a seat, old man, he told the Sandame Hokage, this is gonna be a long story. Chapter 2. Questions and Revelations. The office of the Hokage was silent. Naruto Uzumaki had just finished telling the Sandame Hokage, here is in Suratobi, all there was about where he had been, what he had been doing, and what he was now a part of. The aged Hokage could only stare in disbelief. He had seen many incredible things in his many decades of life. But what the resurrected blonde had just told him defied reason and possibility. Demons, angels, monsters, spirits, and the undead. Heaven, hell, and other realms. 
a group of warriors, scientists, and others working to keep all of this, and more, a secret and keeping the human race safe from these things. It defied everything humanity knew about the universe. Naruto smiled at the shock on the old man's face. You're trying to wrap your head around this he guessed, I know how you feel. I didn't believe it at first, either. But I've seen these things, and more, with my own eyes. I can tell you, it's all real. Everything we were told as children was myth and legend. Is all true. Sandame finally managed to find his voice. So? You say you're part of an organization that keeps the world safe from? Supernatural beings? He asked. Naruto nodded, yes. The Reaper Corps is almost as old as the human race. For countless millennia, we have kept the world, and all who live on it, safe from the dark forces that would see them destroyed or enslaved he explained. Like demons? The old man asked. Among other things the blonde reaper answered, but demons are the most common threat we face. They constantly seek to escape from hell and find it entertaining to cause as much chaos and death as they can. The old cage was stunned, demons walk the earth. Naruto nodded. How many? Naruto shrugged, dozens. Maybe hundreds he answered. And no one notices. Hiruzen asked, how? Possession. Demons claim the souls of humans and use them to enter a person's body Naruto explained, they walk around in human skin. And no one suspects a thing. The Sandame looked troubled. Don't worry old man. Demons can't take any soul by force. The old man was confused, then how? Naruto interrupted, a person's soul is the one possession we can truly say is our own he explained, it cannot be taken away from us. It must be given willingly. People. Give their souls away. The Sandame asked, sickened but what he was hearing. Naruto shook his head, not for free, no. Humans always ask for something in return. Demons entice mortals with deals, promising wealth, power, or whatever in exchange for their souls. Humanity, as a whole, only places value on things they can see, touch, taste, and feel. People go about their lives every day without thinking of their souls. In their minds, a soul has no meaning in life, and life is all that matters, so why keep it? Why not trade it for something that is more material? Naruto then looks sad, of course, it's only after the deal is finalized does the person realize their mistake. Demons use the victim's soul to amplify their own magical power and use it to collect on their end of the bargain. But everything they give always has a catch. The person may get what they want at first. But the deal always goes bad for the human and, soon, they find themselves with less than what they had before. Before they realize it, their soul is in hell. And something else is wearing their skin. Some don't even realize that they aren't in control of their actions anymore. Garrison was shocked at something so. Evil could happen without notice. But why? He asked, why do demons do this? It's all they know, Naruto told him simply, Lucifer, the lord of hell, despises us as much as he does the creator and ensures that all demons are taught to hate us as well. Wait, you said that heaven and hell have a truce, that they aren't allowed to intervene in our affairs. How do the demons get away with this? Sande masked. Lucifer claims that the demons that escape to earth are acting against his wishes and that his subjects are acting on their own behalf, Naruto told him before continuing, that's mostly true, he doesn't actively encourage them, but he doesn't stop them either. Thus, the balance is, technically, unbroken. But if the demons rule hell, why do they wish to escape it? It's a prison Naruto answered simply, they may be the wardens, but they also serve life sentences, just like the souls of the damned, and they don't age like we do. They can live a long time. Some demons have enough power and influence to the point that they have no desire to leave. But most are unsatisfied with their place in the inferno and constantly seek to escape it. Is possessing humans the only way they can escape? The Sande masked, growing more and more concerned with this new, hidden threat. Naruto shook his head, no, there are other ways, but they seldom work. Sometimes demons attempt a blind jump into some random being on earth. They get stuck in inanimate objects or things like trees or wild animals. What happens to them then? Well, inanimate objects tend to harness the demon's power, turning it into an item of power. I, personally, wouldn't use the item, as the trap demon's hatred of humans tends to cause the wielder to be cursed. Trees and animals, well. He paused for a moment before continuing, they mutate into horrific monsters. The process rips away all sanity from them and causes them to mindlessly attack anything and anyone around them in a blind rage. Naruto continued, other than that, the only other way I know of is if they are summoned by an outside force, another demon or some human who seeks to control them. The latter case never works out. The summoned demon just kills the summoner and is free to rampage across the world. Sandane was even more troubled after hearing this, humans can summon demons. He asked. Naruto nodded. How? Magic Naruto answered like it was the simplest thing in the world. Magic? Sandane asked, bewildered, magic exists. And humans can use it. Naruto chuckled, of course he said, shinobi use it all the time he saw the confused look on the old cage's face, he elaborated, when you breath fire or summon a wall of stone, what do you think it is you're doing? 
he asked. Using chakra, Sandeem answered. And what do you think chakra is? The natural energy that exists in all of us. Naruto nodded, a natural magical energy that exists in all of us he corrected before continuing, the sage of six paths, was the first to unlock this energy, and soon taught others how to do the same. As the generations passed, humanity inherited this power from their ancestors, and, now, all of us possess the ability to use it. Sandame was shocked. Wait he started, you're saying that magic, something we were told was pure fiction, is not only real. But we've been using it for well over a thousand years. Naruto laughed, yep. The sage knew that people would panic if they learned that they were using magic, so he told them only half of the truth, that we were using a natural energy that exists inside us all. He left out the part that that energy was magical in nature he explained. A few moments passed in silence, as Naruto let Hiruzen contemplate all of this. After a few more moments, Naruto decided to break the silence. So he began, now that I've answered some of your questions, what say you answer some of mine? The Sandame was brought out of his daze, what? Oh, yes. Of course. Ask away he said gesturing for the blonde to continue. But Naruto said, firstly, when, exactly, were you going to tell me about the Kaiubi being sealed inside me? He asked calmly. The old cage began to panic, I, or were you never going to tell me at all? Naruto interrupted, and don't insult me by telling me you don't know what I'm talking about. Sandame sighed, how did you find out? He asked. Death told me the day I died, Naruto answered, and you still haven't answered my question. I was planning to tell you the day you became a shinobi he answered, along with. The old man stopped himself, almost revealing the village's greatest secret. Along with who my parents were. Naruto asked, finishing Sandame's sentence. The Hokage's eyes widened, you. You know? He asked. About what? That my mother was Kashina Uzumaki and my father was Minato Namikas. No, I haven't the slightest goddamn clue Naruto said in a bitter and sarcastic tone before glaring, of course I know. What I don't know is why you never told me. Was I to be condemned to living in that rat-infested apartment complex instead of my parents' mansion? Was I supposed to spend every moment of my life wondering who my parents were and whether they loved me or not? Was that what you wanted? The Sandame noticed the menacing tone Naruto was beginning to take. No. The old man argued, of course not. I would have told you. It's just. He paused before continuing, Naruto you have to understand, your parents made many enemies in the last war. Enemies who would have stopped at nothing to take their revenge on them through you. Iwa would have tried to kill you the second they knew. You could have told me at least, I could have kept it a secret, Naruto argued, still calm, but with a menacing tone. I wanted to, Naruto, I truly did, but you were young and impulsive the Sandame told him, I was worried you would tell everyone to get back at the villagers. I couldn't afford to take that risk. I was going to tell you the day you graduated from the academy. But that never happened. He looked Naruto in the eyes. The blonde saw the sadness in them. Naruto, the old man continued, when you died, I regretted so many things. But not telling you about Kaiubi and your parents. Those were the regrets that weighed most heavily upon my mind. Naruto stared at the old Hokage for a moment. I know he finally said, I was angry when I was first told what you kept from me. But I got over it. I forgave you a long time ago he smiled slightly, I just needed to know. To see it in your eyes, that you regretted it. The Sandame sighed in relief, thank god he said, I was so worried you would hate me for not telling you the truth. For keeping you in the dark for all these years he confessed. Naruto smiled wider, not my style. You, of all people, should know that he told his grandfather. Hiruzen chuckled, yes, I suppose I should have, he admitted. The two laughed for a moment before Naruto remembered something. Speaking of the Kaiubi he started, you should know that the attack on the village was no accident. Someone unleashed the fox upon the village he told the old cage. The Hokage's eyes widened, someone, but who? And how? I don't know who he is. But I know what he is. What do you mean? The man that unleashed the Kaiubi upon the village wore a mask with a single eye hole. But within that hole. Was a Sharingan eye he finished. Sandame's eyes widened even more, and it's a... He asked. Yes Naruto told him, one who is still alive. What? The old man asked, shocked even more than before, but the entire clan was slaughtered by Itachi. He claimed, only he and Sasuke survived, and I know Itachi's eyes wouldn't have been strong enough to use on the fox. Naruto nodded, I know, but death showed me the memories of what happened that night. I've seen the man in question and his eyes. It was an Achiha, one that either escaped the massacre. Or one who was a rogue ninja. Sandane pondered this for a moment before continuing, I know for a fact that none but Itachi and Sasuke survived the massacre, all the other members were accounted for. I also know there aren't any known Achiha missing nin besides Itachi he thought for a moment before asking, you say you don't know who he is. Naruto shook his head, no, I don't. Death knows. But he won't tell me. He probably thinks I'll try to hunt him down he said, I probably would he admitted. Hmm. 
The Sandame pondered, I'll have to have our spies try to find out more. Won't be easy though, it's been 15 years. The trail will have gone cold by now he said, mostly to himself. I should also let you know, Kaiubi was forced to attack the village and is a pretty nice guy when you get to know him. Hiruzen looked up in shock, you can communicate with it. He asked. Then Naruto corrected, and, yes, I can. We've become partners and friends over the years. You have nothing to worry about in that department he assured Sandame. The aged Hokage stared at the boy for a moment, skeptically, before responding. Alright he said, I'll. Trust your judgment. But you should keep the fact that you can speak to it and he corrected, from everyone else for now. People will be nervous enough that you've returned from the dead, they don't need any more reason to fear and hate you. Naruto nodded, fair enough, he said before remembering something else, also, death wants you to turn over my inheritance to me. All of it he told the old man seriously. Sandane was about to argue when Naruto interrupted again. If you're going to say something about me not being ready or that I'll be in danger, save it. Death is confident that I can take care of myself, and so am I he told him. Ryzen was about to argue again but decided not to. If the Shinigami believed that he was ready, then who was he to argue? All right Naruto he sighed before standing up. He walked over to a portrait of the Yandame on the wall and pressed a hidden button on its frame. The portrait swung open, revealing a safe behind it. After using the combination, the old cage opened the safe and retrieved the contents and closed it. He then walked back to his desk, sat down, and handed Naruto a pair of scrolls. These scrolls contain all you need to prove you are indeed the heir to the Yandame and the Uzumaki clan. The first is the deed to your parents' manor, and the second contains your birth certificate and your parents' last will and testament, in which they left everything to you he told the blonde, when we're done here, I'll take you to your parents' home. Naruto nodded, taking the scrolls, thanks old man. The Sandame nodded. Does the rest of the village know who I am? He asked. They do, he answered, after your death, I gathered the entire village and told them who they had hated and tortured all these years. They were quite shocked to say the least he then frowned, most refused to believe me, though, crying out that it was impossible. Some believed me. Though very few of them feel guilty about what they did to you. They believe you stopped being human after the fox was sealed into you he shook his head, the fools. Naruto thought about this. So the whole village knew, but they still refused to take responsibility for their actions. He mentally sighed. He should have known it wouldn't be easy. I suppose it was too much to ask that they get over their hatred he sighed, then became serious, I want you to understand something old man, I will not let the villagers push me around anymore. If they attack me, I will use lethal force if necessary he warned, darkly. The Sandame sighed, I know and you have every right to do so. Very well, if you are attacked, I give you permission to defend yourself and use lethal force, if necessary he conceded. Naruto nodded, good. After a moment, he spoke again, I still have more questions for you, old man, he pointed out. Of course, Sandame said, ask away. How are my friends? He asked before hesitating, do they know that I was going to return? Was my death hard on them? He asked nervously. They were, understandably, upset when I told them he answered, but they cheered up somewhat when I told them you'd be returning. I told them you'd come back, but I left death out of it, they would have thought I was crazy otherwise. I'm not entirely sure they believed what I told them. But you'll be able to remove any doubts they may still have, I'm sure he said, smiling. He then continued, as for the first part of your question, they are all quite fine, he assured the blonde reaper, Iruka still teaches at the academy, and the Ichiraku still have their stand, though, they don't see as much business since the disappearance of their number one customer. Naruto smiled, what about Hinata-chan? He asked. She is well the Sandame answered, she. Took your death the hardest. She wouldn't eat or talk to anyone, she just stayed in her room and slept all day, even after I told her you would be returning. I don't think she believed me in the slightest. Naruto felt horrible. He didn't mean to cause his closest friend so much pain. He would have to make it up to her. Maybe with a whole bunch of cinnamon rolls, those were always her favorite. Sandane continued, after a week of this, she emerged and promised to become stronger for you. She vowed to honor your memory by becoming the best Kanoichi she could be he explained, most of her shyness is gone, but she still stutters a bit when she's nervous. Naruto smiled, happy his friend was becoming stronger and more confident. Her strength and confidence aren't the only part of her that's changed, though, Sandame said cryptically. Now it was Naruto's turn to be confused, what do you mean? He asked. Hiruzen chuckled, let's just say that she draws a great deal of attention from the male population of the village. She, Ino Yamanaka and Sakura Haruno are tied in being the most attractive girls in their age group he explained. Naruto was surprised. He always thought Hinata was cute. But beautiful. Has she really changed that much? Hiruzen noticed Naruto deep in thought and chuckled, you'll see what I mean when you see her, he said. Naruto shrugged, if you say so. He then decided to ask one more question. One last question. Death told me the man who murdered me never passed through the void. 
What happened to him? He asked. Sandane frowned, remembering the foolish former Anbu that caused all of this, his name is Tamatsu Higurashi, and he is still alive. We had him severely tortured and locked away he clenched his fists, he took it all with a smile on his face. He was happy that he had avenged his late wife and didn't care what we did to him. He doesn't even care that his daughter has been forced to live on her own for all these years he said, angrily. He has a daughter? Naruto asked. Sandane nodded, yes. She's a year older than you. After her mother's death, her father became distant and started drinking. He abused her, telling her she had no right to look like her mother, like she was rubbing in the fact that she was dead he became even angrier, when I told him he would never see her again, he had the nerve to say, who cares. Every day, I wake up with a desire to kill him. Maybe I should. What happened to the daughter? Naruto asked. She became a Kinoichi a little less than a year ago he then smiled, she has friends now and is very strong. She has left her past behind her. Naruto smiled. But he thought, she deserves to be happy and free of that piece of shit. Maybe I'll meet her someday. I still can't stand the fact that he won't stop smiling after he killed you the old cage growled out. Naruto stared at him for a moment. And then smiled wickedly. Maybe I can do something about that, he told the old man. Sandane was confused, what do you mean? Naruto's smile widened even more, if he's so happy about me being gone. Imagine what he'll do when he realizes that his efforts were all in vain. The Sandame started to grin, understanding what the blonde reaper was implying. It would shatter his entire world. He said, he would be left to rot in prison with no hope of ever escaping and finishing what he started. He realized. Exactly Naruto answered, smirking. Well then the Sandane grinned darkly, I suppose we'll have to schedule an appointment as soon as possible. How about after we're done? Naruto suggested. The old man nodded, sounds good to me he conceded before asking, did you have any other questions? Or can I ask a few more? Naruto gestured for him to continue. You told me before that you had received a bloodline from death. May I ask what it is? Naruto nodded, it's called Dark Release Naruto began, death created it and gave a small shinobi clan the ability to use it. It mostly focuses on absorbing a foe's chakra and turning it against them. I've heard of this bloodline before, Sandame said, I thought it died out years ago, after the last war. It did, Naruto told him, the clan's numbers had been dwindling over the past few years. Most were killed during the war. The last user was murdered a few years ago, though we still don't know who did it. Why did death give you the power to use it? The old man asked. Naruto shrugged, I don't know he answered honestly, maybe he thought the Uzumaki clan would be able to use it justly. Maybe he wants to see if I can master it. Who knows? How well can you use it? Sande masked, intrigued. I can absorb and redirect simple attacks, that's about it he answered, the more complicated and powerful the jutsu, the more difficulty I have in absorbing and redirecting it. Death gave me a scroll to learn more powerful techniques before I arrived here, but it'll probably take a while to learn all of them. The Sandane was quiet for a moment contemplating this. You know what will happen when the council finds out about this don't you? He asked. Naruto nodded, they'll try to make me agree to the clan restoration act. I'll have to marry multiple women and have many children to restore the Uzumaki clan for the betterment of Konoha, blah, 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 patriotic bullshit nonsense he said in a tone like he had repeated this explanation countless times before. Sandane chuckled a bit at this, what will you tell them? He asked. Fuck off. Naruto suggested. Hiruzen laughed, somehow I doubt that will work. They hear that answer regularly. They both laughed for a moment. Seriously, though, if I do get through with it, I choose who I'll marry, not them, understand. The old cage nodded, I expected as much, but I'll bet some members will have their daughters try to win your heart. Naturally Naruto said, simply, but I'm pretty good at detecting bullshit. They won't succeed he vowed. I believe you, Sandame said, but enough about that, I have further questions. By all means, Naruto said, gesturing for him to go on. What exactly were you trained in over the last few years? The wide variety of things Naruto answered, weapon handling, marksmanship, tracking, stealth, occult knowledge, a few jutsu, and a bit of magic among other things. A lot of the time, though, I spent learning how to use this. He held out his scepter and, in a swirl of dark energy, it transformed into the largest, most brutal-looking side the Sandame had ever seen. Hiruzen jumped up a bit in surprise, what is that? He demanded. Naruto smirked, scary isn't it? This is Harvest, the weapon I took from the Reaper that arranged my premature death he told the old man, it is a sentient weapon, one that responds only to my touch. Only I can use it. It has four forms, the scepter, which you saw, the side the blade then swung upward, the spear and another swirl of dark energy, it transformed into an arm blade, and the arm blade he stated, before the weapon transformed into a scythe again, it's also quite flexible, and its reach is longer than it looks. It can also function as a grapple when it needs to. Before Sandane could say anything, Naruto continued, and, just today, I was given this, he said, pulling something out of his coat and placing it on the desk. 
It was a cross, the most beautiful cross he had ever seen. The crucifix he said, one of heaven's most holy artifacts, the blood of the creator himself powers it. It has the power to burn the wicked and absolve any soul of their sins. The old cage stared in awe at the cross on his desk, words unable to leave his lips. I'm not sure who sent it to me, but it blew my mind when I found out what it was. I don't know how to use it yet, but I hope to find out soon he then placed the crucifix back into his coat. Shaking himself out of his shock after a few minutes of silence, Sandame spoke. What? He cleared his throat and continued, what would you say your current skill level is? He asked. Naruto thought for a moment before answering, I can defeat nearly any genin and can hold my own against most. He explained. Sandame was surprised, after only four years. He asked, amazed at the blonde's progress. Time passes differently in the void, Naruto told him, four years passed on earth, but twice that many passed in the void. Sandane quickly did the maths, eight years. You spent eight years training. Naruto nodded. Okay then, Hiruzen said. Naruto cocked an eyebrow, you accepted that pretty quickly he pointed out. After everything you've told me, that was easy to digest. Naruto couldn't help but agree, now that he thought about it. Despite my progress he began, I've yet to unlock the full power all reapers are given, the reaper form. Reaper form? The Sandame asked, what is that? Naruto was silent for a moment, trying to find a way to explain it, it's like. A transformation jutsu that you can shift in and out of at will without hand signs, and it's a real transformation, not an illusion he explained, the user's body changes dramatically, increasing their powers immensely, while also granting them new ones. Every reaper has a different form, and we don't find out what it is until we unlock it. Have you ever seen someone use it before? Sande masked. A few times, it's both amazing and terrifying, Naruto told him. How close are you to unlocking yours? Naruto shrugged, no clue. I've been told that it happens when the person is ready or is under dire circumstances he said, honestly, before continuing could take years, maybe even decades to unlock. So it could happen at any time? Sande masked, worried that the villagers would use this to prove he was some sort of monster or demon. Pretty much. But, like I said, it usually happens when a reaper is in extreme danger. I see. The Sandame said pondering on this new development before speaking again, if you do unlock it, I suggest you show it only to those you trust or when the situation demands it. We don't need more flack for the villagers to use against you. Naruto nodded, agreed. Next question, Sandame continued, what is that tattoo on your wrist? Naruto looked at the mark under his left wrist, saw the did you? He asked before continuing, it's not really a tattoo, it's a summoning seal he explained. For what? The aged Hokage asked. Naruto grinned and held out his arm. Suddenly, the seal started to glow and something emerged from it. It was small, barely larger than a person's hand. It had only a handful of features, the most predominant of which was the large eye that took up most of its form. A long, spine-like tail protruded from its body with a few tendrils around it. A strange creature snaked around Naruto's arm and floated off of the ground, flying around the room before stopping next to its master's head, staring at the old cage through its eye. This is an oculus, Naruto explained, patting the creature on the head, think of it as a third eye, I can see everything it sees, and it can travel anywhere undetected. All reapers have one. We use them for reconnaissance and information gathering, mostly. Hiruzen stared at the oculus and it stared back. Cautiously, he reached out to touch it. The oculus floated away from his hand. Sorry, it generally doesn't like being touched, Naruto explained. The Sandame stared at it for a moment before speaking, you can see everything it does. He asked, still staring at the bizarre floating eye. Naruto nodded. The old man placed his hands under his desk and out of Naruto's sight. How many fingers am I holding up? He asked. Naruto raised an eyebrow, really? He asked. Thus do it, please. Naruto sighed. The oculus floated around the desk and looked underneath it. The blonde looked the cage right in the eyes and said, nine. How about now? Three. And now? Five, eight, six, two, four, one he said, saying each number as the old man changed the number of fingers he was holding up, all while looking directly into his eyes. Amazing, Sandame said as he watched the oculus float back to its master, you said it was used for reconnaissance. He asked. Naruto nodded. I know it's small, but how can a floating eye not gain people's attention? Naruto smirked, like this he said. Suddenly, the eye disappeared. What the how? The old cage asked. Invisibility Naruto explained, but that's just the fist ability it possesses. It can also move through walls and merge with another person, which allows me to see through that person's eyes, he then began to straighten his hair, damn, I really do look like my dad, don't I? He asked, looking at the Sandame like he was a mirror. The Sandame shut his eyes tightly, cutting off the Oculus's vision. Aw, oh, come on old man Naruto whined, take a joke for once. Little bastard Hiruzen grumbled to himself, mentally. I take exception to that, Naruto said, I'm not little. Sandame's eyes shot open, how did you? 
know what you were thinking. Naruto finished, smirking, when the oculus merges with another, not only can I see through their eyes, I can also hear and see into their mind, though only a small amount. It's not as powerful as, say, the Yamanaka clan techniques, but it's useful enough he explained, in addition, I can give the person the oculus is attached to a small push to make them remember something I need to know or to perform simple actions. Like what? Looking at certain objects, reading certain documents, that sort of thing. Nothing too complicated, though Naruto explained. Does it have any drawbacks? Sande masked. Well, it can only see into another's mind if that person is caught unaware Naruto explained, if the person knows it's there, like you do, they mentally brace themselves unconsciously, and I can't hear what they're thinking or influence their actions. Also, the stronger the person's will is, the more difficult it is to influence their actions and thoughts. Other than that, no. Even if the oculus is discovered and destroyed, it will reform after a few minutes back inside the seal he said before the floating eye flew back into the seal. Here is in contemplated this, before continuing. One last question he began, you said that the Reaper Corps keeps all of what you've told me hidden. Naruto nodded. Why all the secrecy? Surely people are intelligent enough to handle it. Naruto snorted, a person might be able to handle it he explained, people, as a whole, are dumb, paranoid, violent animals who are easily panicked. If humanity had even the slightest idea, any definitive proof that we aren't alone in creation, the panic would be catastrophic. Sandane was confused, I don't understand. Don't under Naruto quickly stopped himself from getting upset. He took a deep breath and continued. People are fragile he began, like glass, not physically, but mentally. Too much pressure and they shatter. We don't handle change well, we fear it. Things that are different terrify us. For so long, we thought we were alone in this world. When they first discovered the summons, our ancestors believed them to be monsters. It took centuries before we finally grew used to the idea of other intelligent creatures sharing our world with us. When the tailed beasts first appeared, humanity was terrified of them. We thought they were demons sent to destroy our world. We still fear them. We keep them locked away in human containers, not only to harness their strength, but to keep us safe as well. And yet, despite the fact that neither summons nor tailed beasts mean us harm, we still fear them. Now he continued, imagine what would happen if humanity, as a whole, discovered that there was a race of beings bred for the sole purpose of destroying everything around them, starting with us. Imagine what they would do if they knew that these creatures could walk among us, completely undetected, ready to strike when we least suspected. They would panic, Sande answered. Panic? Naruto asked, they would lose their collective shit. People would constantly be looking over their shoulders, constantly worried about being attacked by things out of their worst nightmares. To make things worse, since most humans have no way of detecting possession, people would view any odd behavior, even the slightest abnormality, as a symptom of possession. Manhunts, massacres, and executions all around. Countless centuries ago, people were burned as witches for odd appearances or behavior. Imagine that, times a thousand, then you have some general idea of what people would do if they knew about what we keep from them. Hiruzen thought about this and realized that the blonde was right, people would panic. Even Jinchuriki were treated as monsters, even though anyone with a brain stem could see that they were human. If the world found out about demons and monsters, the chaos that would be caused was unthinkable. It was just one thing he didn't understand. What about angels? Sande masked, they do not seek to destroy us, why keep them a secret? Naruto scoffed, you think that matters? Humanity sees things that are different and difficult to comprehend as monsters or threats. Angels are more powerful than we are. How long do you think it would take for the human race to decide they're a threat to us? Months. Years. It doesn't matter, conflict would be inevitable. Not to mention the religious panic that would follow should the angels and demons reveal themselves. Religious panic? The old Hokage asked. Naruto nodded, there are countless faiths and beliefs in the world. They are all different and unique, but they each have one thing in common. There is no definitive proof of who is right and who is wrong. But all of the followers of those beliefs follow them and believe in them without question the Sandame interjected. Naruto shook his head I said there was no definitive proof he corrected, people can look at relics and texts that have no purpose and see them as proof, but none of them can be proven or disproven. What do angels and demons have to do with this? The old man asked. Think about it, if the beings we knew from legends and myths turned out to be real, people would believe their faith to be the right one. Humans hate when others do not follow their customs and beliefs. This would be all they needed to conduct a crusade against non-believers. Oh, it would start out simple at first, a few attempts at conversion here or there, but as time goes on, the fanatical believers would lose their patience and let attacks against heretics. Do you see where I'm going with this? Or do I have to elaborate further? No, no, that's quite alright. I see your point, Sande answered, holding up his hands in a placating gesture. Naruto nodded, good. Now you see why everything we know is kept a secret from the rest of humanity. It's for their own good. We keep them safe without their knowledge. 
Ignorance may not be bliss, but it's better than the alternative. Everything was silent after that, Naruto giving the old man time to think on all of this. After a while, the Sandane finally spoke. Well he said, that was. Overwhelming. Naruto laughed, imagine having to see all of it. I'm trying not to, Hiruzen said, smiling, now I do believe it's time to ruin a certain prisoner's day. Naruto smirked wickedly, indeed, I've waited a long time for this. As the two prepared to set out, Naruto remembered something. Oh, one last thing he said, my job as a reaper will require me to leave the village to complete different missions. Assuming I become a shinobi, I'll need your approval to leave the village in order to fulfill my commitment to the core he explained. Sandane thought for a moment before nodding, very well, though I dislike the thought of you fighting monsters, and God knows what else, I will grant you leave from the village as you need it. Naruto smiled, thanks old man. But the Kaiubi Jinchuriki leaving the village under mysterious circumstances will raise many questions among the council. What should I tell them? He asked. Naruto shrugged after he pulled his hood up again, you're the professor, I'm sure you'll think of something. Oh, thanks the old man said sarcastically as they departed. On Hagakur Maximum Security Prison, Isolation Wing, the prison in Kanoha was reserved for the most dangerous criminals in fire country that could be kept alive. People who had committed heinous enough crimes to need a more secure prison to place them, but not enough to warrant immediate execution. The prisoners in the isolation wing were the worst of the lot, those who were dangerous enough to need to be isolated from the other prisoners. Or simply to be punished for whatever reason. In one of these cells was one Tomatsu Higurashi, and he was one of these few, chained to the wall in his cell. The years had not been kind to the former Anbu captain. He was covered in scars, burn marks, etc. Still, he couldn't be happier, Kaiubi was dead and his wife's soul was finally at rest. I mean, sure, freedom would have been nice considering he hadn't seen the sun in over four years, but, all things considered, things weren't too bad. A senile idiot that was the Hokage had tried to break him, but he failed. He had survived the war, the Kaiubi attack, and his wife's death, a bit of torture wouldn't change that. Little did he realize that his incarceration was about to finally become intolerable. Normally things were quiet, so he jumped slightly when a boy spoke up. Tamatsu Higurashi. He looked up and saw a hooded figure standing just outside his cell. His unexpected visitor continued to speak. What a sad hand life has dealt you. You survived the Third Shinobi World War and the Kaiubi's attack, yet wind up here, doomed to spend the rest of your life rotting in the cell. Assuming the Hokage doesn't decide to up and have you executed the visitor said, walking closer to his cell. Tamatsu looked at the hooded stranger. And scoffed. And who are you supposed to be? Another expert the old fool sent to break me? He asked mockingly. I'm here of my own volition, I was not sent by anyone the stranger answered before continuing, but I'm not here to talk about me. No, I'm here to talk about you and what you've done. Hamatsu scoffed again, what's there to talk about? I killed Kaiubi. That's it. End of story. Oh, but there is so much more to the story than that the hooded man said as he began to pace back and forth in front of the prisoner, hands behind his back, such a tale of heartbreak yours is. A man who meets the love of his life, marries her, and has a child with her. It seemed that you would live happily ever after together. But then, tragedy struck when the Kaiubi, the great nine-tailed fox, appeared in the village and started to tear everything apart. Of course, as a shinobi of Kanahagakur, you were summoned to fight. But you were defeated. And discovered that your beloved was dead, killed in action against the fox. With your greatest reason for living gone, you wasted away in bars, attempting to drink away your pain he then stopped and looked at the former Anbu captain, but that didn't work, did it? No amount of alcohol could drown your sorrow. Tamatsu glared at the hooded man, is there a point to this? He asked, beginning to become angry at his visitor reciting his life story. We'll get to that. Now, where was I? He asked, rhetorically, before continuing oh yes. So, eleven years have passed. Eleven years of drinking, moping, and abusing your daughter, your anger boiling up inside you over being unable to avenge your late wife. So, one day, you decide to take action. You drug your fellow Anbu and, with the Anbu who supported you and a mob of simple-minded villagers, you go after Naruto Uzumaki, the boy who held the Kaiubi within him. He didn't hold the Kaiubi, he was the Kaiubi. Tometsu snarled. The hooded man chuckled, of course, of course, whatever it takes to rationalize your actions. Anyway, you catch the boy and, after a moment of gloating, slit his throat. As he lays dying, another Anbu shows up and renders you unconscious. Then the Hokage shows up and slaughters the entire mob. Except for you. He decides to lock you away, and now, four years later, here we are the hooded man said as he stopped pacing. What's your point? Tometsu asked. I'm wondering why a man who will be spending the rest of his life alone in this dark and dreary place is so chipper. The former Anbu captain grinned, because I won he explained, I avenged my wife, and nothing that senile fool who calls himself Hokage does will change that. What of your daughter? 
the hooded stranger asked, would you condemn her to live a life without both of her parents? I never wanted a kid, my wife did, he explained, I could care less about her or what she thinks about me. Interesting. The stranger said as he thought for a moment. He then looked at the prisoner again and your wife. He asked. What about her? Do you think she would condone your actions? Would she have wanted you to kill an innocent child in her name? He was a demon, not a child Tamatsu corrected angrily, and yes, I think she would have. She would be proud that I killed the monster that nearly destroyed the village. He proclaimed. Are you so certain? The man asked. Absolutely Tamatsu answered, but I don't see how any of this matters. My wife is dead, it's not like I can ask her. I wouldn't be so sure of that. The hooded man had spoken again, but instead of coming from directly in front of him, outside of his cell, it came from right next to him, inside the cell. He turned to his left and saw the hooded man sitting right next to him. He looked back at where the man was standing before and then back at where he was now. What? How the hell did he? Let's hear her opinion on the matter, shall we? The hooded man continued. He then raised one of his hands and snapped his fingers. Suddenly a swirl of energy appeared outside of the cell and began to take shape. It took the form of a beautiful young woman with long brown hair and eyes. The woman Tamatsu knew all too well, seeing as it had haunted his dreams and nightmares for the past 15 years. The woman he never thought he would see alive again. It. It can't be. For a few moments all he could do was stare. Wasami Haim? He finally asked, weakly. Tamatsu Kun the woman answered, her voice having an echo to it. She seemed happy to see him. At first. She then became saddened, why? She asked, why did you have to do it? Why did you have to murder that poor boy? I don't. But I thought. The prisoner tried to answer the apparition of his deceased wife. I never wanted revenge she told him, all I ever wanted was to have a nice quiet life with you and our daughter. When I couldn't have that, I wanted you and our little girl to live a happy and full life, she then looked to be on the verge of tears, but I watched as you drank yourself to sleep every night and as you. You hit our child. Indeed the hooded man spoke again, who was, somehow, now outside of the cell again, standing next to Masami's ghost, tell her why you did it to Matsu. Tell her how you abused your own flesh and blood because. What was it you said? Oh yes, she had no right to look like her mother the hooded man said, with the prisoner trying to kill him with his glare alone. Wasami looked heartbroken, please tell me that isn't true. She pleaded. You don't understand, Tamatsu said, his voice breaking, you were my whole world, Masami. You were my life he explained, when you. Died, I didn't know what to do, my reason for living was gone. Every time I looked at our child. It was like the universe was mocking me. I I couldn't, and that justifies beating your daughter? The hooded man asked, interrupting the former Anbu captain, before scoffing, a weak excuse from a weak man. She is the offspring of you and your wife, of course she looks like her mother. Shut up. Tamatsu growled. The hooded stranger ignored him, also, correct me if I'm wrong, but didn't you say, not even five minutes ago, that you never wanted a child? That you only impregnated your poor wife because she wanted to have a family? I said shut up. Tamatsu ordered. Any further conversation was stopped by the sound of sobbing. Both looked to see Masami weeping into her hands. Masami. Tamatsu said, trying to console his deceased wife, I I didn't. Mean it. The hooded stranger asked finished, before continuing, but you did. You meant every word. Clearly, it was you who should have died that day. This poor woman deserved life far more than you do. Masami then spoke up, looking up at the hooded man, eyes red and puffy, tears staining her cheeks. I I don't want to be here anymore she said, her voice broken. The hooded man looked at her and nodded, very well then, returned to rest Masami Higurashi. And, with a wave of his hand, the woman vanished. No. Tamatsu shouted, come back. Please. I'm sorry. He pleaded. It's too late, the hooded man said, her spirit has returned to paradise. And, unless I summon her again, which I want, you are unlikely to ever see her again. What? You murdered an innocent boy in cold blood and regularly abused your own daughter he reminded the imprisoned man, people like you never see heaven. Tamatsu looked down, tears running down his face. After several moments of silence, Tamatsu looked up at his tormentor. Who are you? He asked, why are you torturing me with this? Wasn't her death enough? Why are you doing this to me? I am simply showing you the consequences of your actions the hooded man said, you brought this upon yourself he told the tortured man, as for who I am. The man raised his hands up to his hood and pulled it back, revealing his face at last. A face that shocked Tamatsu greatly. A yandame? He asked. Oh, so close, the man said, before grinning, I'm his son. His son? Tamatsu thought. He knew the Sandame had said that the Kaiubi brat was the fourth son, but he was dead. Still don't recognize me? The man asked, look at my face. Look at the marks there. You know me. The last time we met, you had a knife at my throat and your sword through my torso. Tamatsu looked at the man's face. And saw the three whisker marks on either side of his face. 
adding to what he had said. No, he whispered, unbelieving, that's not possible. You're dead, I slit your throat myself, he said, his voice growing louder, the old fool said you were dead. The man grinned, I was. But no longer. Yes, Tamatsu, I am the boy you murdered four years ago, I am Naruto Uzumaki. The now revealed Naruto declared. The Matsu simply stared in bewilderment, no. No. You. You can't be. Naruto smirked and lifted up his head, showing his neck. On his neck was a large and ugly scar. A scar from Tamatsu's kunai. Remember this? He asked, remember when you pinned me to the ground with your katana and droned on and on about your darling wife? Do you remember what you said right before you killed me? This is for my wife, may she finally rest in peace he said, parroting his words from that night so many years ago. Several moments of pure silence passed as the imprisoned man stared blankly at the blonde Jinchuriki. Suddenly, his blank face became a snarl. He growled and lunged at the blonde, only to be stopped by the shackles that were chaining him to the wall. You. He shouted, how dare you show your face here. You murdered my wife and then used it to further torment me. Naruto smirked, it was no and, judging from the way you reacted, you know that. Liar. Really? Naruto asked, consider this, I was in your cell with you when I conjured what you dismiss as a mirror. Your cell is covered in chakra suppression seals. How could I have used all those seals in there? Himatsu continued to glare as Naruto took apart his argument. I don't know how you did it, but I know it was a trick. And as I told you before, your reaction proves you know otherwise Naruto said, I thought bringing your wife back to talk to you had a chance of changing your mind. Clearly I was mistaken. How the fuck are you still alive? How did you survive? Tamatsu demanded. I didn't Naruto answered, simply, you succeeded in your goal, you killed me. Then how? Naruto interrupted him, you killed me before my time. I wasn't supposed to die that day he explained, so I was given a second chance. After another moment of silence, Naruto spoke again, you know. I really should thank you he said, confusing the hell out of Tamatsu, my death opened up new possibilities. I was angry at you, but if it weren't for you, I wouldn't be as strong as I am now. So. Yeah, thanks for that. Naruto said, happily. Tamatsu could only yell out in rage while struggling against his bindings. Naruto ignored him, I still have it, you know. Tamatsu stopped struggling, what? He asked. The katana you stabbed me with, I still have it Naruto elaborated, it came with me when I died, and I used it to fight off someone who was eager to see me damned he then laughed, ironic, isn't it? You, the man who sought my death more than anyone, gave me the weapon that saved me. Isn't that funny? He asked. Himatsu struggled even more. Naruto chuckled, well, it's been fun, but I really do have better things to do today, he said as he turned to leave, before stopping, oh, one last thing he said, there is still a chance to see your wife again, a way to be with her when you die. All you have to do is repent. Ask forgiveness for all you've done, to your daughter. And to me. Tamatsu snarled, you dare. You want me to forgive you for taking away my reason for living never. He shouted. Naruto shrugged, it's your choice. But I would, at least, consider it if I were you. It will mean the difference between eternal peace and eternal damnation, he told the man before crouching down to his level. You see yourself as an avenger. A righteous man who went beyond his duty to do what was right no matter the consequences. But the fact is, you're just a sad, pathetic little man who is going to die in jail, Naruto told him before standing up and walking away. Tamatsu began to shout, this isn't over. When I get out of here, you're dead. You hear me? Dead. I'll slaughter you like a veal. I'll rip your heart and spine out. I'll wear your eyes and balls around my neck. Somehow, I doubt that, Naruto said without even turning to look at the enraged prisoner. As Tamatsu continued to shout death threats, Naruto left the isolation wing and found Sandane waiting for him. I think you'll find him much more. Disagreeable with being locked away he said while smirking. Sandame smiled back, so it would seem. Now, shall we head over to your new home? Naruto nodded while pulling up his hood. Lead the way. A few minutes later, the former home of Minato Namikas and Kashina Yuzumaki Namikas, Naruto gaped behind his hood at the side of his new home. It was huge. Filled with enough rooms to house a hundred people, a fully stocked library and armory, several training grounds, a pool, and its very own hot springs. This is where my parents lived. He asked, astonished. The Sandane chuckled at the voice of wonderment from Naruto, yes. It used to be the Yuzumaki clan home, but after they died out, your mother was the only one who lived there. After she and your father got together, he moved in as well he explained. And all of this is mine. He asked, sincerely hoping this wasn't some kind of joke. It is, the old cage assured him, it needs a bit of dusting, and the fridge needs to be restocked, but it is your home now. Thanks old man. Naruto said, forcing down the urge to jump up and down while cheering and doing a victory dance. F taught him better than that, damn it. Naruto approached the front gate and saw an old lock on it, yet it was clearly sealed off. Um. How do I get in? He asked. 
Garazin chuckled, it's a blood seal, Naruto he explained, only someone of Uzumaki blood or the people they allow can open the gate. Nodding, Naruto bit his thumb and pressed it against the gate. With a quiet hum, the gate opened. Naruto walked inside and noticed the Hokage wasn't following him. Aren't you coming? He asked. Sandame shook his head, no, I've put off working long enough, I need to get back to the tower, sadly. But you go on ahead, enjoy the accommodations he said as he started to leave, before stopping, oh, I almost forgot, I sent messages to all of your friends, telling them to meet up at Ichiraku's in a couple of hours. Naruto was confused, why? So you can reveal yourself to them, of course. Naruto was worried now, he was hoping for a bit more time. What the hell old man? Why did you do that? I'm not ready yet. Naruto shouted. Garazin grinned, stop whining, you'll be fine. Consider it payback for everything you dumped on me today, he said as he left. Naruto watched him leave, grumbling under his breath about the old bastard. The blonde reaper opened the door to the manor, walked inside, and began to look around. As he looked through each room, he discovered what appeared to be a living room, considering all the chairs, the large couch, and the fireplace. As he walked in, he noticed a framed photograph on the coffee table. He picked it up and smiled. It was a picture of his parents, his mother still pregnant with him. Both were smiling at the camera. He sadly realized that this was probably the only picture of the three of them together. They loved you, Kurama said to him more than anything. You know that right. Naruto nodded, I know he thought to the fox, I just hope I can make them proud one day. You already have. I know you have because, well, I'm proud of you Kurama told him while secretly blushing. Naruto's smile grew, thank you. After gazing at the photo for a few more moments, he gently set it down. Sighing, Naruto spoke, well, let's get this place cleaned up. Naruto formed a familiar cross-shaped hand sign and summoned a few dozen shadow clones. Alright you guys he said, addressing his clones, get this place cleaned up he ordered as he walked off. Where are you going? One clone asked, wondering why he wasn't helping. To psych myself up for meeting my friends. Ichiraku's Raymond Bar, two hours later, Naruto was standing outside the entrance to his favorite hangout as a child. His hood was up and he was nervous. He could hear them inside, chatting with one another. Creator damn it Uzumaki, pull yourself together. He mentally ordered himself, come on. You can stand up to hell's most depraved and monstrous, fight a pack of werewolves, stop a zombie horde, and handle reaper training. Why is this so damn difficult? It was then that Kurama spoke up, well, you've been dead for four years, and you've grown up quite a lot. You're practically a whole different person now, you really hurt them when you died, and you, you're not helping. Naruto mentally yelled at his partner, earning a laugh from said partner. I'm kidding. You don't have to be so nervous the fox told him, these people have stuck with you for your entire life. They aren't going to abandon you now because you're different. So relax, take a deep breath, and get your ass in there. Thanks mom Naruto thought, sarcastically, before taking a deep breath, fuck it. Roll the dice. He said as he walked in. Inside the bar itself, A.M., Tucci, and Aruka were talking amongst themselves. You got the message too? A.M. asked, seeing as how they were supposed to be closed today. Aruka nodded, yeah. Hokage-sama said for me to meet him here that he had something important to tell us. I'm willing to bet Hinata's been invited too, Tucci said, I wonder where she is. She'll be here A.M. told her father, she always shows up when the Hokage asks her to. Probably hoping it's about Naruto Aruka said, getting sad looks from the father-daughter pair, you believe him, right? He asked, you believe what Hokage-sama said about Naruto coming back? Don't you? I, I don't know Tucci said honestly, don't get me wrong, the Hokage is a good and honest man, but. It sounds too good to be true. A.M. nodded in agreement. Aruka sighed, I know what you mean. He said, trailing off. After a few moments of silence, A.M. spoke. It's. It's just not the same without him, is it? She asked. No, no, it isn't sweetheart, Tucci said. I'd give anything for him to be here right now. A.M. said, with the others nodding in agreement. I had no idea. A new voice said. The three looked up and saw a hooded trench coat wearing stranger walk in. I'm sorry sir, we're closed Tucci said to the newcomer. The stranger seemed to ignore him. He just stared at them for a moment before continuing. I had no idea I was so important to you all. He said as he pulled his hood back. The trio gasped when they saw his face. At first, they like many others thought it was the Yandame Hokage, back from the dead. Until they saw the whisker marks. But. It couldn't be. And then Naruto? Iruka asked. The blonde smiled, yeah, it's really me, he told them. The three of them were stunned. They knew it was impossible and, yet, here he was. Suddenly, A.M. leapt over the counter and wrapped her arms around him tightly, crying tears of joy. Naruto she said, I I can't believe it. You're alive. Naruto returned her embrace, it's alright Mi-chan. I'm here and I'm not going anywhere he told her in a comforting voice. After a few long moments, A.M. pulled away and smiled at the blonde reaper. Wow. You've gotten taller. 
she said, and more handsome too she thought to herself, having felt his muscles beneath his shirt. She blushed at this thought and attempted to empty her mind of such thoughts. Naruto rubbed the back of his head sheepishly, yeah, I've hit a bit of a growth spurt. More than a bit, you look almost nothing like the little shrimp that used to come in here almost every day and eat all of our raiment. Tucci said as he approached Naruto and gave him another hug. After a few seconds, they separated. Am, it's good to see you, kid. Tucci said. Naruto grinned, you as well, old man. Naruka approached Naruto next and gave him a brotherly hug. I, I don't even know what to say he said, honestly, after they separated. Naruto nodded, yes, I've always wondered what would happen when we met again. It seems words aren't enough. Naruka nodded in agreement. You gave us all a heart attack when we thought you were dead. Aim said, don't ever do that again. Naruto grinned, cross my heart he vowed. So, where were you all this time? Naruka asked. Naruto's grin became even wider, oh, it's quite the tale, sensei. He said before looking around, where's Hinata-chan? He asked, eager to see his closest friend again. She'll be here soon Aruka told him, I'm sure the Hokage sent a message to her as well so, a scared Chunin was interrupted by a light gasp. They all turned and saw Hinata Hayuga staring at Naruto with widened eyes. A few minutes earlier, Hinata had been training when a message from the Hokage was delivered to her, telling her to head to Ichiraku's Raymond bar in a couple of hours. She was unsure as to why, but she would be there regardless. She liked going to the Raymond bar. It reminded her of all the good times she and Naruto shared together. Hinata felt a twinge of pain in her heart when remembering Naruto. She was stronger and more confident now, but she never really got over her crush's death. Naruto had been her light, her guide that had saved her from the darkness of loneliness. She was certain that, if it weren't for him, she would have broken up a long time ago. His death had nearly broken her completely. Her light had been snuffed out. The past few years had been the most difficult of her life. Her family, as usual, were unsupportive. Luckily, she had her older sister figure and mentor, Kurana Yuhi, and her closest friend, Kiba Inuzuka. The friendship between the Hayuga heiress and Inuzuka heir was an odd one, to be sure. He is the obnoxious, hot-headed dog lover and she the shy, soft-spoken, cinnamon roll aficionado. But, somehow, it worked. As it turned out, Kiba had had a crush on Hinata and, when he saw how depressed she was after Naruto's death, decided to try and cheer her up. It took a while, but he finally got through to her, and the two were as thick as thieves ever since. Kiba admitted his feelings to Hinata several months after that, but, sadly, she did not return them. He had been upset after that but, after a short time, he got over it and focused on being her friend more than a potential boyfriend. And blame me for trying, he had said. Since then, Kiba had not only been her friend, but also her protector from the various unwanted advances from much of the village's male population. Oh yes, she had acquired many admirers ever since she became the stunning young woman she was now. Sakura and Ino also had admirers, but they were frightened when they were angry, and most men gave them a wide berth after they said no Hinata, on the other hand, was far too polite to yell at, much less attack anyone, and less forced, and so her admirers had an easier time with her. Although more than capable of defending herself, it was still nice to have someone she could rely on at her side. Back to the topic at hand, Hinata had vowed to become stronger and become the Hayuga clan head in order to reform and change it from within, starting with the removal and ban of the cage bird seal that had divided her clan. She was well on her way, already being far stronger than her younger sister Hanabi, but she still had a ways to go. Naturally, the Hayuga clan elders were opposed to her being clan head, but she could care less about what they think. She would succeed for Naruto. It was at this time that she had arrived at Ichiraku's and heard talking inside. I hope I'm not late she thought to herself before stepping inside. Odd and receiving the shock of her life. She saw everyone else was there already. Along with someone with familiar spiky blonde hair. She gasped, gaining the attention of everyone. The two teens just stared at each other for several moments, with the others watching quietly, waiting to see how this would turn out. Naruto couldn't help but stare at his longtime friend. Anada's wardrobe had changed in the last four years. Though she still wore a jacket like she used to, this one was a lavender and cream zip-up jacket with lavender cuffs. Underneath that she wore mesh armor. She also wore navy blue pants and black low-heeled sandals. Her outfit barely registered in his mind. It was everything else that held his attention. Her dark blue hair had grown a great deal since he last saw her, it now flowed down to her waist like a silky waterfall. Her beautiful face with pale eyes that seemed to draw him in, that made him never want to look away. The small amount of her skin that was exposed was flawless and smooth. Her jacket hid much of her figure, but Naruto could tell that it was to die for. Naruto's next thought summarized her completely. The old man was right. She's gorgeous. Was this goddess really his oldest friend? It took all of his willpower not to ask the others if he had died again because of the angel before him. Hinata was too shocked to take in Naruto's appearance. 
After another few moments, which seemed like an eternity to the two teens, Hinata took a few hesitant steps forward until she was standing right in front of him. And Naruto-kun? She asked in a quiet voice, but one that sounded like an angel to Naruto, unable to believe what she was seeing. Naruto smiled nervously, uh, hi Hinata-chan. It's, uh, it's been a while, huh? Hinata continued to stare, wanting to believe that the love of her life was standing right in front of her, but not wanting to get her hopes up. Naruto saw the hesitation in her eyes and knew she wasn't quite believing what she saw. I know you don't want to get your hopes up he told her softly, but I can prove it's me. He took a deep breath and spoke again, we first met when we were five years old. We were both at the playground at the park. I was sitting on the swing set alone and watching the other kids because they wouldn't let me play with them. I was just about to get up and leave when I heard someone cry out. I looked up and saw a bunch of kids standing around you. They were taunting and laughing at you and called you a freak, and I saw you struggling not to cry. I was angry, angrier than I had ever been at the villagers who tormented me. When their leader shoved you and knocked you over, something in me snapped and, next thing I know, I'm on top of the kid, beating his face in with my bare fists. Suddenly, a group of Anbu are pulling me off of him. I couldn't believe what I had just done, so I ran. I ran until I tripped and landed on my face. I didn't get up, I just laid there, crying. Then, I hear a soft voice asking me if I'm alright. I looked up and saw you, kneeling next to me, with concern in your eyes. You were worried about me, after I had nearly killed someone. I thought I was a monster, but you were worried about me he smiled and then continued, without thinking I got up and hugged you as tightly as I could while crying into your shoulder. I thought you were going to push me away. But you didn't. You hugged me back. After a while, I stopped crying and thanked you. I told you my name and you told me yours. You thanked me for helping you. We talked until it was dark and you had to leave, but you promised that we would meet again the next day, and we did, as well as every day after. Anada's eyes widened even more. She had never told anyone that story before. Naruto then placed one of his hands on her shoulder. Three days after we first met we made a promise he told her, we promised we would always be there for each and that we would always be friends so that neither of us would ever be alone again, Hinata finished. It wasn't a trick. Naruto was alive. Her love had returned. Naruto come. She whispered, her eyes staring to water. Naruto smiled and nodded, yes, Hinata-chan, it's really me. She continued to stare until. Smack. Naruto recoiled as Hinata slapped him hard across the face, leaving a red mark. Before he could respond, Hinata threw herself at him and hugged him as tightly as she could. And Naruto-kun. She said, now crying, why you're alive. It's our really why you. She said as she wept into his chest. Naruto wrapped his arms around her and returned her embrace. It's okay Hinata-chan, I'm here. I'm here and I'll never leave you again he bowed. The two continued to embrace as the others looked on, smiling, while Leim had happy tears rolling down her cheeks at the reunion. After several minutes, Hinata finally stopped crying and looked up at the boy, no, man she had missed and loved so deeply. Don't ever scare me like that again. She whispered in an angry tone. Naruto smiled, never he promised as the two parted. Hinata finally registered his new appearance and blushed brightly at how even more handsome he had become. He. He looked so grown up. She thought in surprise. She's so beautiful he thought, while also blushing. The two continued to stare for a few minutes until they heard someone's throat clear. They turned and saw the others smiling at them, with Aim being the one who interrupted them. Do you two need a room somewhere? Or can we ask where you've been Naruto? She quipped with a mischievous smirk on her face. The two teens blushed brightly before sitting down at the bar. Well, it's quite the tale. Naruto said, best told over a good meal. Humming right up. Tuchi said, knowing what Naruto wanted, with Aim following his lead. When the first bowl of Raymond arrived, Naruto began his story. A few hours later, needless to say Naruto's friends had been quite shocked at what he had told them. They were skeptical to say the least, but, nonetheless, they came to believe him and accept him despite what he had done. They also knew that he held Karama and didn't care in the slightest. After a few hours talking, it was getting close to midnight and they were getting tired. They each bid Naruto goodnight with Aruka, saying he'll be expecting both he and Hinata in his classroom tomorrow for the graduation exam, and went their separate ways. Well, except for one. Hinata was all alone with Naruto now, trying to work up the courage to ask him something. I want to spend more time with him, but what if he says no? Or what if he says yes? Oh, I don't know what to do. She fretted in her mind. Naruto noticed that Hinata looked like she wanted to say something to him. Are you okay? He asked her. Hinata nodded, took a deep breath, and spoke. Then Naruto-kun, would why you like to take a walk with Emmy? She asked in her trademark stutter. Naruto had never realized how adorable that stutter was until now. Wait he thought, is she? For a moment he thought that she was asking him out. Unlikely, she only saw him as a friend, he was certain of that. She probably wants to spend more time with him, making up for the four years they lost. 
He smiled and nodded, sure Hinata-chan, I would love to go for a walk with you. Hinata blushed at his dazzling smile and smiled back as the two began to walk down the street while talking about what had happened in the village since he left. As they spoke, they couldn't help but glance at each other when one wasn't looking. He's so handsome. Hinata thought. She had dreamed of him returning several times since he died, and, when she woke up, she cried, wanting the dreams to be real so badly. But this wasn't a dream she had covertly pinched herself a couple of times to make sure this was real. She had missed her chance to be with him before, but she wouldn't miss that chance again. Someday soon, she would tell him how she felt, consequences be damned. Naruto, meanwhile, was eyeing her just as much as she was eyeing him. I can't believe that this is Hinata. He thought. She was an absolute goddess, and that was with her heavy jacket on. He was willing to bet she was even more stunning without a jacket. And shirt. And pants. And, whoa, where the hell did that come from? He thought, wondering on what station he boarded this train of thought while ignoring Kurama's laughter in his mind. I mean, sure she's beautiful. The most beautiful woman I've ever. No. Stop. Get these ideas out of your head Yuzumaki. It's never going to happen. Why was he even thinking this? The two of them had been friends for years and now he suddenly wanted to ask her out only a few hours after having been reunited. Why would he want to risk her friendship like that? He knew it wasn't going to happen. Why would an angel like her ever want to be with a guy like him? She wants to be with you too, he heard Karama say in his mind. What? Bullshit he told the fox. But she does, she's felt this way about you for a long time, I can tell he told his vessel. Right Naruto said, unbelieving. Don't believe me? I'll bet you all nine of my tales that if you were to ask her out right here and right now, she would practically scream yes. And then faint the fox challenged, knowing the girl well enough from Naruto's memories. We're not talking about this, Naruto growled. He didn't want to risk losing Hinata's friendship by asking her out on the highly unlikely chance she would say yes. Hein, Kurama told him, but if you don't ask her out someday soon, you might lose her. If that happens, you'll regret it for the rest of your life, the fox said before being silent. As long as he's happy, I'm happy the fox mentally told herself, trying not to feel heartbroken. Naruto-kun. Are you alright? Said blonde was brought out of his mental argument by Hinata's voice. She had noticed that he was staring ahead, not really focusing on what was in front of him. Nor was he wandering blindly. It was like he was in a trance. Naruto looked at her and smiled. I'm fine Hinata-chan, just. Thinking about tomorrow he lied. Truthfully, he hadn't thought about the exam since arriving at his parents' estate. Hinata smiled, don't worry Naruto-kun, I'm sure we'll both pass she assured him. I don't doubt it, he told her, still it never hurts to be cautious. Hinata said nothing for a moment and then began to giggle. Naruto stared at her, what? He asked. Nothing she answered, it's just. Funny how different you are. Different? Hinata nodded, you're so serious now, so different from the boy you met so long ago. Hey I'm not serious all the time. He argued, I can still be funny. A woman and a duck walk into a bar, the bartender says hey where'd you get that pig? The woman says it's not a pig it's a duck the bartender says I was talking to the duck. Hinata started laughing despite the joke being bad, oh, that's horrible she says. Naruto grinned, hey it made you laugh didn't it? The two friends start laughing again when Naruto notices something. You have a beautiful laugh he complimented her before realizing what he just said and froze. Hinata stops laughing and stares at her friend and crush with wide eyes. Did he just say? Hinata wondered. Shit. Why did I say that? Naruto thought, panicking. After a few moments of awkward silence, Hinata finally spoke. Do you? D do you are really mean that? She asked. Naruto nodded nervously, deciding to be honest, why yeah, yeah I do. Hinata blushed and smiled t thank you Naruto-kun she told him while doing a victory dance in her mind. He thought her laugh was beautiful. It was a victory. A small victory, but a victory nonetheless. Naruto smiled back, noticing how her blush somehow enhanced her already considerable beauty. You're welcome, Hinata-chan. The two kept walking and talking until Hinata noticed the time. It's getting late, she told him, my father will start to worry. She didn't want to leave his side, but knew her father would be upset if she didn't come home. Naruto scoffed when she mentioned her father, worry? Since when has he ever worried about you? He asked bitterly. Hinata shook her head Naruto-kun, please don't she tried to say before he interrupted her. Why not? Since when does he have a right to care? Why should he? Naruto, please. Hinata begged him. This used to happen a lot between the two of them. Naruto grew up without the love of a parent or parents and hated and couldn't comprehend the fact that his best friend had not only lost her mother but had an uncaring father as well. He found it intolerable that Hiashi spoke of his eldest daughter like she was a burden and not a blessing. He hated the man, but Hinata didn't like it when he spoke badly of him. Despite all he had done, Hinata still loved her father. Naruto found that commendable but still hated the way Hiashi treated his friend. Okay Hinata-chan. 
I'm sorry for upsetting you here he relented, not wanting to hurt her. It's okay, she told him. The two of them stood there for a moment before Hinata once again broke to silence. I should get home, the Hayuga era said. Naruto nodded I understand I. Before he could finish, Hinata threw her arms around him. Surprised but joyful, Naruto returned her embrace. Promise you won't leave again? She asked him. Naruto smirked, promise. The two continued to embrace for several moments before they reluctantly parted. Suo. Naruto began, see you tomorrow? He asked. Hinata smiled, of course she replied. Hinata then turned and began to walk home, a large smile covering her face. Naruto watched her leave. Once she rounded a corner and left his sight, he turned and began to walk home, also smiling. He couldn't wait until tomorrow. Suddenly, he felt something lightly hit him in the head before falling to the ground. It was a paper aeroplane. He unfolded it and saw the seal of the Reaper Corps and a message in the form of five words. That. Her. Out. Of. Here. Naruto laughed when he realized what was happening. Beatrice he said to himself, such a troublemaker he said, as if referring to a child. He then used a low-level fire technique to incinerate the message as was required after reading and memorizing the contents of all Reaper core messages, no matter how unimportant and began walking home. Good thing the backyard is so big he said to himself as he walked, creator knows what kind of panic she would cause if people saw her. And so, he headed home, ready to summon his pet and welcome her to her new home. Chapter 3. Tests and a poorly thought out plan. On the Hagakur Ninja Academy, the day was an important day. The day of the Academy graduation exam. The day that would decide the future of the teenagers eagerly awaiting their sensei's arrival. Among the classroom of students, eight stood out in particular. Hinata Hayuga, heiress of the Hayuga clan, Kiba Inuzuka, heir to the Inuzuka clan, along with his large canine companion Akamaru, Shino Aburam, heir to the Aburam clan, Shikamaru Nara, the lazy heir to the Nara clan, Choji Akamichi, heir to the Akamichi clan, Ino Yamanaka, heiress to the Yamanaka clan, Sakura Haruno, the only student not from a clan who was worth noting, and Sasuke Chiha, the last loyal member of the Achiha clan in Kanoha. Seeing as how it would take too long to explain their appearances, I'll just make this brief, they are all wearing their Shippuden outfits, except for Sakura and Sasuke, who have their Part 1 outfits, and Sakura's hair is as long as it was in Part 1. Each of the students were passing the time in the ways they usually did, Hinata and Kiba were talking to each other with Akamaru chiming in every once in a while with Kiba translating, Shikamaru was asleep at his desk, Choji was eating a bag of chips, Sakura and Ino, along with all the other female class members excluding Hinata, were staring dreamily at a certain Achiha, said Achiha was, as ever, brooding, and Shino was. Well, who can tell with him? Almost everyone was anxious for the exam, but Hinata was unusually giddy today. What's got you in such a good mood? Kiba asked his closest friend. Oh, nothing Hinata told him, just eager for the exam. I don't think so. Something else is going on Kiba said, knowing his friend well enough to know something else was affecting the mood of the Hayuga heiress. Hinata's smile grew wider, she should have known Kiba would see through her excuse. You'll see she told him cryptically. After a few more minutes the students became silent when both of their senseis walked into the room, Haruki Yamino and Mizuki, the former of which was in a visibly good mood, and the latter was wondering why the former was in such a good mood. Good morning class Aruka greeted his students. Good morning Aruka sensei the class greeted. Some of them didn't quite put their hearts into it, but no matter. Before we get started, I'd like to make a special announcement, the scared began, despite it being the day of the final exam and graduation, we have a new student joining us today. The whole class aside from Hinata was shocked at this news, even Mizuki looked surprised by this. What the hell is he talking about? The silver-haired wondered. The rest of the class were thinking along the same lines. It was Sakura that decided to voice their collective concerns. But sensei, it's the final exam. Why does this guy get to join the class on the last day while we had to study for years? She demanded. Iruka smiled, well, Sakura, this particular person was granted special permission by the Hokage to take part in the graduation exam today. The class was stunned by this. If the Hokage gave this guy permission to take part in the exam without attending the academy for the same amount of time as we did, this guy must be strong. Or, at least, well-connected. Troublesome Shikamaru thought to himself with Shino thinking along the same lines as this, except without the whole troublesome bit. Sasuke, meanwhile, was irritated, what? Some loser is being given special treatment, well I had to study with this stupid class and all of these annoying fangirls for years, why wasn't I given this option? I'm in a chair. He thought angrily to himself. Meanwhile Aruka continued speaking, so when he gets here we can begin. At that moment there was a knock on the door. Aruka smirked, speaking of which he said before saying come in to whoever was outside. The door opened and a stranger wearing a black trench coat with a hood hiding his features and a scepter in hand. Everyone could feel the power radiating off of this man. Sorry I'm late, the newcomer said. 
Iruka grinned, actually, you're just in time he told the mystery man, how about you introduce yourself to the class. The hooded man nodded before turning to face everyone. Hello everyone he began, some of you already know me or, at least, have encountered me in the past. But for those of you who don't remember. The stranger then removed his hood, revealing a blonde man with a handsome face and three whisker marks on either side of his face. My name is Naruto Uzumaki, he told them. The whole class entered a state of absolute silence, the only two unaffected were Ruka and Hinata. Naruto. The guy Hinata always talked about. But she said he was dead. Kiba thought. Doji stopped eating, dropping his bag of chips in shock while his jaw was gaping. Shikamaru was now wide awake, the guy dad said was Yandame's son. He's alive. How did? Ugg trying to figure it out is too troublesome. Shino was shocked into mental silence. Or maybe he was just thinking. Who could tell? Naruto Uzumaki. The loser that used to pick fights with me? How is he alive and why is he getting special treatment? Sasuke wondered. Sakura and Ino, along with the rest of the female students, were blushing at his appearance, in addition to being shocked. That's Naruto what happened to the little shrimp that used to ask me out all the time. Sakura wondered. Who cares? Her inner persona said, look at him. He's so hot. Much hotter than Sasuke. What? No, he's not. Sasuke-kun is much better looking. No he isn't and you know it. Now this is Naruto I wouldn't mind chasing after us. Maybe after class we can talk to him, maybe get him alone and- Whoa, whoa, whoa. No way. Sasuke-kun is my only love. Sakura argued with her other half. As a wise man once said, there are plenty of fish in the sea. Not like Sasuke-kun. Maybe not. But there might be one better, inner Sakura said in a sing-song tone. Ugh. Just shut up. Sakura growled inwardly. There was no way Naruto, no matter how different he was from before, could be better than her Sasuke-kun. Not right. Ino, meanwhile, was having very different thoughts. He's alive. Naruto's alive. I can't believe it. The blonde girl thought. Like most of the other students, Ino had known Naruto when they were younger. The difference between her and the others besides Hinata was the way she perceived his personality. Where others saw his goofy, stubborn, carefree, and determined attitude as annoying and off-putting, she, like Hinata, found it endearing and couldn't help but smile when he yelled about becoming Hokage one day. She also thought he was cute. She had thought about hanging out with him and Hinata so she could get to know him better, but was worried about what the other children would say. She was shallow and enjoyed her popularity too much, so she joined in on making fun of him, though it hurt her to do so. When she heard that he had been killed, it devastated her. She had spent the time since wishing she hadn't been so afraid and that she had approached him. I won't let that happen again Ino thought to herself, this time I'll make sure to be his friend. She looked him up and down, and maybe something else. She thought, blushing brightly. The students weren't the only ones shocked by Naruto's return. The Kaiubi brat. But. He's supposed to be dead, the Hokage said he was. Mizuki thought to himself, well he kept himself from glaring at the blonde. Iruka and Hinata, meanwhile, were enjoying the shocked expressions that adorned the faces of everyone in the room, though the latter was not happy with the female student staring at her Naruto. The blonde himself, meanwhile, was also enjoying the surprise he had induced in the others. He was also observing the changes in the others since he had last seen them. Hmm. Everyone looks so different, except Sasuke, he's still brooding as usual. And Ino and Sakura. Wow. They're almost as beautiful as Hinata-chan. He was rather reluctant to admit that about Sakura. He had had a crush on her years ago, but one too many hits on the head and a serious talk with Hinata had allowed him to move on. He soon came to dislike fangirls, and Sakura was a fangirl to the highest degree. For some reason, he couldn't think this way about Ino. She was a Sasuke fangirl too, but he had a much better opinion of her. Maybe because she never hit him. Or maybe because her personality mirrored his own. Iruka cleared his throat, gaining the attention of everyone in the room. So, now that introductions are done, why don't you take a seat Naruto? The scarred said, gesturing to the vacant seat, conveniently located next to one Hinata Hayuga. Of course, he said as he went to his seat and sat down next to Hinata. The two smiled at each other before turning their attention to their instructors, ignoring the stares from everyone else. Iruka then continued, now then, today's exam has two parts. First, a written exam involving basic history and problem solving for simple situations you might find yourselves in in the future of your ninja careers. The second part involves Mizuki and I taking each of you into another room individually. There, you will perform the three simple ninjutsu taught at the academy, the transformation, substitution, and clone jutsu. If you succeed in performing all three adequately, you will pass. Now then, Mizuki, would you hand out the written tests please? When Mizuki didn't move or respond, Hiruka turned and saw that he was still staring at Naruto, not realizing a plan was forming in his head. Mizuki? Hmm? The silver-haired asked. The tests? What? 
Oh right, of course Mizuki said sheepishly as he took the papers off of the desk and began handing them out to each student. When he gave Naruto his paper, Naruto saw an evil look in his eye as he moved on to the next student. The blonde looked down at his test and sensed that a symbol had been placed on the paper. Son of a bitch is trying to get me to fail, Naruto thought to himself before he smirked, shame it won't work. He then placed his hand on the paper and sent a wave of chakra through it, dispelling the umbus Naruto thought scornfully. After Mizuki passed out the tests, Hiroka spoke again. Alright then, you have 30 minutes to complete the test. Begin. But that said, the sound of pencils scratching was the only sound heard throughout the room. Naruto glanced at his test and mentally scoffed. Too easy he thought as he began to write. A few minutes later, he finished, flipped his test over, leaned back in his chair, and closed his eyes, meditating. Or so it seemed. Suddenly, under his desk, he sent out the oculus. The now invisible floating eye flew towards Mizuki. Time to find out what's inside that tiny little mind of yours, Mizuki Naruto thought as the oculus entered Mizuki's mind. But that in place, his already slim chances of passing have decreased even more Mizuki thought, once he fails this and the second part, he'll be so desperate, he'll do anything to become a ninja. Then he'll do anything I say. Naruto frowned. He plans on using you, Kurama pointed out, angry at the audacity of the silver-haired rat standing at the front of the class. Clearly. But his eagerness is causing him to not think about what he's planning directly, so I can't tell what he wants, but something tells me it isn't good Naruto thought to his partner. Agreed. Naruto then had a mischievous idea. Look up he mentally commanded Mizuki. They suddenly felt compelled to look up and did so. He saw Naruto looking at him. Naruto opened his eyes, smirked, and then winked at him before closing his eyes again. Mizuki's eyes widened before he looked away. Does he know about it, it almost looked like he knows what I'm planning. Mizuki thought before mentally shaking his head, no. There's no way he knows. How could he? Despite these thoughts, Mizuki couldn't help but worry that his plan was being undermined. Naruto felt his worry and smirked, still don't know what he's planning, but at least he's beginning to worry, that'll make him more likely to mess up Naruto thought, with Karama agreeing. He decided to keep the Oculus deployed in case he learned anything else. After several minutes Aruka called out that time was up and that the students should hand in their tests. They did so, and Naruto saw the shocked look on Mizuki's face when he got a glance at Naruto's test. One didn't need to read Mizuki's mind to know that he was swearing up a storm. After all of the tests were turned in, Aruka then spoke again. Alright then, it'll take a few minutes to grade all of these, so relax, talk to each other, eat lunch if you brought any, and stay here until we return, understood. The yes, sensei the class said in unison. Aruka and Mizuki left the room, and the students then began doing their own thing. Nanada chan aren't you going to introduce me to your friend? Naruto asked, noticing that Kiba was staring at him. Oh, right Hinata said, Naruto-kun this is Kiba, Kiba this is Naruto-kun. Naruto extended his hand towards the Inuzuka who responded in kind, and the two shook hands. A pleasure to meet you. Hinata-chan told me a lot about you Naruto told him. Kiba nodded, good to meet you too, Hinata's told me a lot about you too. Really? Naruto asked, looking at the Hayuga heiress and smiling, all good things, I hope he said slyly. Hinata blushed and looked away, th there are only good th things to essay about you and Naruto-kun she stuttered out adorably, poking her index fingers together. Naruto's smile grew larger, thanks Hinata-chan. Hinata nodded, blushing even more. Kiba decided to interrupt, one of the things she told me is that you're supposed to be dead. So how are you here? He asked. Kiba. Hinata scolded, not wanting him to upset the object of her affections. Naruto smiled, it's alright Hinata-chan he assured her before looking back at Kiba, long story. One I will possibly share with you one day. Kiba nodded, deciding not to pry, even though he really wanted to. The bark suddenly caught their attention, coming from the large dog at Kiba's side. Right, sorry buddy Kiba apologized, the canine being irritated that he was not given an introduction, this is my partner, Akamaru he told Naruto. Naruto smiled and began to pet Akamaru, scratching behind his ears and rubbing his chest, making him extremely happy. Hey there bud, you the brains of the team? Naruto asked. Hey. Relax Kiba, I'm only joking, he told the Inuzuka before continuing to pet Akamaru, I have a pet too, so I know what it's like to have a bond like this. Kiba perked up at these words. You have a dog too? He asked, always happy to meet another dog lover. Naruto shook his head, not exactly, she's a bit bigger than a dog. She does like to play fetch though, and she loves being scratched behind the ears and having her chest and belly rubbed, he told the dog lover. What is she? Kiba asked, curious. Naruto smirked, you've never heard of her species, I promise you he told Kiba, come by my place sometime, and I'll show you. Just. Try not to scream and run away when you see her. Kiba looked confused. Once you see her, you'll understand. Kiba was still confused but dropped it, what's her name? He asked. Beatrice. That's a weird name, Kiba pointed out. 
bought it from a book I read a few years ago. Hanada watched the exchange, happy her two closest friends were getting along so well. She knew that Kiba knew that she was in love with Naruto and was worried that that was causing a problem with him since he had once had a crush on her too. She was happy to see that wasn't the case. The trio began conversing amongst themselves, unaware that many others were staring at them or, more specifically, at Naruto. They were interrupted by another voice. Um, excuse me, Naruto. Naruto looked up and saw Ino standing there, looking incredibly nervous, something that was unusual for the blonde young woman. Now that she wasn't behind a desk, Naruto was able to see her in her stunning entirety. And stunning was an accurate term for her. She wore a short purple, sleeveless blouse, an open front purple apron skirt over a shorter black skirt with short fishnet shorts underneath. These revealed a great deal of her flawless skin, but not enough to be considered skimpy. Her stomach and legs were now visible as she no longer wore the bandages she used to. Her formerly protruding bang has now flattened against her face, covering one of her eyes and giving her a mysterious and exotic look, though it did, he noted, hide much of her beautiful face. She also replaced the warmer she used to wear on her elbows with fishnet ones and wore a pair of the same over her knees. She was no longer unnaturally skinny and had a figure and assets that would make any supermodel envious. Damn Naruto thought, she's gorgeous. Anada couldn't help but glare at Ino, she and Sakura were among the two that most insulted Naruto when they were younger. She also wasn't a fan of the way Naruto was staring at her. Yes Ino? Naruto asked, wondering what she wanted. Ino took a deep breath. She was never this nervous around Sasuke or any other guy, so why was she so nervous now? I just wanted to say that. That I'm glad you're not dead and that you're back she confessed, blushing. Naruto was surprised by this, he always thought that Ino disliked him. This was good though, he was always happy to have a new friend. Thank you, Ino-chan, I'm happy to see you too, he told his fellow blonde with a smile. The smile and the chan suffix made her blush even more. Chan Hinata yelled in outrage in her mind, suddenly wanting to murder the blonde girl in front of her. Ino smiled back and nodded, th thanks, Naruto-kun she told him, unaware that she had added the suffix, before heading back to her seat, happy that he didn't hate her. She wanted to stay and talk more, but she was too nervous. She would have to calm her nerves and find a way to be her usual self around her fellow blonde, the energetic outspoken young woman she was. When she sat back down, Sakura leaned over to her, what was that about pig? She asked, wondering why she was focusing her attention on Naruto rather than Sasuke. Ino smiled at her former friend, that was none of your business forehead. She said happily, confusing even more. Some of the other non-important male students were also confused, angry, and jealous. This guy had just shown up and he already had two out of the three of the hottest girls in class eating out of his hand, or rather, that was their opinion. Sasuke, meanwhile, felt something strange. He normally ignored his fangirls, but when Ino started paying more attention to Naruto than she did to him, he felt a twinge of jealousy. After a few more minutes, Hiruka and Mizuki walked back into the classroom and began handing out the test papers. Naruto already had a fairly good idea of how well he had done when he saw the hint of anger and disappointment on Mizuki's face. Sure enough, when he received his test, he saw that he had scored 100%. Judging from the expressions Hinata and Kiba had on their faces, they were satisfied with their scores as well. Well done everyone Iruka told the class, I think I speak for both of us when I say that I'm pleased with the average of this class. Mizuki nodded in agreement. Iruka continued, now, it's time for the final part of the exam, the basic ninjutsu test. When I call your name, you will follow us into another room where we will begin the test. I should point out that passing this test is a requirement of the academy. If you fail this test, you will fail the exam entirely, no matter how high your written score is. The part about failing the exam completely made some of the students nervous. Sakura, once again, voiced her concerns. But sensei, if this test decides everything, why bother with a written test? The written test was to gauge how you would handle problems out in the field and help the Hokage determine where to place you on a team if you do pass Aruka answered before continuing, now then, if you pass, you will receive your headbands and return to your seats. If you fail, you can stay if you wish, but you can also leave and go home if you wish. No one will judge you. Also, if you fail, you can sign up for another semester and take the test again next year. Now then, let us begin. Iruka then began calling out students' names in alphabetical order by their last names. The non-important students returned with either a smile on their faces and a headband, with their heads hanging in shame, or not at all, the latter two of which indicating that they had failed. Of the notable students, Shino went first, returning with his headband silently. Toji was next, also returning with his headband and a satisfied smile on his face. He returned to his desk and began munching on another bag of chips. Sakura came back from her test with her headband and was positively giddy, trying and failing to get Sasuke's attention. Hinata returned with her headband, smiling at her friends, who smiled back. 
Naruto gave her a thumbs up, causing her to blush. Fibber returned from his test with his headband and a cocky smirk on his face. Shikamaru came back with his headband, went back to his desk, and then proceeded to fall asleep, causing everyone to sweat. Sasuke went next, returning with a headband and an arrogant smirk, with his fangirls cheering for him. And then it was Naruto's turn. The blonde entered the empty classroom and stood before the two instructors, who were sitting behind the teacher's desk. He could feel Mizuki's hope and certainty that he would fail even without the Oculus, which was still in place. All right, Naruto, do you understand what's expected of you? Haruka asked. Naruto nodded, yes, Iruka sensei Good. Now to begin, please demonstrate the transformation jutsu. Naruto nodded and forged the hand sign needed before a burst of smoke obscured him from view. When the smoke vanished, Naruto stood in the form of the Sandame Hokage. But Iruka said as he began writing down the blonde score, with said blonde returning to normal. Should Mizuki thought. Next, please perform the substitution jutsu. Naruto made another hand sign and disappeared in another puff of smoke. When it vanished, a shocked Mizuki stood in Naruto's place. Naruka's eyes widened and he turned to see Naruto sitting next to him. Sup he said, before swapping his and Mizuki's places again. Both were stunned. While it was possible to swap places with another person, it required considerable skill, something that only the most skilled and Anbu were capable of doing, well beyond the abilities of an academy student. Neither Ruka nor Mizuki were capable of this. I impressive, Haruka said, stunned. Shit. Mizuki swore again in his mind, louder than last time. Finally, please perform the clone jutsu. You need at least three healthy clones to pass, Haruka told him. If I know a different form of clone jutsu, can I use that instead? Naruto asked, seeing as how his chakra levels were too high to create a regular clone. Mizuki scoffed, of course you can't. Yes, Naruto, of course. If you are capable of creating another type of clone, you are free to do so, Aruka said, interrupting his fellow. Naruto nodded and formed a familiar cross-shaped hand seal. Shadow clone jutsu. He shouted. After these words were spoken, a grand total of ten Narutos appeared in the room. Aruka and Mizuki were now completely floored. Creating one shadow clone required a great deal of chakra and often left most of its users winded. But to create ten of them inconceivable. And on top of that, Naruto didn't look the least bit tired. W well done Naruto, you've successfully passed the exam. He said, still shocked but also happy his favorite student had passed the exam. Shit. Mizuki practically screamed in his mind. Naruto had to hold in his smirk. Naruto stepped forward and claimed the headband Aruka had laid out on the desk, tying it around his forehead. Thank you sensei, he told his older brother. Aruka nodded in return. As Naruto turned to leave, he was interrupted by Aruka. One last thing Naruto he told his student, who proceeded to turn to face him again. You scored the highest on this part of the exam so far. However, because you entered the class on the last day, you currently have the lowest score in class, with Sasuke being the highest he informed the blonde. So I'm the dead last, and Sasuke is the rookie of the year Naruto said. It wasn't a question. Naruka nodded. Mizuki was smirking inwardly, if he could convince Naruto that he could raise Naruto's ranking in class, he would be able to use him after all. To his shock and disappointment, Naruto scoffed. Idols are for the vain, I leave narcissism to people like Sasuke Naruto told the scarred. Naruka nodded, proud of his student's attitude. The old Naruto would have pitched a fit at this, but the blonde man before him now was calm and didn't care. Fuck. Mizuki thought. Naruto then returned to the rest of the class with a smile on his face. It wasn't an arrogant smirk, it was a smile of contentment. Naruto got a hug from Hinata, a high five from Kiba, and a bark of happiness from Akimaru. Ino, meanwhile, was happy that her fellow blonde had passed. Speaking of Ino, she was the last notable student to take the test. When she returned to the classroom with her headband, Naruto smiled at her and gave her a thumbs up. Ino blushed and smiled back. Soon after this, Iruka and Mizuki stood before the class. I'd like to congratulate those of you who passed and say better luck next time to those who didn't Iruka told the class, those of you who passed, however, I expect to see you all here tomorrow at exactly 9am for your team placements, understood? He asked the class. Yes Iruka sensei the class answered. Aruka nodded, good. Now go, enjoy the rest of the day, celebrate or relax however you wish. The students then all rose from their seats and made their way outside. Once Naruto, Hinata, Kiba, and Akimaru were outside they were approached by Aruka. Naruto, Hinata. He called out to them. The trio stopped and faced their sensei. I'm glad I caught up to you guys he told his students, I wanted to take the two of you to Ichirakus to celebrate, my treaty then looked to Kiba, you and Akimaru are more than welcome to come, Kiba he offered. Naruto glanced at each other and smiled. I'm always up for Raymond, how about you guys? Naruto asked. Hinata nodded, that sounds good. Fiba shrugged, why not? And with that, the four humans and one dog headed off to Ichiraku Raymond. Naruto, however, had his mind on other matters. 
before he left the academy, Mizuki's mind finally revealed something concrete on what the rat was planning. Naruto heard the words Forbidden Scroll and Steel and felt greed and a desire for power within Mizuki's mind. The blonde had a pretty good idea of what the silver-haired was planning. There was no need to hurry, however. The only time Mizuki could get close to his target was at night and it was still early in the afternoon. So Naruto would spend the afternoon with his friends before he set out to warn the Hokage. He had a feeling that dealing with Mizuki wouldn't be too difficult. Forest just outside of Konoha, later that night. The forest that surrounded Konoha was as quiet as it normally was, aside from the sounds of crickets. This silence was broken when a certain silver-haired Cretan began leaping from tree branch to tree branch, carrying a large scroll on his back. I can't believe how easy that was. I didn't need the Kaiubi Brad after all. He thought as he moved as fast as he was able. Once I cross the border of fire country, I'll be home free. Then I'll use the scroll to become the most powerful shinobi in the world. Orochimaru will regret abandoning me. He vowed. Orochimaru, the rogue, was indeed once Mizuki's master, but he was cast aside when the snake abandoned Konoha, claiming that he was a poor informant and a waste of resources. Mizuki would have ratted out the snake Sanin, but two things prevented him from doing so. First, he had no valuable information to share about his former master, as he was at the bottom of the chain of command, and secondly, he was afraid of being sent to jail for aiding a monster like Orochimaru. Anko Midarashi was given a pardon, but only because she was his unwitting pawn and had no idea of what he was planning, while well, Mizuki did, making him a willing accomplice. Any further thoughts were interrupted when an invisible force sliced through the branch he had landed on, causing him to fall to the forest floor. He managed to roll on impact, stopping his fall from being painful. He looked around wildly, trying to figure out who or what had interrupted his escape. Someone's in a hurry. Mizuki spun around and saw one Naruto Uzumaki step out of the shadows. Naruto? What are you doing here? The silver-haired man asked, wondering how the brat had managed to find him. Dust out for a midnight stroll. What are you doing here? Naruto answered asked. Mizuki then became nervous, oh, uh, I was, uh, just heading out for a mission he lied. Really? Naruto asked skeptically, it must be quite the mission, considering you're bringing the forbidden scroll of sealing with you he said, pointing to the large scroll on the man's back. What, this? No this isn't I mean it he then decided to drop the act and narrowed his eyes. Listen, Naruto, you need to get out of the way before something bad happens, he warned. Naruto also decided to drop the act, like what? You're killing me. He then scoffed, you're nowhere near strong enough. Mizuki laughed, and here I thought you had grown a brain while you were gone. Do the maths brat, I'm a, you're an academy student. You don't stand a chance against me. Naruto shook his head, you're even dumber than I thought. Do you really think I could have tracked you and snuck up on you if I was as weak as you say I am? He asked. You got lucky, Mizuki snarled. Naruto smirked, perhaps, it doesn't take a lot of skill to outwit a Dumbus like you. Mizuki growled, Dumbus. He yelled angrily, could a Dumbus have snuck into the Hokage Tower and stolen the village's most valuable possession? He could, if someone convinced the Hokage to order the Anbu in the tower, let him Naruto answered. At these words, a squad of Anbu leapt out of the shadows and surrounded the traitor. Mizuki spun around, shocked by this turn of events. Did you really think that the Forbidden Scroll would be so lightly guarded? Would stealing it be so easy? He asked before he let out a laugh, a silent alarm went off the second you broke into the room that contained it. Mizuki then turned to face Naruto, B but, why did you let me get this far? Naruto's smirk widened, I figured that, with a career as pathetic as yours, you should achieve at least some level of success, he told the silver-haired fool mockingly. Mizuki growled, but was inwardly panicking. There was no way he could fight off a squad of Anbu. Unless. Mizuki suddenly unholstered the scroll and held it in his hands, preparing a low-level fire jutsu. Back off. He ordered, all of you. You either let me walk out of here with the scroll or I burn it. He threatened, knowing the shinobi around him wouldn't risk damaging such a valuable piece of the village's history. Only for Naruto to start laughing, with some of the Anbu snickering slightly as well. You really are an idiot Naruto told him, the scroll and its container have protective seals on them to prevent them from being damaged, he informed the fool before smirking again, you have nothing to bargain with. Mizuki was now sweating up a storm. The only thing that exceeded his worry was his rage. This brat had made him look like a fool. Mizuki suddenly dropped the scroll and whipped out a kunai and threw it at the blonde. The knife would have struck Naruto right in the forehead. Were it not for Naruto using his scepter to swat the projectile out of the air, shocking the traitor greatly. I'm so glad you're resisting, Naruto told him, because the old man said I could take you down personally if you did. Mizuki stared at the blonde before starting to laugh. You? You're going to take me down? What are you gonna do? Whack me with your cane? He mocked. Naruto could feel Harvest's rage at being called a cane and smirked. Something like that. Suddenly, the cane became enveloped in dark energy and transformed into a wicked-looking side. 
Bazuki gaped at the weapon, as did the Anbu, though their masks hid their expressions. Bazuki, I'd like you to meet Harvest he said, his smirk becoming a wicked grin, the two of you are about to become very well acquainted. Bazuki brought out a shuriken and prepared himself, you think you scare me you little shit. Naruto's grin widened. The blonde suddenly disappeared and reappeared behind Mizuki. Before the man could even turn around, Naruto swung his scythe and severed the man's legs out from under him. The traitor cried out in agony as he fell to the ground. Naruto then held the blade up to the man's throat. The crippled rogue ninja and the Anbu were shocked at the speed Naruto had achieved. I do now, he answered Mizuki. The pain the man was feeling was beyond agonizing, but he still managed to glare up at his foe. You. Mother. Fucker, he grunted out. Naruto smirked and holstered his weapon and began to walk away. Knowing there was no way out of this, Mizuki decided to hurt Naruto in a mental and emotional way. He grinned evilly. Hey he began, do you know. Why everyone. Hates you? He asked. Naruto stopped and the Anbu tensed. Before they could try to silence the traitor, Naruto turned to face him, a neutral expression on his face. It's because I contain the Kyubi no Kitsune within me he answered in a matter-of-fact tone. Both Mizuki and the Anbu were shocked by this. He knew. Naruto scoffed, your last attempt to exact vengeance upon me has ended in the same way all of your plans have today. Failure he then began to walk away again, enjoy your remaining days in prison before your execution. The squad then reclaimed the scroll and restrained Mizuki, while also cauterizing his wounds so that he wouldn't bleed out before taking both back to the village, with the silver-haired traitor cursing Naruto's existence all the way. The academy, the next morning, the day was the day of the team placements, the day the students left the academy and began their careers as shinobi. Naruto, Hinata, and Kibo along with Akamaru were sitting in the same seats they were in yesterday. Man, I can't wait until Laruka sensei and Mizuki sensei get here, Kibo told his friends. He had gotten to know Naruto better yesterday, while they were eating ramen together, and already considered each other friends, much to Hinata's joy. Naruto smirked inwardly. I doubt Mizuki will be here today, he told the dog lover. Kibo was confused, what makes you say that? He asked, with Hinata also looking confused. Naruto grinned. Just a hunch, he told them. Before they could question him further, Hiroka walked into the room, silencing the class. Sure enough, Mizuki was nowhere to be seen. Hinata and Kibo all stared questioningly at Naruto. The blonde just shrugged. Good morning class Aruka greeted his students. Good morning Aruka sensei the class said all together. Again, some of them didn't quite put their hearts into it. Well the scar began, today's the day I look forward to and dread every year, the day my students are placed with a sensei and begin their careers as ninja. I look forward to this because of the pride I feel for each and every one of you. I dread this because this is the day you stop being my students and become fully grown adults. The class was now listening intently. But before I tell you your team assignments, I have one last piece of advice for you he took a deep breath, the road ahead of you is going to be a long and hard one. The life of a ninja is not an easy one. There will be pain, loss, and even death. But don't let that rule over your life. When the world seems to weigh down on you, focus on the good times you will have. So make friends, find love, and have fun whenever you can. My point is, live life to the fullest, because, as a shinobi, even a genin, every day could be your last, and, even though I'm no longer your sensei, I want each and every one of my students to live a full, meaningful life, even if it may not be possible. Most of the class was touched by their sensei's concern for them, except for Sasuke, who didn't care. Aruka sighed. Alright then, now for your team assignments he said before clearing his throat, Team 1. Naruto decided to tune out his older brother figure until he heard one of his friend's names, or his own, being called. A few minutes later, he heard his name. Team 7 will consist of Naruto Uzumaki. The blonde smiled. Sakura Haruno. Naruto frowned. And Sasuke Chiha. Naruto slammed his head into his desk and groaned. Sakura cried out in joy about true love conquering all. Sasuke was outwardly nonchalant while inwardly cringing at the thought of being on a team with one of his biggest fangirls. Ino was upset. To her shock, it had more to do with not being on Naruto's team rather than Sasuke's. Inada, Kiba, and even Akamaru looked at Naruto with pity in their eyes. The beautiful Hayuga was also disappointed with not being placed with Naruto. Their sensei will be Kakashi Haddock. Naruka continued on to the next team. Team 8 will consist of Hinata Hayuga. Inada perked up. Kiba and Yuzuka and Shino Aburam. Your sensei will be Kurana Yuhi. Hinata and Kiba looked at each other and smiled, happy that they were on the same team. Hinata glanced over at Shino and saw him look back at her before nodding. She didn't know much about him, but Hinata was sure he was a nice enough person that she and Kiba would get along with. She was also thrilled about having Kurana as her sensei. Team 9 is still in circulation Aruka continued, and, finally, Team 10 will consist of Shikamaru Nara, Choji Akamichi, and Ino Yamanaka. Your sensei will be Asuma Suratobi. Ino wasn't too upset by this. 
While she wasn't friends with the two, her father had introduced her to them years earlier, her father and theirs having been friends for years as well as teammates when they were younger. Maybe this wouldn't be so bad. And that's all Aruka said, now, it's time for me to go. Your senseis will be here for you all shortly, so stay here and wait for their arrival, and remember to take my advice he smiled, goodbye and good luck class. Goodbye Aruka sensei the class all said at once, their hearts being into it this time. Aruka's smile widened and, with that, he left. A few minutes later, the senseis arrived, one by one, and called out for their teams to follow them, which they did. The first of the notable students began leaving when a beautiful, raven-haired, crimson-eyed woman walked in and offered a quick smile to Hinata, which was returned. Naruto noticed Kibo along with most of the male students staring at her and had to hold in his laughter. He mate, you're with me. The Aburam and Inuzuka heirs, along with the Hayuga heiress, stood up and followed their new sensei. Good luck Naruto whispered as he saw his friends leave. Thanks thank you Kiba and Hinata answered as they left. A few minutes after that, a bearded man with a cigarette hanging out of his mouth walked in. Dean 10. He called out. Ino, Choji, and Shikamaru the latter rather reluctantly stood up. Asuma Saratobi nodded, all right, follow me, he told them. As they were leaving, Ino looked back at Naruto, who smiled and mouthed good luck to her. Ino blushed, smiled back and mouthed back thanks as she left. Soon after, the only people left in the classroom were Naruto, Sakura, and Sasuke. Almost half an hour passed and the Team 7 sensei had still yet to show. Seriously? Naruto thought, where is this Kakashi guy? Kakashi. Kurama said in a tone suggesting that he knew the name, oh, I remember. Kakashi Haddock. He was one of your father's genin students the fox explained. Naruto perked up after hearing this, really? So, my father's student is now my teacher. That can't be a coincidence. Anything I should know about him? He asked. Only that, whenever he has an appointment, he goes out of his way to show up at least two hours late. Naruto mentally groaned, great. Just perfect, what do I do until then? You could chat with your teammates. His partner suggested. Naruto scoffed, right, the squealing fangirl queen and the conceited king of brooding. Yeah, that'll be a truly riveting conversation he thought sarcastically. Garama laughed, you're going to have to speak with them one of these days he told his friend, they are going to be your teammates after all. One of these days, Karama. But not today. Garama laughed again, so what do you want to do in the meantime? Naruto thought about it for a moment before getting an idea. On to E4. Garama paused. What? On to E4 Naruto repeated. Garama raised an eyebrow, really? You want to play mental chess? Here. Now. He asked incredulously. Why not, we've got nothing better to do Naruto answered. Hmm. I don't know. What, is the big bad Kyubi afraid of losing? He asked mockingly. Garama growled in annoyance. Afraid. Of losing. Please. In case you've forgotten, we're tight at this game at the moment. The fox argued. Naruto laughed, let's make a bet he told his partner, if you win I'll conjure up some of that red velvet cake you love so much. Garama perked up. As they had gotten to know each other over the years, Naruto learned that Kurama had a bizarre weakness for sweets, with red velvet cake being the fox's favorite, and had received profound thanks whenever he conjured some up in his mindscape for the fox. Really? Naruto smirked, really he answered, but if I win. You have to answer any question I ask you honestly, no matter the consequences. Deal. Deal. Naruto chuckled at his partner's cheeriness, before closing his eyes, alright then. Now, as I said before, pawn to e4. Pawn to e5. And so the game began. It was a game that Death had suggested Naruto and Kurama play when they were bored or just wanting to pass the time, as it also helped increase Naruto's intelligence. For Naruto, it had taken a while to learn how to play the game entirely in his head, but it was a good way to fight boredom. They could have, of course, entered his mindscape and played the game where they could see the pieces, but it was more fun and challenging to play the game this way. A few minutes passed and Naruto and Kurama each took one pawn from the other. Bishop to c4 Naruto decided. How aggressive of you Kurama complimented, queen to h4. Check. Now who's being aggressive? Naruto smirked. You haven't seen anything yet. The cake will be mine. He declared. Naruto grinned at the challenge, king to f1. After another 20 minutes, Naruto heard footsteps approaching him. Naruto mentally sighed, great, now Broody wants to talk. Just in time to save your sorry ass, Kurama replied cheekily. We'll see. This isn't over yet. The footsteps stopped only a few feet away. Is there something I can help you with Sasuke? Naruto asked, not bothering to look at the Achiha or even open his eyes. Where were you? Sasuke demanded. What do you mean? Naruto asked innocently. You were declared dead four years ago, but you're still alive. So where were you the last four years? He asked again. Naruto held in a smirk at his answer, that's classified. Sasuke frowned at being denied an answer, the hell it is. Sorry, I'm afraid so. Need to know only. 
Sasu decided to ask another question, why were you allowed to graduate without taking the class? Naruto shrugged, don't know. It was the Hokage's decision. Ask him. Sasuke's frown deepened at being denied yet another answer. You're lying. There is a reason and you know it. The Ichiha accused. Do I? Naruto asked. Now you're avoiding the question. I am? You're answering every question with another question. Am I really? Sasuke snarled, answer me. He demanded. No. Sasuke stepped forward in an attempt to force the blonde to answer him. Only to be hit by an intense wave of killing intent directed only at him, so Sakura wasn't affected. Sasuke immediately fell to his knees, struggling to breath. Listen to me very carefully Sasuke Naruto began, finally opening his eyes and facing the Achiha. I don't care who you are or what clan you were born into, you will not demand anything of me, and you will not order me around. When you ask me a question, I will give you an honest answer when I choose to. Am I being clear enough? Before Sasuke could even answer, the killing intent vanished and Sasuke gasped for air. Now, if you want to try to be more pleasant, I may decide to answer your questions. Otherwise, go back to your desk, sit down, and be quiet Naruto told him. Sasuke shakily got to his feet. He glared at the blonde for a few moments before heading back to his seat. Sakura, meanwhile, saw and heard this confrontation and saw her crush attempt to get answers before suddenly falling to his knees before being allowed to rise again. What did you do to Sasuke-kun? She demanded. Just a bit of harmless killing intent, Sakura. Nothing to worry about he assured her. Sakura felt like arguing more, but was afraid what happened to Sasuke would happen to her, so she dropped it. Naruto sighed, well, let's hope that settles things for the moment. Now, where were we? Oh, yes, pawn to b5. Hirama smirked, ah, trying to lure my bishop out are you? Alright, I'll take the bait, bishop takes the pawn. Knight to f6 Naruto thought. Knight to f3. An hour and a half later, the game was coming to a close. Knight to c3. Bishop to c5. Knight to d5. The queen takes the pawn. Bishop to d6. Hirama smirked, oh, bad move my friend, queen takes rook. Incidentally, check. We'll see, Naruto answered, king to e2. Bishop takes your second rook, Karama informed him. Naruto ignored his friend, pawn to e5. Karama was confused, really? You've lost both of your rooks and you're moving a pawn. The fox asked incredulously, before laughing, alright, knight to a6. Knight takes a pawn. King to d8. Queen to f6. What? Seriously? That's your move. Your funeral, the knight takes the queen. Karama smirked, I mean, if you wanted to lose you could have just surrendered. I can't believe you wasted a move with that pawn. The fox laughed. Suddenly Naruto started laughing in his mind as well. Karama was confused, huh? What are you laughing about? Naruto grinned wickedly, look at the board again he thought simply. What are you suddenly his eyes widened, oh. Oh you son of a bitch. Naruto smirked, bishop to e7. Checkmate. Fuck. Karama swore, you moved the pawn to stop my queen from protecting my king. Naruto's smirk widened, good game my friend, but you were simply outmatched. Karama growled, so you're one win ahead of me, it means nothing. Your tone says otherwise the blonde pointed out. Karama growled again, rematch. He demanded, wanting that cake. At that moment, the door to the classroom opened and a man with gravity-defying silver hair walked in, a combination of his headband and a mask covering three quarters of his face. The arrival of this strange-looking man gained the attention of the three students. Oh look, Kakashi's here Naruto pointed out. Hirama fumed, this isn't over. I will have my revenge. And my cake. He bowed. Naruto mentally laughed at his friend's one-track mind. Kakashi, meanwhile, was silent as he scanned the room, eyeing each of his genin hopefuls. His gaze lingered on Naruto longer than the others, something the blonde noticed. Finally, he spoke. My first impression of you three is... He lifted his hand up before rocking it from side to side in a motion that meant neither good nor bad, meh. Sasuke and Sakura looked slightly offended. Naruto, meanwhile, was having a different reaction. That voice. He thought, I remember that voice from. His eyes widened when he realized where and when he'd heard that voice before. Kakashi continued, right, meet me on the roof in 10 minutes he told the trio before disappearing in a swirl of leaves. Seconds later Naruto stood up and vanished in a swirl of darkness. Sasuke and Sakura stood there, stunned by what they just saw. After a moment the two left the room and headed towards the roof. Academy roof. Kakashi Haddock described himself as a man of simple tastes. He enjoyed good food, the occasional drink. And fine literature. Like the orange novel he was currently reading. Oh yes, the Cyclopean was a fan of Icha Icha. In fact he was the series' number one fan. This wasn't an exaggeration either, he truly was the greatest fan of the series, and he would fight anyone who argued that claim on the side of the street. For the next few minutes, however, he would be unable to finish his current page. We were there. Bakashi spun around and saw Naruto Uzumaki standing a few feet away from him. Pardon? 
Kakashi asked, trying to contain his surprise at the blonde reaching the roof so quickly and being able to sneak up behind him. You were there Naruto repeated, the night I died. Kakashi continued to stare. How does he know that? The two just stared at each other until the two remaining members of the new team arrived. The three students sat down and waited for their new sensei to speak. Well Kakashi began, now that we're all here, let's start with some introductions. Tell me your name, likes, dislikes, hobbies, dreams for the future, things like that. Why don't you go first, sensei, to give us an example, Sakura suggested. Kakashi raised his one visible eyebrow at the strange request. Why would she need an example? Were his words not clear? He shrugged and continued, all right then, my name is Kakashi Haddock, I like some things and dislike others. I have a lot of hobbies, and I don't feel like telling you my dreams he told them in a matter-of-fact tone. The three teens sweat dropped. All we learned was his name they all thought to themselves. All right then Kakashi said, turning to Sakura, pretty in pink, you first. Sakura looked offended but shook it off, my name is Sakura Haruno, I like. She glanced at Sasuke and giggled before becoming angry, I dislike Ino Pig and other girls like her. She nearly shouted. Meaning competition for Sasuke's affections Naruto thought to himself. And my dreams for the future. Sakura glanced at Sasuke, giggled madly, and fidgeted in place. Both Kakashi and Naruto rolled their eyes, though the former did it internally. Great, a fangirl Kakashi thought, if this team manages to pass, I'll have to find a way to beat that out of her, or she won't last very long on any serious mission. I notice you didn't say you dislike Naruto inner Sakura told her counterpart. He's sitting right there Sakura pointed out, annoyed. So is Sasuke, but that didn't stop you from gushing about your fantasies about him. Besides, you never had trouble insulting him to his face before he left inner Sakura pointed out. Sakura frowned, well. Maybe I'm trying to be a better person she suggested. Inner Sakura rolled her eyes, uh-huh, sure you are she said sarcastically. Before Sakura could respond, Kakashi gestured to Sasuke, okay, Prince of Darkness, you next. Sasuke ignored the comment and spoke, my name is Sasuke Cha. There aren't many things I like and plenty of things I dislike. I don't have any hobbies. My ambition, and that is what it is because I will make it happen, is to restore the Achiha clan he faced then darkened, and to kill a certain man. Gee, I wonder who that could be Naruto thought to himself sarcastically. An Avenger, just as I thought Kakashi thought, he's got it bad. If he doesn't find a way to control his hatred, it'll end up consuming him. The Cyclopean then turned to Naruto. And last but not least, Whiskers. Go. Like Sasuke, Naruto ignored the comment and spoke, my name is Naruto Uzumaki. I like my friends, Raymond, training, my weapon, my pet, my job, and a certain furball Naruto held in a smirk when he heard fuck you. From inside his mind and a feeling of satisfaction from Harvest. The others were confused by the last three likes. Naruto continued, I dislike arrogance, bigotry, stupidity, treachery, the time it takes instant Raymond to microwave, and fangirls. Sakura felt a bit hurt by that last comment, but shrugged it off. My hobbies include training, meditating, reading, and learning new jutsu. As for dreams he shrugged, I haven't thought that far ahead Naruto finished, satisfied he didn't reveal anything he shouldn't. He's changed a lot in the time he was gone Kakashi thought, but he's hiding something. What did he mean by his pet and job? And furball. Is he referring to the fox? Is he communicating with it somehow? He wondered and thought. He also noticed that Naruto didn't say he wanted to be Hokage someday as his dream. What caused him to change? Kakashi then noticed his students were waiting on him to continue, okay, now that the introductions are out of the way, meet me at the third training ground at 7am for your team test. Sasuke and Sakura were confused, while well, Naruto just thought, I knew it wasn't that easy to himself. Sakura voiced her concerns, but Sensei, didn't we already pass our test? She asked. The silver-haired Cyclops shook his head, nope, the academy test was made to weed out the weak. The real test takes place after you're placed on a team. That's when I test you three personally to determine whether or not you have what it takes to make it in the shinobi world. If you pass, you become an official genin and if you fail, you get sent back to the academy he said, giving them a strange smile expressed only through his visible eye. Sakura looked worried at these words. Bakashi continued, so, to recap, introductions done, meet up at the third training ground at 7am, and your future depends on your success he told the teens, making Sakura even more nervous. Then prepare to depart, oh, and one last thing he told his prospective students, getting their attention, don't eat breakfast tomorrow or you'll throw up he told them, giving them another strange eye smile before vanishing again. Naruto stood up and turned to the others, bit of advice he told his teammates, show up at 9 and make sure you eat something before you get there, you'll need the energy he advised them before leaping off the roof and landing on the ground below, before beginning to walk home. The two remaining teens stared after him before Sasuke started to leave with Sakura following him. Streets of Kanoha. Naruto walked down the streets of Kanoha thinking about the test the next day. 
I wonder what he has planned the blonde thought to himself, it can't be something too complex if it's designed for genuine hopefuls. Will we have to fight him? He's years ahead of us so that wouldn't make it fair. Of course hardly anything is fair in the shinobi world. Still, I wonder, Bakashi likes to make himself seem mysterious and complicated, but he's really a simple guy, Kurama told him. How do you know that? Naruto asked. That's what your mother thought of him after she got to know him, and your father agreed they informed him. Right, I forgot she was your container before me the teen remembered, but how does this help me? Bakashi's test might seem complicated, but the goal will be clear for someone who is observant. Naruto smirked, someone like me? He asked. Exactly. Naruto then noticed the passing villagers giving him shocked looks and whispering to themselves. The hell are they looking at? Did you remember to put your hood back on? Kurama asked. Naruto felt the top of his head and realized that his hood was not up. Fuck me he thought, with all the excitement I completely forgot he panicked before shrugging, ah the hell with it, they would have found out sooner or later. I just hope none of them try anything stupid, I have neither the time nor the patience for it. Suddenly, Naruto sensed something and instinctively reached up and caught the stone that had been thrown at his head, not even looking in the direction the stone was thrown from. Everyone on the street froze. God damn it Naruto thought. He knew this was going to happen eventually, that the villagers would try something once they found out he was alive. Now he was going to have to scare these people into leaving him alone, or at least he would scare those present and hope they spread the message. He was probably going to get in trouble for this, but he no longer had the patience for this kind of bullshit. Naruto held the rock up to his eyes and stared at it. Who threw this? He asked quietly, but still loud enough for everyone to hear. There was no response. Naruto then looked up and towards the crowd of villagers, glaring at them. Who threw this? He asked again, shouting this time. No one said anything. Naruto sighed, that's how you want to play it. Fine he then spoke louder, I'm going to count to ten. If the person who threw this rock at me doesn't step forward, I'm going to be very irritated. Silence. One. Two. Nine. At that moment, someone stepped forward. A civilian man, with no outstanding features. I did it, he said, trying to hide his fear. Naruto had to applaud the man's bravery. He stepped towards the civilian. And why he began, did you do that? The man took a step back. Be because, why you're. You're. He was unable to finish. Because I'm the Kaiubi made of flesh. Naruto asked. The crowd was startled by this. He knew. The man gulped, yes he answered. Naruto was silent for a moment before chuckling, which soon evolved into full-blown laughter, scaring the crowd even more. Let me see if I understand this, Naruto said after his laughter stopped, you believe me to be the Kaiubi no Kitsune, a being that can shatter mountains and cause natural disasters with a flick of its tails and your plan was to throw a fucking stone at my head. Is that right? He asked. The man visibly gulped and nodded. Doesn't sound like a very smart plan when I say it out, does it? The man shook his head. Naruto suddenly grabbed the man's shoulders. The crowd froze, waiting for the inevitable death of their fellow citizens. The man clenched his eyes shut and trembled, awaiting his death. But it never came. Instead, he felt the hands that had grabbed him brush his shoulders off before straightening his shirt. There we go, Naruto said, now you look much better. The civilian was now as confused as he was terrified. Naruto gave him a confused look. What's wrong? He asked, you look tense. You're not scared of me are you? And then no, the civilian stuttered out. Naruto shook his head, of course not, why would you be? We're both honest, decent, Kanahagakur citizens, right? That's sure. Naruto grinned, good, that's good. The man flinched when Naruto stood to his side and wrapped an arm around his shoulder. I don't know about you, but I think we're getting along splendidly, don't you? Naruto asked. The man nodded. Naruto's smile widened, good. Now that we're friends, why don't we introduce ourselves? My name's Naruto, what's yours? The civilian said nothing, too scared to speak. Now, now, it's not polite to withhold your name when someone has given you theirs Naruto told him, rudeness like that makes me very upset. You wouldn't want your new friend to be upset with you. Because it would be a real shame if I were to become upset. So I'll try again. My name's Naruto, what's yours? M. Masao said friend stuttering out, M. My N name's Masao. Naruto smiled, do you have any family, Masao? He asked, a wife. He nodded. What about children? Masao nodded shakily, a eh, son he answered. How old? H he just turned four. So young Naruto said, you must be very happy. Masao nodded, why yes I am he told the menacing blonde. That's good, Naruto said before continuing, you should enjoy the good things you have. You never know when something unexpected may happen to the people you care about. Or when unfortunate accidents may occur he said, like when you attack someone you shouldn't have and they decide to pay a visit to your family he said darkly, understand. Masao nodded frantically, understanding the threat. Excellent. Naruto said before letting the frightened man go, now run along home now, he said, patting the side of the man's face. 
Basau then stumbled away before running as fast as he could. Naruto nodded, good man. He then noticed the other villagers still staring at him, afraid and confused. Naruto smiled and began tossing the stone he held up into the air and catching it over and over again. You know he began, catching the stone and gripping it firmly, I'm normally a very patient person, but when someone throws things at me, or spits at me, or assaults me in any way, well, it just makes me so mad. He said shouting the last word and shattering the stone in his hand, startling the crowd. The blonde opened his hand allowing the dust to slip from it, to be carried off by the breeze. I'm sorry he told the crowd, I am not usually one to lose my temper, but even I have limits he then became serious, let me explain something to you. These last four years, you all believed me to be dead. And you were partially correct in that. The crowd was confused by this. Naruto continued. The child you once used as a punching bag did die on that night he explained, the young man you see before you is quite different. No longer will I allow myself to be attacked or simply run away from you. If I am attacked, I will defend myself, using lethal force if I have to. The crowd became even more nervous from this. So the next time you consider assaulting me or stealing from me or defacing my home, remember this. He held out his scepter, and the crowd gasped as it transformed into the most insidious looking weapon they had ever laid eyes on. I have a very long memory Naruto promised them, I remember everyone who has ever raised a hand against me, and it wouldn't be too challenging to find out where each of you live has glare increased, where your families live. Do we understand each other? The terrified crowd understood the threat clearly. Leave him be or they and their families would suffer. Judging from your expressions, I'd say we understand each other perfectly he said, his scythe transforming back into a scepter, now if you'll excuse me, I have training to do. And, with that, he left, leaving a terrified crowd behind. Hopefully, that takes care of that Naruto thought. That was so hot, Kurama whispered. You say something. I said, well done. The fox answered quickly, blushing. Thank you Naruto said, oblivious to his partner being flustered. Any further thoughts were interrupted by a loud roar that tore through the village. Given the history of the village, it was unsurprising when several nearby villagers ran away, screaming in fear about the Kaiubi returning, though, if they paused to think, they would have realized that this roar was different from the great foxes. Naruto sighed, damn it Beatrice he whispered. She's getting upset again, Kurama informed him. I thought the wide open space and local wildlife around the manor would distract her he sighed again, guess not. You know the villagers are going to complain about this, right? Of course they will Naruto answered, in the meantime, I'm going to have to go home and have a long talk with her. You complain, but you know you love her, Kurama reminded him. Naruto smiled, yeah, I do. She's my little princess. And so, he headed home, readying himself for a long talk with his little girl. Uzumaki clan manor, later that evening. After returning home, Naruto had a long talk with Beatrice about keeping quiet and not drawing attention to herself. After he was certain he had gotten his message across, he gave her a belly rub and played fetch with her for a while. He then spent the rest of the afternoon training. He had just entered his home, shirtless and sweaty with Kurama secretly ogling him, ready to take a shower and relax for the rest of the evening, before turning in early for the test tomorrow. He was about to follow through with his plan when there was a knock on the door. I wonder who that is, Naruto asked aloud. He answered the door and was surprised to see a familiar cat mask purple-haired and waiting for him. The blonde smiled, Niko-chan, it's been a while he greeted cordially, how are you? He didn't know her real name, or even what she looked like behind her mask, but Niko was one of his Anbu guards as a child, and the one he was closest to. Where most of the others had been silent and standoffish, she had been kind and caring, in her own, professional way. Niko bowed in greeting, greetings Yuzumaki-san, I am glad to see you are alive and well she greeted, looking him over. The adorable child she had protected was all grown up now and had grown into a handsome young man. His muscular, sweat-covered chest drew her gaze, and she secretly blushed. If he were a little older, and she younger. But, no. She was already in love with someone else, someone who loved her as much as she loved him. Earth calling Nico Naruto said, noticing her staring at him, are you receiving, over. Nico blushed more, apologies Yuzumaki-san, you've just changed so much since last we met she answered, semi-truthfully. She also noticed that he had a few more scars since last time. Naruto grinned, should I tell your boyfriend you're leaving him for a younger man? He asked, knowing him since he was an Anbu guard for him too, one with a wolf mask, who was also kind to him. Nico rolled her eyes, in your dreams blondie she told him, taking a break from being formal. They both laughed briefly before Naruto spoke again, as happy as I am to see you again, I take it you aren't here just to visit. I'm afraid not, she informed him, the Hokage requests your presence in his office. Naruto sighed, I don't suppose he told you why, did he? The purple-haired Anbu shook her head, he did not. Naruto sighed again, okay then, let me shower and change, and I'll head out with you. Niko nodded, very well, she agreed. 
Naruto headed inside, showered, changed, and gathered harvest in its scepter form and returned. I'm ready, let's go. The masked woman nodded and the two left, with Naruto having an idea as to why he was being summoned. Chapter 4. Teamwork and how to fail at it, office of the Hokage, Irizen Saratobi was waiting patiently at his desk for the arrival of one Naruto Uzumaki. He wasn't looking forward to what was coming and, once Naruto heard what it was, neither would he. Speaking of which, said blonde had just appeared in his office, with the Anbu Niko at his side. She bowed. Okage-sama, I've brought Naruto Uzumaki to you, as ordered, she informed her leader. Thank you Niko, you may go, the Hokage told her. Niko bowed and prepared to leave, but was stopped when Naruto hugged her. It was good to see you again, Niko-chan. Give Wolf my regards he told her. Niko froze briefly at the unexpected contact, but soon returned the embrace. I'm glad you're back Blondie and I will. The two soon parted and Niko vanished in a swirl of leaves. She missed you a great deal the Sandane told him, she tried not to show it and keep herself professional, but she missed you. Naruto nodded, I know she did. I just wish I knew her name. It's her decision if she wants to tell you her name or not the old cage told him, it's not something I can order her to do. I know Naruto told him, then decided to return to business, so, you wanted to see me? He asked. Hiruza nodded, yes, though I wish the reason was different. It's the council, isn't it? The civilian and advisors. Naruto asked, they know I'm back and want answers. The Sandane nodded, along with the clan heads, but yes. I tried to put it off until your team test was over, but they insisted. Meaning they whined and complained until they got what they wanted, Naruto said. Hiruzen chuckled, and Didi then became serious, they likely want to sink their claws into you before you're officially recognized as a shinobi, where you'll be outside their jurisdiction. Outside of their control, you mean, Naruto pointed out. The old man nodded, they're waiting in the council chambers downstairs. I know you don't want to see them, but it's best to get this out of the way now, rather than let it build up. Naruto sighed, I know. Still, at least the clan heads will be there and they're not completely beast. Well, most of them anyway, Naruto said, remembering a certain Hyuga. Hiruzen nodded, well, let's go he said, standing up, I'll go in first and try to calm them, and you'll enter when I tell you to he commanded. He word being try Naruto said dryly, following the old cage. Hiruzen chuckled again. On the Hagakur council meeting chambers, a few minutes later, the civilians, advisors, and clan heads were waiting quietly for their Hokage to show up so that the meeting could start. They had heard some disturbing rumors about a certain blonde-haired whisker mark troublemaker returning from the dead and hoped to put these, hopefully false, rumors to rest. At least, the civilians and advisors hoped they were false. The clan heads with the exception of Hiyashi Hayuga, but that was for a different reason entirely were curious to find out if the rumors were true. Any questions would soon be answered. The silence was broken when Sandame Hokage himself walked into the room. You made us wait for Hiruzen, Kahari Yudatane informed her former teammate. I apologize if my running a hidden village is interfering with your busy schedule, Kaharu Hiruzen told her, sarcastically, and it's Hokage-sama to you and to everyone else in this room. Just because we were once teammates does not give you the right to call me by my first name during official proceedings, understood. The civilians and advisors frowned at this. Ever since the brat died, the formerly soft and kindly old Hokage had changed, becoming more forceful and stern. Gone was the old man who they could push around and walk over. The god of shinobi had stood before them ever since. Kaharu gritted her teeth, of course. I apologize. Hokage-sama. Hiruzen could tell she didn't mean it. He had known her and Himura Mitakado, another advisor, since childhood, and had been on the same team as them under Taburama Senju, the Nidame Hokage. They had changed after their mentor's death, as had he, but they still got along well enough. After the Kaiubi attack 15 years ago, however, they had changed even more. It was understandable, since they had lost their eldest children during the attack, Kaharu had lost her son and Himura his daughter. Since then, they had become more militant and filled with bitterness and hate, becoming more agreeable with Danzo Shimura, the third advisor on the council and Hiruzen's old rival. Even their remaining children, along with their grandchildren, Mogi and Yudin, had been unable to bring them back from their darkness. Hiruzen was no stranger to loss, as he had lost his wife during the attack and had hoped time would heal their wounds, just as it helped to heal his. But he had come to realize that they were beyond saving and that his friends were gone. If they wanted to be insubordinate to him, he would put them in their place, just as he would anyone else. Now then the Sandane continued, sitting down, I assume you have a good reason for calling this meeting. Amura spoke up then, we have heard some disturbing rumors, Hokage-sama he told his old teammate. What rumors? The old Hokage asked, even though he already knew. We've heard that the demon Brad is returned from the dead a civilian woman told him, avoiding using the term Brad so as to not break the Sandame's law, we simply want confirmation that these ridiculous rumors are just that. They are not, the sad aim told her, matter-of-factly. 
That caused the council except the clan heads, who had been told by their children about this to widen their eyes. Be excuse me, Hokage-sama. The woman asked, shocked. You heard me, he told the woman, Naruto Uzumaki is not dead and has returned to Konoha. There was a brief moment of silence. And then the civilians began shouting, arguing this claim, while the advisors were shocked into silence. Silence. Hiruzen shouted, ironically not wanting this to devolve into another shouting match. With respect, Hokage-sama Shibi Aburam, head of the Aburam clan, began, Naruto Uzumaki was declared dead four years ago. How is this possible? It's possible because Naruto Uzumaki did not die four years ago, Sanding told him. He had spent his spare time these last few years coming up with a reason as to why Naruto was alive when he inevitably returned. Time to see if his fabricated story was as good as he hoped. Naruto was assaulted and nearly killed in an attack led by the traitor Tomatsu Higurashi, four years ago he began. The civilians, along with Kaharu and Hamura, would argue the traitor part, but not out loud, and not to hear as in Suratobi. I had spent years severely punishing those who assaulted the boy, and I had hoped that would be enough to discourage further violence he frowned, but after the last attack, I decided that enough was enough and took matters into my own hands. How, Hokajama? The head of the Akamichi clan, Choza, asked. I decided that Naruto was no longer safe in Konoha and had him covertly taken away for his own safety, to return only when he was strong enough to protect himself. This caused an outrage amongst the civilians and advisors. With respect, Hokage-sama and a certain one-eyed and one-armed warhawk spoke, you had no right to remove the Kaiubi Jinchuriki from the village without the consent of the council. If he were a shinobi, I would agree with you, Danzo Hiruzen told his old rival, but, because he was just a civilian, you all had no say in how I should handle the situation. He isn't just a civilian, Hiruzen Hamura argued, he is the most powerful of the tailed beasts. As I told Kaharu, you will refer to me as Hokage-sama during official proceedings, Hamura, do I make myself clear? Hiruzen commanded, not going to tolerate any more insubordination. He only allowed Naruto to call him anything other than Hokage-sama during official business. Transparently, Hokage-sama Hamura muttered, intimidated by his old teammate's rise in temper. But he brings up a valid point, Hokage-sama Danzo intervened, though he could not even begin to describe how he hated calling him by that title, Jinchuriki are meant to serve as living weapons and as a deterrent from outside attacks. To remove ours without informing or consulting with us was reckless and irresponsible and could have left us vulnerable. The sand aim narrowed his eyes at his old rival, choose your words carefully Danzo he warned, there is no law stating that a civilian differs from a regular one in such a situation he told him, in addition, Naruto is the heir and sole survivor of the Uzumaki clan, one of our oldest allies, and, as a clan heir, I had every right to remove him from the village in order to keep him safe. But the boy is the son of Minato Namikas and Kishina Yuzumaki, two of Konoha's greatest heroes Tsuma Yuzuka, matriarch of the Inuzuka clan, informed her leader, what if a rival village had learned that he was no longer behind the village walls? The pup could have been put in danger. She said, with most of the other clan heads agreeing with her. It was a calculated risk here as an acquiesced, but I was confident that the risks were minimal, considering he was with Yureya the entire time. In order to make the lie more believable, he had contacted his old student about Naruto's disappearance. The Toad Sage didn't believe his former mentor about death at first, but trusted his sensei's word and, if asked, he would tell others that Naruto had been with him the last four years. This revelation piqued the interest of the council, the clan heads more than the others. So he was with Yureya-sama the last four years the head of the Nara clan, Shikaku Nara, said, if he was trained by a Sanin, then he must be quite powerful now. Hiruzen nodded, I would assume so, but you are more than welcome to ask him yourself, he told the lazy clan leader before turning towards the door, you can come in now Naruto. And, at these words, the door opened, and in walked the topic of their conversation. The council was surprised by how much the boy had changed and by how similar he looked to his father. Wow. Soom thought to herself, licking her lips if I were a little younger, I'd be all over that. She could feel the power coming off of the blonde. It was almost intoxicating. It practically screamed alpha male. The Ashi, likewise, could see the power flowing through the blonde teen with his biakugan, and it was staggering, something he did not like. Naruto looked around, gauging the reactions of everyone present, and was pleased at their shocked stares. He was less pleased by the glares and looks of hatred from the civilians and two of the advisors. He wasn't surprised by this or by the look of utter dislike from Hiashi Hayuga. The Hayuga clan head didn't hate Naruto, but he disliked him because he believed he made Hinata soft and weak, despite all evidence to the contrary. Naruto then noticed the third advisor staring at him as though he was a piece on a chessboard, trying to determine whether he was useful or not. Judging from his appearance, this was Danzo Shimura, the man Death had warned him about. So that's Danzo he thought to himself, ugly son of a bitch. Death was right to warn you about him, Kurama told him, there's something wrong with him. What do you mean? 
His aura is off, his partner told him, like there's more than one entity being stored within his body. Is he possessed? Naruto asked. I don't think so, the fox told him, I'm not quite sure what it is. We'll keep an eye on him, Naruto assured his friend. He then decided to say, I greet you, Hokage-sama, honorable clan heads plus Hyuga-san, he said, getting a snicker from Tsum, a few inward smirks from the other heads, and an even greater glare from Hiyashi. He then continued, representatives of the retired and disabled community he greeted the advisors, earning glares from all three of them. He then turned to the civilians, and, because I don't know of a kinder way to put this useless rabble. This earned cries of outrage from the civilians. How dare you insult us, you little brat. One man shouted. The how is quite simple, I open my mouth and speak Naruto explained, like I said, that was the kindest way I could describe the lot of you. I'm sure if I cared enough, I could learn your names but, considering you've never referred to me by anything other than demon brat, I figured this was fair. Okajama, are you going to let him speak to us like this? Another councilman asked. Absolutely here is an answered, after all, there is no rule stating one must be respectful to the non-shinobi members of the council. It is more like a suggestion. Naruto grinned at the Hokage before taking a seat as the civilian spluttered. All right then Naruto said, I'm here as requested by the Hokage. I assume you all have questions for me? He asked. I have a question, Tsum began, before grinning cheekily, did it hurt when you fell from heaven? This surprised the entire council and caused the Hokage to laugh lightly. Tsum. The Yamanaka clan head, Inoichi, scolded. The feral-looking woman shrugged, what? Thought I'd lighten the mood she told her fellow clan head. And here I thought that was my job, Naruto said, grinning at the female clan head, you are truly a woman after my own heart, Tsum said. Is that a proposition, pup? She asked, her grin never leaving her. Only if you want it to be, Naruto answered in a suggestive tone. Okajama, this conversation is entirely inappropriate. Kaharu argued. Here is and chuckled, indeed. Naruto. Tsum. If you would kindly stop. Fine, the Inuzuka matriarch conceded, I'll stop, she then winked at the blonde, for now. Naruto smirked and winked back. If we could continue, he ashy interrupted, we would all like to know where you've been, boy. Naruto ignored the insulting tone of that last word and answered, oh, I've been to a lot of places. Where exactly? Naruto shrugged, here, there. He trailed off. You would be wise not to test my patience, child, the Hyuga clan had warned, becoming angry. Considering I was with a Sanin, whose activities are highly classified, you can understand why I'm not being more precise, right Hokage-sama? He asked, knowing that he would play along. Oh yes, Sandane told him, it would be highly irresponsible of me to reveal Jiraiya's activities to those who do not need to hear it, seeing as how he is a spymaster, after all. The Ashi had to, grudgingly, accept that. Then perhaps you could tell us what you learned from Jiraiya-sama, Choza suggested. Naruto nodded, I can do that, Choza-san. I learned your basic shinobi abilities, you know, tree climbing, water walking, and the basic academy jutsu he informed them, I also learned a few wind and fire elemental jutsus. Wind and fire? Inoichi asked. Naruto nodded, my affinities, he explained before continuing, I also learned a little bit about my genkai. The bloodline? Hiashi asked, disbelief clear in his voice, you have a bloodline. This revelation surprised and intrigued the council. I'll ignore the insulting tone in your voice and answer. Yes I have a bloodline the blonde told them. What is it? A civilian asked. Naruto looked at the Hokage, who nodded. Naruto held out his hand and opened his fist, willing a blue flame to appear in his palm. It's called Dark Release Naruto told them, and it allows you to absorb your opponent's chakra and use it against them Shibi Aburam interrupted, gazing in shock at the flame. The other council members were confused, you know this bloodline, Shibasan. Shikaku asked. The Aburam clan head nodded, I do. During the last war, I fought a Kanoichi who wielded it he explained, we fought for several hours, neither of us able to drain the entirety of each other's chakra from the other. It ended in a draw when she fled after reinforcements arrived he paused for a moment, even though we seemed evenly matched, I am not certain the outcome would have ended in my victory. It was the longest and toughest fight of my life he confessed. This had the other council members stunned, this bloodline was strong enough to keep up with a future clan head. The civilians and advisors were beginning to form plans that were already doomed to fail. I too, have heard of this bloodline he ashy informed them, losing his glare and condescending tone, I had heard it was extinct. Sandame intervened, Jiraiya and I thought so too when he contacted me about it he lied, but it seems that Naruto has somehow inherited it. How, though? Inoichi asked, neither Minato nor Kashina ever unlocked such a bloodline. It probably came from my dad's side of the family Naruto answered, the Uzumaki clan history never showed anyone to have used it, and, considering my father was an orphan. He trailed off. Yureya and I both concur, Hiruzen told them. The Kinoichi I fought wielded her dark release powers through a brand on her palm Shibi noted, I have read that it is required in order to use. 
I'm not sure why I don't need a brand Naruto lied, maybe I have a different variant. Whatever the reason Danzo spoke, another bloodline is always welcome within Konoha. He then focused his greedy gaze on the blonde, provided, of course, it is bred properly. Excuse me? Naruto asked, closing his hand and snuffing out the flame, although he knew what the cripple meant. In order for your abilities to prosper in the village, you will have to sire multiple children across several different women Danzo explained, the candidates will have to be strong and loyal to Konoha, of course, and any offspring produced will have to be conditioned to be loyal as well. If you value your remaining limbs, hop along, I'd suggest you stop talking Naruto growled out. Danzo narrowed his eye, this is for the benefit of the village, boy he said, if this council wishes to take your offspring, only the Hokage can authorize such a thing here as an interrupted, glaring at his former rival, something I will not do. But Hokage-sama, we cannot let such a valuable prize escape us. Hamura argued. Sandane turned his glare onto his old teammate, causing the man to wither under it, taking children from one's parents or parents as barbaric and beneath us as a hidden village. We are not we do not abduct children in the middle of the night to turn them into weapons or breeding stock. The Ashi cringed at these words. I would also like to remind you all that abducting children to use as tools was outlawed decades ago, after the root program was shut down Hiruzen, then turned his gaze back to Danzo, so unless you wish to break a law that will result in immediate execution. He let the threat hang in the air for a moment. It was only a suggestion, Hokage-sama, Danzo remarked. Keep such suggestions out of your speech from now on the Sandane commanded. Of course, Hokage-sama, Danzo replied, cursing the old cage's weakness. Naruto gave the old man a look of gratitude. Still, a proper wife to help produce children would be advantageous to you, Uzumaki-sama one civilian man said, hating to call him by any honorific, but knowing that it would prove helpful, I have a daughter around your age. She isn't a Kanoichi, but comes from sound genes and is pleasing to look at, and if you... Not happening, Naruto interrupted, I won't marry someone I don't love, and I certainly won't let any greedy, soulless bastard take advantage of my position. The man became angry, why you, arrogant little. Any other questions? Naruto asked the council, eager to avoid any more idiotic attempts to win his favor. Did you learn the Rasengan from Jureya-sama? Tsum asked, sending him an approving look at how he was handling things. Naruto shook his head, no, he felt I wasn't ready for it yet he lied. That garnered some disappointment from the clan heads, but they understood why. What about summoning? Kaharu asked, eager to learn more about the brat's abilities. I did learn summoning, Naruto answered truthfully. Hiruzen was surprised by this, as Naruto had yet to mention to him that he could summon. You can summon the toads then? Shikaku asked. Did everyone surprise? Naruto shook his head. No, he told them, I found a different contract and learned to summon them instead. What contract? Hamura asked. Naruto turned towards the Hokage, may I demonstrate, Hokage-sama. Hiruzen nodded, if you wish, he answered, though he was eager to learn who or what Naruto had made a contract with. Naruto stood up and backed away, giving himself enough space to perform his summoning. Right then he said as he bit his thumb enough to draw blood, perform the necessary hand seals, and slammed his palm into the floor. Summoning Jutsu? He shouted. A puff of smoke covered the room, obstructing the view of everyone present. When it cleared, the council was surprised by what they saw. The creature they saw looked like an elephant. It had a trunk, but its ears were different. It was blue, with patches of white spread across its body, and had clawed paws, like a lion or tiger, and had small tusks jutting out of its jaw. The creature was currently sleeping, curled up into a bowl and lightly snoring. Naruto sighed, really? Still sleeping? What the fuck is that? Sue masked, voicing the question everyone was thinking. Except for a certain war hawk, who was inwardly sweating. It can be he thought, worried, how could he have found the contract for them? Please don't swear in front of him when he wakes up Naruto requested, his father doesn't like him to hear that kind of language. But to answer your question, that is a Baku he informed her, surprising everyone in the room. The Baku? Seriously? Shikaku asked, shocked, the monsters that devour dreams. That kind of Baku? Naruto nodded, the very same. Troublesome the lazy clan head mumbled. I thought the Baku were a myth Shivey said, still staring at the creature he had once thought only existed in children's stories. Though they're real, Naruto assured him, and this one's just a child, they get much bigger. How is it possible for him to sleep through the summoning process? Hiruzen asked, as he had learned from experience that the summoning jutsu was jarring for the summon and impossible to sleep through. Enma had violently reminded him of those times when he was summoned in the middle of the night. He's always asleep, it's his thing Naruto answered before tapping the snoring creature with his foot. Hey, Suman, wake up. The taper-like creature mumbled a bit, five more minutes he moaned. You can sleep later Naruto told him, get up, some people would like to meet you. Aku then opened his eyes, showing them to be orange and began to stand up. The creature was large before, but at full height, he was taller than Naruto. The creature stood up, stretched a bit, yawned, and then smacked his lips before staring at everyone. 
Hello he greeted in a tired yet childlike voice, I'm Suman. It's a pleasure to meet you. Some of the clan heads and the Hokage greeted the sleepy Baku, the others were too shocked to speak. I've never heard of the Baku summons before, Sandane noted. Suman yawned again, it's been centuries since we had a summoner the creature told him, Naruto found our contract and summoned my dad, and they made a deal, so that he could be our summoner, he then looked at said summoner, by the way, dad wants to know if you found anything yet. Naruto sighed sadly and shook his head, not yet, pal. Naruto told him, but tell him I'm still looking. Suman nodded and yawned again, can I go now? He asked, adorably. Naruto nodded, of course. Give your father my best he told him. Suma nodded again and disappeared in another puff of smoke. Well, that was. Shikaku began, searching for the right word, after several moments of silence. Troublesome. Chozo offered with a smirk. Interesting the lazy clan head corrected, not everything is troublesome, you know. Almost everything, but not everything. He mentioned that you made a deal with his dad, Tsum said. Naruto nodded, Suman's father is the chieftain, the boss, of the Baku he informed them, a few decades ago, his brother left their home, the dream realm, and never came back. He agreed to let me be the Baku summoner if I could find him and help him return home. Anzo was barely hiding his worry now. Of all the Baku he could have enslaved, he ended up with the boss summon's brother. This was bad, the Baku chieftain was a monster, a beast capable of reducing even the snake, toad, and slug bosses into a quivering mess. If he ever found out what he had done. Anzo calmed himself, there was no way he would find out. He just had to keep this quiet. Only he knew about the Baku he had at his disposal. The Baku boss would never find out. Adi hoped. Was there anything else? Naruto asked, I do have a team test in the morning. Team test? Kahara repeated, shocked, before turning towards the Sandane, you let him join a team? Without having been enrolled in the academy. Garazin nodded, I did. Jiraiya assured me that he was more than ready. With respect, you cannot alter the exams to accommodate one student, even if he was trained by a Sanin, Hokage-sama. Hamura argued. Actually, I can, Hamura Hiruzen told him, according to our laws, the acting Hokage has the right to place any of his or her shinobi or kinoichi on any team and bestow upon him or her any rank he or she chooses, he then turned his gaze to the civilians, who were about to argue, without any input from the council, he told them sternly, silencing them. This is a special circumstance Danzo began to speak only to be interrupted by Naruto. If you're referring to the Kaiubi, spare me the secrecy, I already know, the blonde told them. This shocked them more than any other revelation thus far. He knew. So you know what you are then? One councilman asked maliciously. Councilman Sato, I suggest you choose your next words very carefully, Sandane warned, as he was dangerously close to breaking his law. Surprisingly, the man was unafraid of his leader. Of course I do, Naruto replied, I am a container of the Kaiubi no Kitsune, he told them. We do not consider you the container Sato growled out. Councilman. Hiruzen warned. And I do not consider you or the other members of the civilian council at all Naruto informed him simply, angering said branch of the council, I know that you consider me to be a demon he scoffed, you fools have no idea what a demon even is. Before he could continue, something strange happened. Everything became hazy as images began to appear before his eyes. In them, a man was holding the crucifix in his hand, walking past a crowd of people, the artifact shining brightly. Most of the people the man passed paid no heed to the holy relic. Then, he reached a man who began to spasm in pain, violently flinching from the light. The man focused the crucifix's power on the twitching man, its light began to shine even brighter. The victim was now shaking like he was being electrocuted. After a few more seconds of this, something burst from within the victim's body. The demon. The crucifix then unleashed an intense beam of light that engulfed the creature, eventually reducing it to ash. Naruto's vision then cleared. He wondered what had just happened when he remembered what death told him about the crucifix when he asked how to use it. In time, the crucifix will show you. He understood now, the holy relic had shown him how to use one of its abilities. The power to reveal the possessed. Naruto. Sande masked, concerned, are you alright? Naruto knew what to do. But I can show you he told the council, finishing his earlier statement. The council stiffened. Are you threatening us, boy? One councilman asked, angry, yet afraid. No, Naruto said before pulling out the crucifix. The council were in awe at the beauty of the cross the blonde was holding. All except one, whose eyes widened in terror and who shuddered in fear when they saw it. Naruto knew that the council specifically, the advisor and civilian sides was corrupt and greedy, prime targets for demonic possession. It wasn't too outlandish to believe that one, or more, had sold their souls for wealth or power. That was why the crucifix revealed this power to him, a demon was present in this room. Wotsum gasped, what's that? She asked. Something that will show you the truth, Naruto told her. He channeled his power into the relic, and it began to shine. He then began to circle the room, shining the light at everyone he walked past. 
What are you doing? Hiyashi demanded. Naruto. The Sandane questioned. Just trust me, okay old man. Please. Hiruzen was still for a moment and then nodded. Naruto continued to circle the room. Some members of the council flinched slightly, mostly the greedy and sinful the civilians and advisors who were affected by the crucifix's holy light. Others merely shielded their eyes from the light, unaffected otherwise by its power the clan heads. I know you're here Naruto spoke aloud, confusing the council, you know who I am, what I am. What is this? What it can do he said, save yourself the trouble and reveal yourself. Show them how you've been hiding. He then came to Sato, who was trying, and miserably failing, to hide his pain. Right under their noses he finished before grabbing the man by his throat. We have a winner. Naruto exclaimed, throwing the council member towards the center of the room. At that moment, Anbu that were previously hidden appeared and prepared to defend the man in the center of the room. Stand down. The Anbu froze, confused by their Hokage's orders. Hokage-sama, the D-boy is attacking an innocent man. One guard argued. This is no man, Naruto said calmly. Hokage-sama, I said stand down. Sandame ordered, before turning to Naruto, Naruto, are you certain that he's? Naruto nodded. Then proceed. The council and guards were stunned by this, their leader was letting this monster assault a member of the Kanoha village council. Naruto then approached the fallen man who was on his hands and knees, desperately trying to get away. You can no longer hide, Hellspin Naruto told him, reveal yourself. He shouted, shining even more light on his victim. Sato shook and cried out in agony as the holy light burned him. Finally, he could take no more and began to reveal his true form. Many members of the council screamed as a monster seemed to burst through their fellow's body. After a few seconds the monster was fully revealed. There, curled up into a ball, was a horned, human-shaped creature. The guardian demon, still covered in tatters of human skin. The clan heads, Anbu and Hokage stood up, preparing for battle, while the advisors and civilians were moving back as far as they could. And here. You. Our Naruto said, allowing the light to dim so that the creature could be seen in its entirety, on display like the pet you are. The demon growled and then lunged forward, desiring to tear the meddlesome human to shreds. Another blast of light from the crucifix sent the demon back to the floor, crying out in pain. That is what a demon looks like Naruto told the council, you call me a demon, while the true monster has been hiding among you in plain sight. You. The guardian growled out in a deep, demonic voice, still in pain, you ruined everything. He snarled, managing to get to his knees. You monster. One councilwoman shouted at Naruto, you used your demonic powers to turn him into an abomination. She accused. The demon on the floor let out a laugh. How is it that the creator favors you worthless gullible beasts? He asked, how are you his chosen? What the fuck is that thing? Tsum cried out, ready to sink her claws and fangs into it at any time. The demon Naruto answered, one that is hidden inside the skin of a foolish man, he then turned his gaze back to the demon, tell me your name. Never. Naruto increased the amount of light, causing the demon to scream in agony. Tell me. Glatch. The creature cried out, unable to handle its pain, I am. Glatch. The light died down, and Glatch fell to his hands and knees, gasping in pain. How long have you been in possession of Sato's soul? Naruto demanded. Glatch merely glared at his tormentor. How long? Naruto demanded as he sent another wave of agony through the crucifix, causing Glatch to cry out in pain. The pain only lasted a few seconds, but it was enough. After it stopped, he answered, nearly fifteen of your years he snarled out. What did you offer him in exchange for his soul? Latch laughed, surprising the crowd. He was so weak. The demon began, he lost no one in the attack. All he lost was money. His businesses were destroyed and he was left penniless, he then smiled evilly up at the reaper that had exposed him, he sold his soul to me for money, to return what he had lost. He then laughed more, terrifying the other civilians, who he then turned his attention towards. And you, being the simple animals you are, didn't notice a thing. You didn't notice how he had become wealthier after the attack, how he had changed, how I took over his body. You conned a fool out of his soul, Naruto accused. I followed my end of the bargain to the letter. Glatch snarled, angry that he was being accused of breaking his word. He then smirked, I gave him his money. I just didn't let him enjoy it. You. You've been hiding among us for all these years. Kaharu asked, fighting through her fear, attending these meetings. Learning our secrets. Latch grinned, it seems even animals can learn he noted, laughing, I have, and not even your greatest warrior had any idea he scoffed at the hokage pathetic decrepit fool. Watch your mouth monster. One Anbu demanded, we are the superior species, not you. Latch let out a long laugh, his most terrifying yet. You? Superior? He laughed again, pathetic fleshling, my kind is the apex species. We are not divided, fickle, and soft like you. We are strong, unending, and united in purpose. Humanity is merely a mistake. A broken, flawed beast the creator refuses to put out of its misery. He told the humans, you may rule this realm, but that will not last forever. 
One day, our master will escape his prison and you will all be exterminated like the vermin you are. We will drown you in a sea of blood and entrails. We will rule creation while your souls suffer in our fiery realm for all eternity. Enough. Naruto poured his power into the crucifix, Glatch screaming out in agony, a sound that would haunt the nightmares of many in attendance. After a few seconds, the demon disintegrated, leaving only dust behind. Good riddance, Naruto said as placed the crucifix back into his coat. He turned to face the Hokage, I think we're done here. Here is an overcame his shock and nodded, yes, you may leave. Naruto bowed and left. Sandane then looked upon the council with his most serious gaze. What just occurred here is an S-rank secret he told them, if any detail of what happened here is ever spoken aloud outside this room, the person who spoke will be executed where they stand, am I understood? The council nodded. Good, then you are all dismissed. The council dispersed, many seeking to return home to their loved ones, eager to embrace their spouses and children, to make sure they're safe. After what had happened tonight, they weren't so sure about the amount of protection the village's walls and shinobi offered anymore. The next day, third training ground, 8.30 a.m. Despite the day debacle that occurred last night, Naruto was focused entirely on the test that would be happening hopefully within the next hour. Arriving in the clearing of the third training ground, Naruto saw that his teammates were already there, waiting. Sakura saw him and immediately became irritated. You're late. She shouted. Not really Naruto told her, I told you to show up at 9, after all. Akashi sensei told us to be here at 7. He was two hours late yesterday, Naruto reminded her, and I have it on good authority that he always shows up at least two hours late to everything. Sakura scoffed, whatever, just don't be late again, I don't want to screw up because of you Sakura told him. I promise, I won't be later than Kakashi sensei he promised her. Sakura growled and returned to pestering Sasuke. Naruto decided to enter his mindscape and talk to Kurama while they waited. He sat down in a meditation stance and closed his eyes. Naruto's mindscape. Entering the vast open field of his mind, Naruto quickly found his partner, shrunken to the size of a grown man, laying down beneath a tree. Hey Kurama he greeted. Said Fox looked up and grinned, hey kid, what's up? Naruto sat down next to his friend, I'm here to collect on our bed he answered. Kurama remembered, you mean where I have to answer a question of yours, truthfully. No matter the consequences, Naruto reminded me. Kurama nodded, okay, what do you want to know? What are you hiding from me? He asked, deciding to be direct. Kurama's eyes widened, w what? You heard me, Naruto told him, you've been shying away from certain topics, avoiding talking to me sometimes, he pointed out, I want to know why. I, uh, I you. Kurama stuttered. She couldn't tell him. His rejection would be too painful. She couldn't tell him that she was in love with him. Yes, the mighty Kaiubi no Yoko was in love with her mortal container, the most bizarre case of Stockholm Syndrome of all time. She hated him at first, though it was irrational, as she hated being caged and was still under the influence of that one Idacha. After death had cleared her mind and forced the two to get along, she saw him differently. He was kind, caring, brave, funny, and strong. He had every reason to hate her, but he didn't. He had such a good heart and genuinely wanted to be her friend. It took her some time, but she gave in and they became friends. They grew closer, sharing stories and secrets, she even told him her name. Before she knew it, she was in love. Over millennia of life and she fell in love for the first time only a few years ago. She understood why Hinata loved him. It was hard not to. Any girl would, once they got to know him. She wanted to tell him, to let him know how much she loved him. But how could she? How could she when she knew his rejection of her was assured? She couldn't handle that kind of pain, she was certain it would kill her. She had decided that she could never tell him how she felt, she would have to watch as he moved on, met a nice girl, got married, and had kids. It would be painful, but as long as he was happy, so was she. Now, however, he was demanding answers. She couldn't tell him the reason. But there was another reason that she could use as an excuse. I, I hate lying to you she confessed, but I wasn't sure how you would react. Naruto was confused, react to what? He asked. Karama was still, avoiding his gaze. Karama, come on, you know you can tell me anything he assured his friend. Karama looked up at him. She sighed. Please don't hate me. Why would I hate you? He asked, now extremely confused. Karama stood up and walked a few feet away from him. She sighed. And began to glow. Naruto raised his hand and shielded his eyes from the light. When the light stopped, he lowered his hand. And his jaw dropped. Instead of a giant fox, there stood a woman. The most beautiful woman he had ever seen in his life. She was wearing a red kimono with orange flame patterns that hugged her body nice and tight, accentuating her hurtless figure, her large firm breasts, narrow waist, curvy hips, gorgeous rear, and long legs that seemed to stretch endlessly. She had crimson hair that reached down to her waist. Her skin was smooth and flawless. She had a heart-shaped face and slitted crimson eyes that only served to make her more exotic. Her cheeks had the same whisker marks he did. 
He never thought such a beauty could exist. It was as though she had been carved from perfection. Surprisingly, his first thought was how his friend's love of sweets now suddenly made sense. Karama noticed he was practically drooling at her appearance and blushed. Maybe it wasn't so hopeless after all. Um. Surprise. She said nervously, now in a feminine voice that felt like honey to Naruto's ears. It took her blonde partner a few minutes to find his voice. Why you're a woman? He asked. Karama nodded, yes, she told him, I am. But. But you look. Human. He pointed out, how. Old Biju can take a human form she explained, my siblings prefer not to but. I kind of like it. She confessed. Me too, Naruto said without thinking, before covering his mouth when he realized what he just said. Karama blushed even more at this and smirked. She walked over to him, adding a sensual sway to her hips as she went. He tried backing away from her but ended up trapped between her and the tree behind him. She pressed herself up against him and leaned into him, her hot breath grazing his skin, giving him goosebumps and sending shivers down his spine. Do you like my human form Naruto-kun? She whispered as sensually as she could into his ear, adding extra emphasis to the suffix. Naruto's blush was atomic. It was a miracle he was able to find his voice. Why why yes he answered honestly. Hirama then backed away and gave him a foxy grin, good she said. It took the blonde a moment to recover, damn it Karama, don't tease me like that. She giggled, oh, but it's so fun to tease. The two laughed for a moment. Why didn't you tell me? He asked after they stopped. Karama sighed, I was embarrassed she told him, I mean, you were the container for a member of the opposite sex. I thought that might weird you out. I wanted to tell you, but I ended up putting it off over and over again, until it seemed like it would be wrong to let you know after so long she sighed, that and. And. And I thought you wouldn't accept me, she confessed. After taking a moment to process this, Naruto spoke. Karama, there's nothing you could say or do that would make me hate you or turn my back on you he told her, you're my friend and I always stick by my friends, no matter what. Karama was happy that he had accepted her, so. You'll forgive me? She asked hopefully. On a few conditions he said, grinning cheekily. Conditions. Naruto nodded, first, you speak to me using the voice of your human form from now on. Karama raised an eyebrow, why? Naruto's grin widened, because the beautiful voice of a goddess like yourself will serve as an excellent motivator for me. Said goddess blushed at the compliment and giggled, nodding. Second, he continued, I will call you Kaiyu-chan or Kurahome from now on. Karama blushed again and nodded. And finally, we hug it out, Naruto finished. She nodded a third time and the two embraced. She was shorter than him, the top of her head reaching his chin, but it allowed her to press her face up against his chest and listen to his strong heartbeat. She felt content, allowing his heat to warm her, his heartbeat to soothe her. She had to stop herself from purring. Naruto, meanwhile, was also pleased with the embrace, but his hormones were starting to take control. He wanted so badly to feel her soft skin, to kiss her perfect lips, to see her without her kimono on in her flawless entirety. The two reluctantly separated. Thank you for accepting me, she told him. He smiled warmly, you're welcome Kaiyu-chan he replied, causing her to blush once more. He was about to leave when an idea occurred to him. One last thing he said before snapping his fingers. A small table appeared with a large cake on top of it. Karama gasped, is. Is that. Red velvet cake with cream cheese icing he told her, enjoy. She squealed with joy and hugged him tightly. Thank you, thank you, thank you. She said very rapidly before giving him a peck on the cheek and rushing to her prize. Naruto blushed and softly touched the place where her lips had come into contact with his skin. He smiled and left his mindscape. Karama, meanwhile, was enjoying her cake but couldn't help but think she'd received an even greater gift. Her love had accepted her human form and was now extremely attracted to her. Maybe there was hope for the two of them yet. Third training ground, 9 a.m., Naruto had opened his eyes just as Kakashi arrived. Yo, he greeted. You're late. Sakura shouted exactly the same way she did to her blonde teammate. Sorry, I got lost on the road of life. There was a brief silence. The fuck kind of excuse is that? Naruto thought. Both Sakura and Sasuke were equally as stunned by the lameness of their sensei's excuse. Takashi cleared his throat, now then he began, pulling out two bells, each one tied to a string let's get started. Notice the two bells I'm carrying? He asked. When his prospective students nodded, he continued, good. Now, the goal of your test is simple, you have until noon to steal these bells from me. Whoever gets a bell passes the test and becomes a genin. Simple. Sakura decided to speak again, but sensei, there are only two bells. Doesn't that mean one of us will fail no matter what? She asked. Right you are Sakura. Whoever doesn't get a bell goes back to the academy. This made Sakura and Sasuke nervous. Akashi shrugged, of course, there's always the likely chance that none of you will get a bell he told them, after all, the genin test has a 66% failure rate. Sakura's eyes widened, 66%. She whispered. 
Bakashi nodded, only three teams at most will pass and become genin, everyone else goes back to school. Naruto, meanwhile, saw right through Kakashi's ruse and was already developing a plan. A three-man team? Bullshit he thought, he wants us to work together, but made it seem as though only two can pass at most, ensuring we all are more likely to work apart. It's so obvious, we only stand any kind of chance if we work as one. Told you you'd see through it, Kurama said before returning to her cake. Do more things Kakashi said, continuing, first, whoever doesn't get a bell or performs the poorest during the test will be tied to that post he pointed to said post and won't receive any lunch. And that's the reason why he told us not to eat anything Naruto thought. Judging from the looks on his teammates' faces, he determined that they had ignored his advice on eating breakfast. He, on the other hand, had eaten and was good to go. And second, when you try to steal a bell from me, come at me with the intent to kill, or you will fail. This got more wide eyes from Sasuke and Sakura. Naruto, on the other hand, was already prepared to do so. Any questions? He asked. When no one answered, he continued, all right then. Begin. With that, Sasuke and Sakura leapt into the nearby foliage and disappeared from view. Akashi then took out his orange book and began to read, shocking Sasuke and Sakura. He stood out in the open, his nose in a book, making himself seem to be an open target. Naruto knew better. Akashi noticed something and looked up, seeing that Naruto hadn't moved from his spot. Um, aren't you supposed to hide? Kakashi asked. Naruto shrugged, probably, but this is more fun, he said with a feral grin. What the hell is the dope doing? Sasuke thought. Wait. He's not actually going to fight him. Is he? Sakura thought. Whatever you say, Blondie, Kakashi said, returning to his book. Naruto smirked and held out his scepter. In a swirl of dark energy, it transformed into the most evil-looking scythe anyone had ever laid eyes on. This got Kakashi's attention, and his visible eye widened briefly. Where did he get that? Sasuke thought, fantasizing about killing a certain someone with that weapon. Oh Sakura thought. Awesome inner Sakura commented. Bakashi stared at the weapon, well he said, that's. Different. He was about to return to his book when he sensed something and dodged the two kunai that were thrown at him. Before he could do anything else, Naruto was upon him, swinging his scythe. It was clear to him that he wasn't going to be able to read and fight at the same time with this one. Bakashi dodged the first few swings, but knew he couldn't keep it up forever. This kid was fast. Forgive me my precious. He thought as he quickly tossed his beloved novel aside and pulled out a kunai, barely blocking the overhead strike of the massive blade. The two were pushing against each other, but it was clear that Naruto was physically stronger, thanks to his reaper-enhanced strength. Holy damn he's strong. The Cyclopean thought, struggling not to be forced to his knees by the blonde Jinchuriki's strength. Seeing that he wasn't going to be able to hold off the blonde indefinitely, Kakashi moved to the side, breaking the standoff, before jumping back from another swing. I see you're taking my attack to kill advice to Hardy noted. I'm a good listener. Naruto told him before swinging again. Kakashi deflected one swing and dodged another. He moved back, out of the way of yet another swing, only to get a small cut on his flak jacket when the blade swung forward, transforming into a spear. When I wished to be Naruto finished as he then continued to press his attack. He's actually trying to kill Kakashi-sensei. Sakura thought in shock as she watched the battle. That is both hot and scary at the same time. Her inner self commented. Bakashi realized that fighting up close was too risky, so he pulled back further, out of the blade's reach. Trying to stay out of Harvest's reach, are you? Naruto asked. He chuckled, good plan. Too bad it won't work. Bakashi's eyes widened as the scythe became a spear once more and thrust outward, extending the weapon's reach by an incredible distance. Okay, so now it can stretch Kakashi thought as he ducked under the blade. He didn't notice that that blade went past him and embedded itself in a tree behind him. Naruto then retracted the blade, not pulling it back towards himself, but pulling him towards the anchor point, the tree. Bakashi was taken by surprise as Naruto was rapidly pulled towards him, his legs stretched forward in a kick, which he was caught in the chest by. The blow knocked the wind out of him and launched him through the forest where he collided with another tree. He hit him. Sakura marveled, he actually hit him. That was so cool. Naruto ripped his blade from the tree and retracted it. He then waited. That was too easy he thought. Why is he just standing there? Why isn't he going after the bells? Sasuke wondered. Naruto detected movement behind him and turned around, blocking a strike from Kakashi's kunai. Shadow clone? Naruto asked. Shadow clone the Cyclops answered. He replaced himself with a clone Sakura realized, and somehow Naruto knew about it. That's why he didn't follow after him. Returning to the fight, Kakashi flipped back from another swing from the side. You did well, he complimented his student hopeful, using your weapon as an unorthodox means to close the gap and hit my clone. But it won't happen again. Naruto smirked, not while you're able to move around, it won't he told him. He then held out his hand and lifted it upwards, clenching it into a fist, which then started to glow with a dark energy. 
Suddenly, something burst out of the ground around Kakashi's feet. Hands. Rotting, grasping hands. The hands of the undead. Rotting fingers grabbed onto Kakashi's feet and legs, holding him in place. Reaper art. Grasping hands of the dead Naruto said, quietly. Kakashi's eye widened so much that it looked like it was going to fall out of his head. What kind of jutsu is this? He thought, and how did he use it without hand signs? He struggled against the undead hands pinning him down, but he couldn't shake them off. Damn it, I can't move. Are those zombie arms Sakura thought, disturbed and terrified by the jutsu? I need to learn that jutsu Sasuke thought. Such a move would be useful for rendering a foe helpless in a fight. Seeing his foe was trapped, Naruto cocked his arm back and threw harvest to Kakashi after transforming it into its spear form. Kakashi was helpless as the scythe moved towards him. The sound of a blade piercing flesh filled the training ground as the scythe embedded itself in Kakashi Haddock's chest. Sakura gasped in horror. Sasuke's eyes widened in total surprise. Kakashi's body fell to the ground, lifeless. Odd and then disappeared in a burst of smoke, a log taking its place. Naruto smirked, heh, substitution. You are goody complimented, as he turned around and saw Kakashi standing there, completely unharmed. Kakashi eyes smile, thank you, so are you. Naruto smiled back, then got into a tajutsu stance, how about we change things up a bit? Tajutsu? He asked, then shrugged, works for me he said, getting into a stance of his own. The two stared each other down for a moment before Naruto rushed forward, engaging his superior in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Thank God Sakura sighed, I thought Naruto killed Sensei for a minute there. Good thing he didn't a boy said from behind her. Sakura spun around and nearly screamed but was stopped when a hand covered her mouth. The hand belonged to Naruto. SHH he shushed her, keep your voice down, he then lowered his hand to let her speak. Naruto. How are you here? She asked as she saw another Naruto and her Sensei battling in the clearing. I'm a clone, genius he informed her, and I need your help. Sakura was surprised by this, my help. With what? Stealing the bells. What? But Naruto's doing just fine on his own. Sakura told the clone. The clone shook his head, it might look that way now, but the boss isn't going to win this. He's not even trying to take the bells right now, he's only fighting to distract Kakashi. Why? They asked. Because the point of the test is teamwork he told her, we're supposed to work together to steal the bells, that's the only way we can win against someone with Kakashi's experience. But. But there are only two bells Sakura pointed out, one of us is supposed to fail. Think damn it. Clone Naruto told her, when was the last time you saw a three-man team? He wants us to think only two of us can pass, so that we're more reluctant to work together. We're supposed to take the risk and aid each other no matter what. That's the point of the test. Sakura considered this for a moment. It was true that she had never heard of a team with two genin, and a, and it made sense that they had to work together against someone who was years ahead of them. But, on the other hand, they might have changed the rules to allow a three-man team without telling them. There were who took a single genin as an apprentice in the past, maybe this was similar, only it involved the two strongest, with the weakest being left behind. Sakura knew that she was weaker than Sasuke and Naruto, that if she didn't play her cards right, it would be her two male teammates that took the bells and passed the test, while she failed. She needed help in order to get a bell, and aiding Naruto could allow her to grab one. But then it was likely that Naruto would also get a bell, leaving her beloved Sasuke in the dust, where he would hate her for taking his spot and aiding the dead last instead of him, the rookie of the year. No, she couldn't risk that. She needed to help Sasuke so that the two of them could pass and be together. True love always wins, right? I can't take the risk that you might be wrong, he told the blonde clone, if I help you and get a bell and then you get one and you're wrong, then Sasuke-kun will fail and hate me. Stop thinking like a fangirl. The clone told her, use that big brain of yours, you know I'm right. Sakura shook her head, I'm not taking that risk. I'm going to find Sasuke-kun and help him get a bell. Listen to me. No, you listen Sakura hissed, I'm not going to let some dead last loser stand between me and my Sasuke-kun, so go away. The clone growled, fine, failed then he said angrily, but don't come crying to the boss when you find out that he was right. With that, the clone burst into smoke and vanished. You are such a bitch inner Sakura told her counterpart with contempt, you should have listened to him. Sakura ignored that and started heading deeper into the woods, looking for her crush. Nearby, the same scene was being repeated by Sasuke and another clone. If you attack him alone, you are going to fail the clone told the broody egomaniac, for what seemed like the hundredth time, the only way we'll get even a single bell is if we work together. I told you before, I am not going to let you or that pink bitch hold me back Sasuke told him, again, I'm an Achiha, an elite. I don't need anyone's help, especially not from the dead last, so get lost. The clone glared at the idiotic clan heir and then shrugged. Fine, he conceded, the boss will look forward to watching you fail. The clone then disappeared in a puff of smoke. I won't fail Sasuke thought as he began to move to a better position, I'm an Achiha, success is in my blood. 
Back in the clearing, the real Naruto had just been thrown by Kakashi, but managed to turn the impact into a roll, limiting the damage. Damn it where the hell are they Naruto thought, wondering what was taking his clone so long to rally his teammates. He was about to charge Kakashi again when the memories of his shadow clones returned to him. He stopped and processed what had happened. Kakashi, meanwhile, was awaiting another attack from Naruto when the blonde stopped. Oh the whisker mark teen said, well, that's. Disappointing he sighed, but not entirely unexpected. He then stood up straight and held out his arm towards Harvest. The sentient weapon twitched briefly before flying back to its master's hand. Kakashi was surprised by this and was preparing for the blonde's attack. But it didn't come. Instead, Naruto sheathed his weapon which returned to its eyed form behind his back and walked over to a nearby boulder and sat down on top of it. Uh. Kakashi was confused. Was this some kind of strategy? You can relax, Scarecrow, Naruto told him, our fight's over. Wait, what? Kakashi ignored the nickname and spoke, what is over? He asked. Over as in finished, done, ended, through. Do I really need to spell it out for you? Naruto asked bitterly. Why? The Cyclops asked, you were doing well. But that wasn't the point was it? He asked, the point was to work as a team, something Banshee and Broody refused to do. Kakashi was shocked but also pleased that Naruto figured out the true meaning behind the test, when did you figure it out? He asked. The moment you told us that only two of us could pass, Naruto answered, come on, since when do genin teams have two genin and a sensei? It's always three genin and a sensei. Besides, there was no way any of us could take you on alone. Why do you think Sasuke and Sakura won't help you? Naruto sighed, remember the two kunai I threw at you when our fight started. Kakashi nodded. Those were transformed shadow clones he explained, I wasn't trying to hit you with them, I was sending them into the forest to track down those two so we could form a plan to take the bells while you were busy fighting me. You were distracting me Kakashi realized, you were keeping me busy so that the others could flank me. Naruto nodded, I thought the plan was sound, but Sakura would rather help her true love, well Sasuke is too arrogant to accept any help at all. My clones kept trying to explain the truth behind the test, but they wouldn't listen he sighed again, I stopped fighting you because my clones dispersed and sent me their memories. Since they refused to help, we've already failed. I didn't see the point in continuing fighting anymore. Akashi was impressed with Naruto's strategy, but disappointed with the other team members. So. You're not going to try to help them? He asked. If I tried to help them and there was no plan, we would just get in each other's way, Naruto explained, that would be just as useless as attacking you alone. Kakashi sighed, I had hoped one of you would look underneath and help each other, but I didn't think it would end like this. It wasn't all for nothing, Naruto pointed out, smiling at the silver-haired man, I still got to have a good fight, even if I was outmatched. Kakashi smiled back, it was fun while it lasted, wasn't it? Naruto nodded. You know that if they don't figure it out, all three of you are going back to the academy, right? Kakashi asked, retrieving his book. Doesn't matter, Naruto told him, I still have my day job. Yes, you did say something about liking your job during the introductions. You never did explain what that job was, though Kakashi pointed out. Naruto chuckled, you wouldn't believe me if I told you. And, so, Naruto spent the next couple of hours chatting with Kakashi, with only two events of note happening. The first was when the silver-haired vanished briefly, before a shrill, terrified scream was heard and he returned. Sakura, I take it? Naruto asked. Kakashi nodded. What did you do to her? Just used a simple, he explained, she fainted. Let me guess, you showed her Sasuke dying violently, right? Yep. Things were quiet for a while after that, Kakashi still reading while Naruto used a pocket wet stone on harvest. Not that it needed it of course, the sentient weapon was supernaturally sharp and could never dull, but harvest liked it when the wheat stone was used on it. It was like a relaxing massage. Things got a little more interesting during the second event when Sasuke tried his hand at taking a bell. He put up a better fight than either Naruto or Kakashi expected, forcing them to put his book away and actually managing to graze one of the bells. Sasuke managed to launch a mildly impressive fire release. Great fireball technique at his foe, but Kakashi won by using earth release. Double suicide decapitation technique to drag the spoiled brat's body underground, leaving only his head visible, trapping him. The last loyal Ichiha was humiliated by this. He couldn't understand how he, an elite member of the Achiha clan, was beaten so easily while the dead last could hold his own. Speaking of the dead last, he glared at Naruto when he laughed at him lightly. Hey, if he was going to ignore sound advice and make a complete fool out of himself, he was going to get laughed at. He laughed even harder when Sakura turned up, saw Sasuke, thought he was decapitated, and fainted again. It was after this that the timer rang. Time's up Kakashi told the two conscious genin hopefuls. He picked up Sakura and began carrying her to the post. Naruto, would you mind helping Sasuke while I take care of Sakura? He asked with another eye smile. 
Naruto nodded and used his enhanced strength to pull Sasuke up from the ground. By his head. Which hurt a lot. Stop whining Naruto told his male teammate who had cried out in pain when he had been pulled up. The two teammates walked over to the post where Kakashi was busy tying up a still unconscious Akura. No surprise there, she never even tried to get a bell. Kakashi had just finished up and turned to face them. Both of you sit down, he ordered, one on either side of her. The two teens did so. Good, now we'll wait for Sakura to wake up so we can continue. At these words, they began to stir and wake. Nice of you to join us Naruto said sarcastically, did you have a nice nap? Sakura glared at him and tried to move, only to find that she was bound. Why am I tied up? Sakura demanded to know, loudly. Because you performed the least effectively during the test Kakashi answered her, as I said earlier, anyone who doesn't get a bell or performs the poorest gets tied to the post without lunch. Sakura remembered and lowered her head to hide her shame, I didn't do that badly. Did I? She asked mumbled. You fainted twice, once from a simple and the second when you saw Broody buried up to his neck and thought he'd been decapitated, Naruto reminded her, ignoring Sasuke's glare at the nickname. Sakura blushed in embarrassment and continued to stare at her feet. Anyway Kakashi interrupted, I'd like to go over your performance during the test. We're going back to the academy, aren't we? Sakura asked in a depressed tone. Actually, only Naruto is going back to the academy, Kakashi informed them. Naruto showed no emotion, but Sakura became giddy and Sasuke smirked arrogantly. Wait Sakura began, does that mean Sasuke-kun and I are completely hopeless, Kakashi interrupted. The two genin in question were shocked by this. W what? Sakura asked, hoping she had misheard him. You two are completely hopeless, he informed them, becoming very serious. I've had many teams fail this test, but I have never, ever, seen someone fail as badly as you two did. I touched one of the bells. Sasuke argued, a knee-jerk reaction to having his pride hurt and his skill questioned, that's a form of success, the Dobe and Sakura didn't even come close. The Kashi sighed in frustration, getting the bells wasn't the point. This surprised them, what? Wait. But you said. What was the point, then? Sakura spluttered and demanded. To work together. As a team Naruto told them, glaring, like I said before. Stay out of this D Sasuke began, but was interrupted by Kakashi. He's right, Kakashi said, shocking them. Naruto was right. Sakura thought, stunned. Told you we should have listened to him. Inner Sakura shouted. Sasuke, meanwhile, was silently fuming at being proven wrong. Kakashi continued, the teams I tested before failed because they failed to look underneath the underneath and worked individually instead of together. But you two learned the truth about the test and completely ignored it. You had the potential to pass the test and become a true team, but you decided to ignore common sense. He sighed and continued, it would be irresponsible of me to simply send you back to the academy to try again, when it is clear that you two aren't shinobi material. Sasuke was about to enter a rage-filled tantrum about how he couldn't speak to him that way when Kakashi continued. Because of your absolutely abysmal failure, I'm having the two of you barred from ever becoming ninja. Sasuke and Sakura's eyes widened considerably, and their expressions showed absolute horror and fear. Even Naruto was surprised by this. That's a little harsh, he thought. What? Sakura cried. You can't do this to me, I'm the last to chair. The council won't let you. Sasuke argued. The Hokage has given me and the other senseis absolute control of your future, he told the dark-haired brat, he gave us the right to decide what happens to those who fail, including being barred from ever becoming a shinobi. Basically. My team, my test, my rules. The council has no say he finished matter-of-factly. Sensei please. Sakura begged, give us another chance. We've spent years working for this. Years. This does seem a little harsh, Kakashi sensei, Naruto said, speaking up, they may be flawed, but this is a little much. It wouldn't hurt to give them another chance. This surprised Sakura. She had belittled and insulted him, and yet he was trying to convince their sensei to give them another chance. I can't believe he's sticking up for us. I knew he was better than Sasuke. Sakura ignored this. Sasuke, on the other hand, didn't care. He needed to become a shinobi in order to become strong enough to kill Itachi. He would use the dobe's weakness to advance his ambition. The Kashi turned away from them. He was silent for several minutes, worrying the pink and black-haired teens. Finally, he turned to face them. Fine, he agreed, against my better judgment, I'll give you all one last chance to pass this test. They silently sighed in relief. But he continued, causing their spirits to dampen slightly, we'll be doing something else. Now that you know the truth behind the bell test, I'll have to think of some other way to test you. Like what? Sakura asked, nervous. You'll see, Kakashi told her, we'll get to that later. For now, it's time for lunch he said, pulling out bento and opening it, showing that it was full of food. Sakura and Sasuke's stomachs grumble loudly, eager to be fed and protesting their host skipping breakfast. Naruto's, on the other hand, was silent. 
The Cyclopean turned his gaze to the blonde and handed him the bento after closing it. Naruto, you can eat if you want, but do not, under any circumstances, give any to Sakura or Sasuke he commanded, if you do, I'll know, and you will all immediately fail. What? I didn't perform poorly, why aren't I allowed to eat? Sasuke asked, angrily. My test, my rules Kakashi answered repeated, simply, also, if you try to take any food from Naruto, I'll know and, again, you'll all immediately fail, he then took a deep breath, alright, I'm going to take a walk, I'll be back in an hour he told them, mess up again, and your careers as ninja are finished he promised. And, with that, he disappeared in a swirl of leaves, leaving the three teens alone. Naruto then started eating, the food being surprisingly good. After a few minutes, he noticed his teammate staring hungrily at the bento. Can I help you? He asked. Do you have to eat that in front of us? Sakura asked, annoyed. Yes, actually, because it seems to be the only way to make you listen to me, he told them. You don't have the authority to order me around, Dobe Sasu claimed. I'm not trying to command you, I'm trying to help you. Naruto declared, shocking both of them. Naruto sighed and continued, you two have no idea what's out there, no idea why teamwork is so important he turned to Sasuke, Sasuke, you are an arrogant egotistical prick who believes everything should be handed to him on a silver platter. Don't talk to me like don't insult Sasuke Sasuke and Sakura yelled at the same time, only to be interrupted by Naruto. Shut the fuck up, both of you. He shouted, blasting them with killing intent and silencing them. He then continued, as I was saying, Sasuke, you were given everything without having to earn it. You have the respect and admiration of most of Konoha. But when you become a shinobi, you will spend a great deal of time outside of the village, where all that respect will account for nothing, where some people will see only the symbol on your headband and consider you an enemy. Sasuke scoffed, I can handle any ninja that tries to mess with me he bragged. Any ninja, huh? What if there's more than one? He asked, what if there are five? Or ten? Or fifty? What if you acquire the Sharingan and they come after you for it? Without a team, you'd be all alone and vulnerable he told him, you might take down a few of them, but they'll get you eventually and then. He then transformed Harvest into its arm blade form. He held the tip up close to Sasuke's left eye, the breedy teen trying to back away, they'll pluck out your eyes, one by one, like a seed from a peach, and harvest them to unlock the secrets of your family's bloodline. This frightened Sasuke. The thought of his eyes being removed and studied, the thought of his clan's proud bloodline being taken by those unworthy of it. He shuddered. Or Naruto said, moving the blade away from the Ichiha, they could capture you and use you as breeding stock, force you to inseminate hordes of women to breed a new generation of the Ichiha clan, although they likely would give it a different name and train your offspring to be slaves to whatever cause their masters serve. Sasuke was even more terrified by this. Don't talk about such thy Sakura tried to stop this conversation, not liking these scenarios one bit. Naruto stopped her, shut. Up. He told her, menacingly, not looking at her. Sakura stayed silent. My point is that you are just one man, and one man cannot take on the world on his own he told him, you may think that teammates will slow you down, but they will, more likely than not, save your life. Sasuke was left pondering this as Naruto moved to Sakura. Sakura, he began, you care more about your appearance than your training. I understand why he told her, you are very beautiful, and beauty is something we strive to keep. Sakura couldn't help but blush at his words, while inner Sakura was doing a victory dance. But, just as beauty can be a blessing, it can also be a curse, he continued, you will draw the gaze of many enemies, men who will seek to claim you for themselves. By force. Sakura was terrified of these words, and her eyes widened to show that. You must stop relying on others to fight your battles for you, Naruto told her, Sasuke, Kakashi, and myself will not always be there to protect you, you must become stronger, learn to compliment and aid your teammates instead of hiding behind them. He then stood up and began to pace back and forth in front of them. I will be honest with you both, I don't like either of you Naruto told them honestly. Sakura was slightly hurt by this. But we're all each other has. We are dysfunctional, but. He then brought out his blade, with some work, we can become like a blade. Strong, sharp, focused, and a thing of beauty if forged properly. He then sheathed his blade, picked up the bento, and walked over to them. So let's start over and complete this test he then surprised Sakura by holding out the bento to her, together. What are you doing? Sakura asked, Kakashi-sensei will fail us if you give us any food. She protested. I don't care Naruto told her, if you two aren't at full strength, we are doomed to fail anyway. I'd rather risk getting caught than fail when the key to our success was so close, but we chose to ignore it. Sakura stared at him for a moment before allowing the blonde to feed her. After a few minutes of this, Naruto gave some to Sasuke. Eat up Sasuke. The last loyal Ichiha frowned, not wanting to show weakness. Sasuke Naruto said, for once in your life, be a team player. The Ichiha sighed and gave in, eating what was offered to him. You. A sudden cry of rage shattered the silence in the training ground. 
The massive dust cloud was formed as an enraged Kakashi had exped towards them. You three. He was now upon the one nervous and two terrified Genin now. Has. He said, happily, with his signature eye smile. There was an extremely long pause. What? Sakura asked, breaking the silence. You heard me, you three have passed the test. But. But we disobeyed you. She pointed out, Naruto gave us food and we ate it. You said you would fail us if we did. Akashi nodded, I did say that, didn't I? He asked rhetorically. He then gave them another eye smile, I also told you that you would throw up if you ate any breakfast. Naruto understood, you were watching us the whole time he said, you wanted to see if we would help each other, even if it meant going against orders he surmised. Akashi nodded, I once believed that those who disobeyed orders were trash he informed his students, and, for a long time, that ideal ruled over me. It controlled my every action. He trailed off. He was silent for a while. After a few moments, he moved over to where Sakura was bound and cut her free. Follow me he commanded them. Confused, the three teens did so. They walked for a few minutes until they reached a large, strange diamond-shaped monument. The memorial stone of Kanahagakur he told them, carved into this stone are the names of every shinobi and kinoichi that have died in the line of duty, he touched the stone with reverence, heroes, all of them. Naruto nodded, there is no greater death than one received in the service of a cause one believes in. Those weren't his words. Those were the words one of his mentors, the Reaper Palinus the Wolf, had told him. The others agreed, including death. After all, Reapers die twice. Once in life and another in service to the cause. The Kashi was surprised, but didn't show it. Wise words, he agreed. He was silent for another few moments, staring at the names, before speaking again. Minato Namikas. Rin Nahara. Abito Ichiha he then turned to face his genin, my sensei and teammates he told them. Sasuke and Sakura were surprised by this. Their sensei was once a student of the Yandame Hokage. The man many considered to be the greatest ninja to ever be produced by Konoha. Sasuke also noted that an Ichiha had been on his sensei's team, one he had heard of, though only in passing, and didn't know anything about. He had once asked his father who he was, who simply answered a fool when he had asked Itachi, however, the response was different. A hero. He never did learn the truth. But maybe that was about to change. When I graduated from the academy, I was the strongest and smartest student of my year Kakashi continued, I was arrogant, cocky, and thought I was invincible he sighed, I'm ashamed to admit it, but I looked down on my teammates he told them, I only respected Minato-sensei, who was like a second father to me. I only saw her in as a fangirl and Abito as the dead last goofball he then turned to face them, sadness clear in his visible eye, but, one day, everything changed. He took a breath and continued, we were on a mission when we were ambushed by an enemy squad and separated from our sensei he told them, they captured Rin. I I wanted to abandon her. To complete the mission we were given, but Abito wouldn't listen. He wanted to rescue her. He looked up at his team, he told me those who break the rules are trash. But those who abandon their comrades are worse than trash. That struck a chord with me. Abito opened my eyes, showed me what a spoiled fool I'd been. We tracked down the enemy squad to a nearby cave and rescued Rin. I lost my eye in the fight he continued, before tapping his headband, where his other eye would have been, we won, but the fight triggered a cave in an Abito. He took a deep breath, Abito sacrificed his life to save mine. Naruto and Sakura could see how painful it was for their sensei to tell them this story. Sasuke, meanwhile, understood why his father called Abito a fool. He was an Achiha, a good Achiha would never give their life to save another. At least, not a non-clan member. He was smart enough to keep this opinion to himself, though. The Kashi, meanwhile, continued, since that day, I vowed to put my comrades well-being ahead of my own, to protect them like Abito would have his expression then showed pain again, Rin died on a mission a couple of years later and Sensei. Well, you all know what happened to him. They nodded. And that the silver-haired mentor said, is why I value teamwork so much, and why you should as well he told them, none of us can be successful on our own. We're all pieces of the great machine that is Kanahagakur. Without each other. We're nothing he looked them all in the eyes, do you all understand? They nodded, though Sasuke's was insincere. The Cyclops' eye smiled, Goody told them, now, you three can take the rest of the day off, but I expect you all to meet me here, tomorrow at 7 a.m., got it? Yes, Sensei. All three Genin said. Excellent, you can go now. And, with that, they left. Or, at least, Sakura and Sasuke did. Naruto stayed behind. Akashi noticed this, is something wrong? He asked. Naruto said nothing for a moment. He wasn't sure how Kakashi would react, but he needed to hear this. I befriended my tenant a few years ago, he told the man. Akashi's eyes widened. She wants you to know that she's sorry, Naruto told him, relaying Kurama's message, she wishes she could take back what she did, that she wasn't forced to hurt and kill so many. Wadey interrupted, the fox is a she. And she was forced to attack the village. He asked, disbelieving in his tone. 
Naruto nodded, I know you think she's manipulating me, that she's a monster. But she isn't he told his sensei, she's a good person and she's sorry, even though she knows you can't forgive her. Won't forgive her. She knows how close you were with my parents he explained. Akashi's eyes widened even more, how? My mother was her previous container, remember? He replied, then his eyes widened, oh shit. Please tell me you already knew that. I did, he answered, reassuring his student, she told me after Abito died, to comfort me. Oh thank god Naruto sighed, I was worried you might think less of her. I could never think badly of Kashina, the silver-haired shinobi told him, she was like a mother to me. Naruto nodded, I know. Kaiubi told me how close you were. She was there for most of her life and saw and heard everything. She hates herself for what she did and wanted me to tell you that my parents loved you like a son. Akashi didn't know what to say to this. He just stared at his student. I know you don't trust her and probably never will Naruto said, but she asked me to tell you this. Do what you will with it. Oh, and don't tell anyone about why she attacked the village, only the Hokage and myself know and wish to keep it quiet until we know more he bowed, see you tomorrow sensei. He vanished in a swirl of darkness. Akashi was left speechless and had no idea what to do. He looked at the memorial stone and, after a few moments, decided what he should do. He vanished in a swirl of leaves, eager to confront the Hokage and learn the truth about that horrible night, all those long years ago. Thanks for listening. I do hope you enjoy it. If you want the next part of this video. Turn on that bell notification. Like subscribe and comment down below. And also check out the others videos. I have created and enjoyed it. See you guys next video. Till that take care.